So let me start with uh, territorial acknowledgements as required by the University of Waterloo. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee uh, peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land granted to the Six Nations that, in, that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within the Office of Indigenous Re Relations. In fact, uh, uh, WISE is very active, as I will explain in a second, in this particular activity. Uh, with that said, uh, let me briefly introduce you before I introduce you to, uh, uh, to WISE. Uh, this Net Zero workshop uh, that we, the Waterloo uh, Institute for Sustainable Energy WISE, along with the Waterloo Climate Institute, Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Aeronautics, and the Water Institute are, are hosting or were hosting this day long Net Zero workshop. It's been on the work for quite a while. Uh, the, the idea is to uh, uh, university professors, researchers, and industry partners, and government partners as well, present projects and research in three panels. We have divided the, wor the workshop in three panels, renewable energy technologies, net zero communities, and sustainable transportation. Uh, there will be also student posters, as you can see on the back, to highlight student research in the areas, and there will be also a, a trade show or a, a, a demo of a few of these uh, technologies uh, during the breaks and at lunch. Uh, there are many aspects of the net zero. Uh, advances in renewable energy technology is one of them, such as wind, solar, geothermal, hydro, hydrogen, electric vehicles, and microgrids, in which WISE is very active. There's also communities which are enacting uh, policies to achieve net zero targets and implementing programs to achieve net zero in sectors, including buildings, transportation, and water treatment. So all of this is part of this uh, net zero, which is basically a, a, a government initiative uh, is not only uh, across the globe, but in Canada in particular. In 2021, the government of, Can of Canada launched the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, which outlines, and I'll comment on that in a second in, in my presentation, a com a, the commitment or CADAN's commitment to achieve net zero emissions by the year 2050. So hence the reference to net zero 2050. Uh, this is a, a global uh, commitment and Canada is very much committed to it as well. Uh, the 2030 emission reduction uh, plan launched in 2022 is another federal level policy that guides net zero initiatives until 2030. I will comment on that in my presentation later on. Uh, we all have a part to play, and this is very important, it's, I think it's not only uh, institutional uh, government commitment, but a, a personal commitment. Uh, to make Canada zero net zero, uh, to meet Canada net, Canada's net zero goals. And I also will comment that on my, my own personal view and a personal uh, commitment that we all need to make to this, to this uh, future. Uh, this workshop brings together uh, uh, an, uh, a forum, an executive forum intended to encourage the exchange of ideas, which is the main objective of this, to help create a roadmap to guide the future of net zero research and initiatives in Canada. So that's one of the main objectives of the workshop. Uh, is we are also focusing on collaborations in net zero research and projects, exploration of new opportunities for partnerships, and the integration of efforts across stakeholder groups. So we, we are very much, uh, uh, thank you for being here, uh, whether in person or, uh, person or virtually. And before we start the, the still in time, we start the, 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 the presentation, or our keynote speaker, speak, speak, uh, speaker, let me introduce you very briefly to Wise. Now, uh, Wise, uh, I don't have uh, access to the, cannot see that, those slides over there. But anyway, Wise, let me move along. Yeah, this is, this is unreadable. Uh, our, our vision, our vision and mission is first to collaborate, which is one of the main objectives of WISE, to make sure that we collaborate not through at, only through the University of Waterloo, but also uh, through multiple uh, uh, faculty initiatives and partnerships. So we reach out, one of the main objectives, is for, and this is intention as part of the objective of the workshop, is to reach out 
to our partners, uh, uh, or create new partnerships within the industry, government, and uh, non-profit sector as well. And we, we influence uh, 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 our research, uh, uh, our intention is to, for our, uh, to influence the policy debate as well. Not only the technical aspects, but also look at the policy uh, aspects of, of uh, uh, sustainable energy. Uh, now, uh, WISE in itself is a, a collection of uh, researchers. Uh, uh, it's not really a research institute per se in the sense of what you see in other, uh, in other countries, especially in Europe, for example, you have these research institutes have their own researchers. What we do is bring together the initiative or the, the, the power or the force of all researchers that are working in sustainable energy, which collects about 130 plus uh, 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 individuals or faculty members, and also the grad students and, and undergrad students working in different aspects of postdoctoral fellows as well, working in different aspects of, of sustainable energy research. We focus particularly on the, on the technical aspects, but we also look at the policy aspects. Now, uh, these researchers lead 30 uh, state-of-the-art facilities, uh, uh, that has focus on sustainable energy technologies, and we are in the process, hopefully, to acquire a new one, a microgrid facility uh, 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 that uh, owned by Canadian Solar, which are, is being offered to, to Waterloo and through CFI, grant, uh, CFI and OC, uh, OCI grant, uh, funding or Ontario government funding. We hope to acquire that. We should know by, by June. And I think that uh, Alex is going to actually be visiting this facility. Uh, 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 nearby here, it's in Guelph, nearby Waterloo. Uh, a professional team, which well, we have uh, staff, uh, I'll introduce you, to the st uh, introduce you to the staff that you can see around the, the tables, uh, that basically try to facilitate these collaborations. Okay? Uh, so we're very much intent in uh, starting new projects, uh, supporting projects which are collaborative projects. We don't support individual projects for faculty members, but we do look at the, intention, at the, at the objective of uh, making uh, partnerships with the faculty, with the multiple faculties and departments, and with partners in the industry, government, and NGO space. We have a global outlook because we're not only focused in Canada, we also look at all the countries. We have uh, strong collaborations with KIT. We have uh, guests here from KIT visiting us, uh, and we, for example, and we try to uh, establish these collaborations not only with Canada, but across the world. And we are embedded with this culture of innovation uh, which is basically what identifies Waterloo uh, in commercialization aspects, and we support that. And we have success stories, Waterloo, uh, WISE and Waterloo have been very successful in, in, in supporting so new initiatives or new commercialization initiatives within the space of sustainable energy. Now, we have multiple partners. These are many partners in the past and new partners uh, 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 that we are in interacting with very actively nowadays. Some of you are here in the in the audience, and we welcome those partnerships. And it's not only with companies, but also with, uh, as I mentioned when I introduced Alex, uh, uh, with, uh, with government agency, particularly NRCAN, which is our space. We, we work very closely with NRCAN in different aspects. And basically, we cover all different aspects of, 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 of different streams, if you will, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the sustainable energy space. So from conservation, to aspects of bridging uh, those technologies, uh, like uh, storage, for example, demand response, uh, uh, improvement, which includes uh, uh, improvement to conventional uh, uh, technologies. We are very much uh, committed to uh, carbon cap capture and sequestration, which is a transitional technology that's going to be necessary for, for, for Canada to meet their, their targets, net zero targets. Uh, uh, transformation as well in the aspects of uh, 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 supporting new technologies or uh, promoting new technologies, enabling these technologies uh, through, uh, through policies and planning and the delivery of these powers. So we are very much, uh, we have a very strong power systems group or power energy and energy group here in Waterloo, one of the best in the world. And we are very much embedded in this concept of, of, uh, of net zero, which is the electrification of everything. So a good, a good part of uh, the back, backbone of net zero would be the power grid and many of us are working in different aspects of that. We also have an initiative, Affordable Energy for Humanity, AE4H, funded by our uh, uh, funding director, Professor Jatina Tuani, uh, which basically covers different aspects of access to energy, access to affordable energy, or access, affordable access to energy, 
throughout the world. We are not only focused on the Canadian space, but we collaborate with the US, uh, Mexico, and different countries in Latin America, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, in terms of our, our interactions with in this particular space. And basically, the, it's a global partnership. It's a, uh, we have formed as an organization, uh, which includes 150 plus members across the globe and represents basically not only academics, but also companies, private companies, many in Africa, in Southeast Asia, Asia, communities as well, in which we interact, non-profits and global networks. So we're part of that, or we, are, we are part of that network and contributing to that, to that, uh, uh, to that work. Uh, uh, now uh, we looked at research uh, development projects, events, student experiences. Very much this, uh, this work has, uh, has focus in, in, in uh, student internships, which we have been very successful at promoting and supporting, uh, from 15 to 30 international COP internships uh, per year. So we are very active. We actually receive an award, it was received an award with, with the activities in, in terms of co-op education. And uh, 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 most of these students, uh, this is a reference to 2020, 2021, 50% uh, of the students went, uh, went to pursue studies and careers in sustainable energy. So it's been very successful in promoting sustainable energy within, the, within our community at Waterloo, undergrad community at Waterloo. Uh, now, we, we also uh, support very much so, part of these initiatives is sustainable de ed development education. So we have campus events, classroom presentations, uh, capstone projects as well. We support those, those projects from undergrad students in the sustainable energy and, and sustainable development uh, uh, space. Now, uh, we, we have innovation labs uh, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, every, every other year, gatherings of these uh, researchers, of this group of, of, of that formed the AE4H, uh, and which one coming up next week, in fact, uh, in, in Spain, in which we have these, these, uh, these innovation discussions with uh, the members, I think about 100 of them are registered for the event next, uh, next week uh, in, in Spain as part of a, a, of a, of a conference uh, in the space of AE4H. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, part of the supporting, of, uh, supporting institutes or, 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 or collaborators in this uh, particular initiative of the workshop is uh, the, group of, uh, the group of Sustainable Futures uh, initiative, so we, which at this point includes the Waterloo uh, Climate Institute and the Water, Water Institute. And we are also integrating uh, our activities with WISE as well, Water Institute for, Institute for Sustainable Aeronautics. Uh, now, uh, the intention is collaborative and partnership, which is, uh, prom is being promoted by the president, our president uh, at Waterloo, of having this uh, space or so these initiatives, these collaborations, not only on the sustainable energy space, but all the different aspects that include, uh, that basically form part of net zero. Now, uh, the, the initiative is basically, or this initiative is to unlock this greater uh, space, not only technology policy, but also uh, uh, so, uh, society activities. Some of our, our presenters are basically engaged in this particular research. Uh, and it's part of the, uh, the, the sustainable development goals that have been uh, stated by the UN. And let me give you a brief introduction of a video of what SFI is all about, uh, of what's coming up. Uh, the Smart Energy Networks as well is part of our initiatives in which we look not only at uh, particular aspects of energy, electrical systems, but all different aspects of energy. Uh, this is our, as I mentioned, the staff. I'm the executive director. We have, we have uh, Armugan uh, al, al, al Haq, managing director of, uh, of, of WISE. We have Ambika Opal, which I think is busy on uh, and Sana as well at, at the, at the, at the uh, welcoming uh, desk, uh, which are uh, uh, because in particular in, in fo focus on the AE4H initiative, and uh, 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 Sana, which is our, our expert on communication specialist and also administrative assistant. As so global challenges SFI. grow in scale and complexity, our future is being shaped by how we respond today. But the way forward isn't clear. We're up against wicked problems from climate change to systemic racism and injustice, from the loss of biodiversity to water, food, and energy insecurity. These challenges are deeply interconnected with no clear beginning or end. They require us to approach them collaboratively and holistically. So how can we find solutions and shape the future we want to see? 
we work together and start doing things differently. The University of Waterloo Sustainable Futures Cluster is a powerful nexus for sustainable thinking and solutions. We're bringing together the best minds across climate, water, and energy to nurture the long-term well-being of our societies, economies, and environment. Amplifying the voices of marginalized, indigenous, and vulnerable communities, connecting world-class researchers, and working with government, corporate, and nonprofit partners, both nationally and globally. So that as our biggest problems evolve, we evolve to meet them. As new threats emerge, we design new ways to tackle them. And as we combine our strengths, we unlock a future of possibilities. Join the solution because our greatest impact happens together. Okay, so this introduces you to the, the initiative, uh, the, which the multiple, multiple institutes that are supporting this event, and this is one of those initiatives, this workshop. As well, we have uh, coming up a uh, 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 summer school in which the three institutes are also involved. Uh, in, 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 the, in the water, uh, the water, climate, uh, 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 energy uh, nexus. Okay? And now, uh, let me introduce you to our first speaker. But just about in, a, a bit uh, later, right now. But let me introduce you to the, our first speaker, uh, uh, our keynote speaker uh, in this uh, in, uh, for this workshop uh, is uh, Alex Prior. Uh, Prior. Uh, uh, sorry if I mis mispronounce your name, Alex. Uh, I know him, and Alex. So. <laughs> That's our interaction for, for now several years. Uh, since 2013, Alex is uh, director of the, Alexander is the director of the Renewable Energy Integration Group at Canmet Energy, in which we have very strong links, and uh, not, only, not only from the point of view of collaborations and projects, but also personal, because some of our students are working at the lab, and hopefully some of the new students will be there as well. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, in, uh, which is focused on energy and science research uh, uh, as a laboratory for energy and science research of the Federal Department of Natural Resources Canada, NRCAN. His team of over 30 researchers and engineers focus on grid integration of renewable energy and the smart grid between 20, 2019 and 2018. He managed multiple smart grid research projects at NRCAN. Alexander uh, holds a bachelor's uh, degree in electrical engineering from the Ecole de Technologie Supérieure uh, and a master's of applied science from Ecole Polytechnique Montreal. Prior to joining NRCAN in 2009, he worked for 10 years uh, in the uh, private sector in the te telecommunication industry, which are now becoming very much linked with, with sustainable energy. Alex, thank you. Is the mic working? Yes. Uh, oops. Yeah, no, it's true. We, my, my group is pretty, um, I would say, heavy link with uh, Waterloo. I, I think we have over 10 uh, former students from Waterloo working with us. Uh, I'm not a Waterloo uh, student, but still. So uh, let's talk about Canadian Net Zero Pathways. Um, the presentation, uh, first of all, few slides just to put the context of uh, a bit more who I am because the federal government is pretty vast so at least to position uh, my group uh, some context about uh, getting to net zero the challenge that it creates how grid modernization will help and some maybe if we have time about smart communities maybe a disclaimer uh, the presentation is much more about uh, electric grid, renewable energy integration, then many other very important topics also like uh, water management, things like that. But uh, it's not an area that uh, my group, neither me, have expertise in. So first, who am I or organization? So when you want to talk about the energy transition, there's a lot of actors from the government involved in that. First one, Natural Resources Canada. A lot of people are always asking why Natural Resources Canada? Basically, it's pretty simple. Uh, we don't have a Department of Energy in Canada, so the energy mandate, uh, like interconnection pipelines, things like that, falls into Natural Resources Canada. There's people in policy, 
There's people in program, there's people in uh, the different type of program like demonstration, deployment, and all that. So it's a funding agency, but it was also a branch that is research. So ma many, I, I see people in the room here that in the past had, had projects that were found by NRCAM. Uh, if you buy an uh, electric vehicle, there's uh, the of, uh, in, uh, Office of Energy Efficiency that is giving incentive for that. These are all programmed for NRCAM. So what's the role of uh, environment, climate, and ca environment Canada and climate change without going in all their mandate in all the detail, just I'll say that generally they're more on the regulation. So if you want to look at the GHG emission in Canada, large industry, things like that, environment, uh, environment E3C, sorry, will take, the, take care of the regulation. And right now, one of the big items that is coming is the um, clean energy regulation, which is a new regulation that will regulate the electric, electric grid and the emission. So that will be a game changer. That is generally coming from ECCC. A group that we're always confused with, Natural, uh, National Research Council Canada, uh, they were referring it as them as NRC most of the time, where NRCAN, which is not the same thing. If you want to try to put everyone in a box, I would say generally they are doing more fundamental research and they also have a program to support industry. And then an important player also is the Canada Energy Regulator, which are often well, not well known uh, overall, but one of the things they're doing is their Energy Future series. So in the past they were, um, the last release one is the 2021, uh, then tw it's not a secret, it's disclosed. The 2023 is in progress and is uh, getting developed right now. I'll have some slides uh, that will uh, talk a bit about that later. So, like I said, NRCAN is pretty big, pretty broad, funding agency, research program, policy aspect. I'm not involved in most of that other than giving information and providing um, what we call science-based information. In my case, it's CanMet Energy. So it's labs from NRCAN that, are, that receive funding to do research like a university. Uh, it's, it's just a different type of funding. So in Canada, if you put all together the, the different lab, it's over fi 550 scientists, engineers, and technicians uh, all together in four main labs, which is the one uh, that I'm part of in Varennes near Montreal. Uh, there's one in Ottawa. I'll spare you the detail of all the uh, different topics. If you want to know more, you can uh, contact us. Um, one in Devon, mostly doing research on oil and gas, improving um, emission, uh, anyway, a, lo a lot of things uh, to improve oil and gas. And one that is a bit different is the Hamilton one, which is called Can CanMet Material. Uh, why they're linked to uh, the same energy research lab? Because obviously material are affecting a lot the energy aspect. So these are the lab. Uh, if, you, if I want to be a bit more specific, the Varen one, where I'm part of, there is a program on building heat pump geothermal. There's a program on industrial processes. So if you want to look at pulp and paper, large industry, um, how they, 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 they can uh, do energy efficiency process optimization, uh, the Renewable Energy Integration Group, which is my group, and the Red Screen International. I suppose uh, maybe some of you, uh, certainly some of you know the Red Screen software which uh, is a pre-feasibility tool, but evolved quite a lot over the year that it can do much more today. So, a renewable energy integration group. Uh, again, I could do a whole presentation on the activity of our group. Right now, we are about 30 full-time equivalent employees, so roughly 42 individuals, uh, doing research all about renewable energy integration and smart grid. Our, our project scale, so, uh, goes from resources and device. So we're looking at uh, PV panel, standard, uh, how we can use uh, water heaters, things like that to exploit the flexibility. And then we're going a layer up to grid interface and interoperability. How can we co communicate with this equipment? Like how can we uh, use the advanced inverter function that are embedded into the new inverters, uh, the standard with that? 
And even after that, we, we are looking also at project and an aspect of neighborhood communities and cities. So if we have advanced inverter function, these equipment deploy everywhere, and they are in a community, how does that affect the distribution, the grid? Uh, can, it, can it help in, in, increase the amount of renewable energy we will put on the grid? We will look at things like that, like hosting capacity calculation of renewable uh, penetration that can be hosted. And then we have to look at the national level, national level, regional level, uh, how these technology, the flexibility, the smart grid project will uh, be modeled. So enough of talking about my group. Let's move to the context of uh, today's event. So Canada net zero objective. A lot of people it's, uh, know uh, Canada's starting point is pretty good. Uh, there's already over 80 82% of the electric generation that is non-emitting. So if you look at the uh, numbers there, a lot of hydro, nuclear, thanks to uh, these two sources, uh, other renewable, uh, the starting point for the grid is pretty good. So what are the targets? Uh, Claudio mentioned some. By 2030, there was a first target a few years ago to reach 90% non-emitting electricity generation. Uh, this one is still there. But let's say that the one that has a lot of focus right now is the 2035 target. In 2035, the whole electricity sector must be net zero. And as said before, the clean electricity regulation uh, is coming. There's already the carbon tax, all the implementation of that. But on top of that, there's going to be this regulation toward, um, I would, I don't want to go too much in the detail because I don't want to, do, to, to say a mistake or false thing, but let's say that overall it's, it will regulate anything that will emit on the grid and any, when I say anything is any grid that are NERC connected. So if your grid is connected to the NERC, uh, this uh, regulation will be affecting it. Uh, it's a, I, I think it's going to be a, ga a game changer in the electricity sector. And another pretty big one uh, target for 2035 is the 100% zero emission vehicle. Clearly the transportation, uh, I'll go there after, but is a pretty big source of emission. Uh, getting to net zero vehicle will clearly uh, do a difference. And by 2050, Canada took a commitment to get to net zero emission for the whole economy. So that is another pretty significant challenge. So, if we look at the outlook, what does it mean for Canada to get, uh, to do the electrification? If you look at the two graphs there, these are two graphs made by the um, uh, Canadian Climate Institute. Basically, they look at different studies uh, about net zero uh, made by uh, various groups, and they look, uh, what do we need? So the first graph uh, on your left, on the left in the middle, is about energy. The amount of energy needed to, from a consensus of different study is about 1.6 to 2.1 times what we have today in our grid. So if we want to decarbonize, electrify the economy, we need roughly to double the amount of clean electricity, clean energy we have today for the grid. So even if the starting point is pretty good, it's still a significant challenge. It's worst if you look at uh, the graph on the right. Uh, I don't want to be, um, the intent is not to show it's very, uh, it's a lot of challenge. The intent here is to, to foster innovation, I think. But if you look at the graph on the right, uh, it could, in terms of power, so install capacity, wires, everything from the generation to your house, we're talking of an increase from 2.2 to 3.4, meaning, uh, roughly, we could say we will need to double our infra electricity infrastructure in Canada and maybe triple. So that's the size of the challenge we're talking about to uh, decarbonize the economy. Clearly, we need a lot more uh, renewable, clean electricity generation, all the sources that we can find. And there's going to be, uh, we need new grid planning and uh, operating paradigm because that, that are very significant challenges. If we take, uh, the, I, I spoke about the Canada Energy Regulator and the last 
publicly available scenario. The, the, 2020, the 2023 is coming, but that's the last one. So if you want to drill down a bit more on what I just shown, what does it mean? The left graph is the energy one. So you can see there, it, that's a scenario that is mostly, uh, I would say, tend toward the 1.6, not the two time in energy. Uh, and on the right, you can see that uh, the, the amount is roughly 160 gigawatt of uh, generation today. And we need to go over 300 in this case uh, with this scenario. That's one of the study. But it's a federal government uh, organization that is doing this specific scenario. Without going into all the detail, uh, wind and solar, what's their role here? 60, 69%, so roughly 60% of the new generation in this scenario is all wind and solar. No surprise here, wind and solar costs uh, reduced quite a lot in the last, uh, I would say 20 years, for 30 years. Uh, Today, they are the cheapest source of energy. So if you do optimization to look at wh what is needed to meet uh, our, our objective, clearly wind and solar have a pretty important role. Storage in this scenario, it's 15% of the generation installed in 2050 that would be uh, added. So it's a rapid growth. Uh, could it be more, could it be less? Clearly storage have a, an important role to play. If you want to look also other sources here, small modular reactor are there, hydropower, natural gas with carbon capture. Uh, some could argue, uh, do we need all these? Do we, should we do more nuclear and all that? I would say uh, the typical answer is everything is needed. Let's, let's find solutions. Um, and, and worst case, if some of these technology are not available, uh, at the end it's gonna be more the actual uh, wind and solar technology. In this scenario, SMR are, would say, kicking off around 2040. So it's still, uh, so some argue it's, uh, they will be available uh, before than that. So it can still be a long shot. Um, carbon capture play an important role in most of the study worldwide, I would say, about uh, direct air capture, carbon capture. Because if we don't have these technology, we will probably be, uh, simply have much more problem in uh, making all this happening. Uh, and one other note, there's, no, there's not a huge increase in hydropower in Canada, even though we have uh, significant sources in this scenario, it's still limited in the sense that most of the RNS potential, the easy one is already harnessed. So uh, yes, there's some, but not uh, to double our uh, production. So I said we are in a pretty good starting point by looking at electricity. Here, let's talk about where it's coming from, the, why it's so big the size, and it's pretty clear, it's, it's very simple. When you look at our energy consumption right now, most of it, uh, oil products are still playing a very big role. Uh, without going again in all the detail, you can see that uh, crude oil, uh, natural gas are heavily um, there when you look at primary energy production. And that, if you look on the right, it's pretty easy to explain. The industrial sector, uh, yes, they're using electricity, but it's not the main source of energy. Uh, transportation, it's all oil, oil and gas right now. And residential, in the commercial, the eating, there's a lot of oil uh, still used. There's some, uh, a lot of natural gas. So all that will eventually need to be replaced. So clearly, the, all this will pose a, a lot of challenge. I think uh, it's probably an audience that knows the power system refresher. I'm using that uh, slide uh, often uh, without explaining uh, what is a power system. Uh, today, I'll say basically, if you, if, if you understood, the, the electric system, the power system, will be the backbone of the energy transition. Uh, there is no other way uh, to, uh, around today. Um, and, and at all times, supply and demand must be tightly balanced. So uh, that is not a secret for anyone. The, 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 the figure of the balance is used in almost all presentation about the topic. 
But right now, it's a very broad existing equipment and infrastructure that need to be upgraded, maintained, and evolved. Uh, on, on the economic side, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems is utilities sell energy, but are built for capacity. So uh, when everybody needs to eat at the coldest day of the winter and, when, and charge their vehicle at the same time, and in summer, if uh, it's very hot and uh, all the air conditioning are working, the utility must build this, uh, for, for, that, for these specific day. And it's clearly a very high, uh, highly regulated sector. So what does it mean? New electricity demand, we need a lot. Uh, we need a ca new addition capacity of wind and solar that will be over 50%. Uh, wind and solar are variable energy resources. They're not, if it's not windy, if it's the night, they're not producing more, much. So, in terms of uh, change, we need to dynamically provision the flexibility. So when we talk about flexibility, uh, generation, load, storage, everything will need to be called upon to balance that flexibility. Uh, right now, the market control method to dynamically provision these services are not there. Most of the usage of this, the flexibility right now is peak reduction. Uh, peak reduction is managed, but there's not not, it's, it's not relatively immature, it's completely immature. The only thing we use right now is uh, peak reduction mostly. Most VRE, so variable renewable energy, are inverter based. So uh, the, the fact that there is no rotating machine anymore, uh, they have low inertia, all that is a game changer in the way we will operate the grid. And clearly we will need new solution with that in mind uh, for system to, to keep system st stability. In terms of infrastructure, uh, modernizing all this clearly is expensive and take times. Uh, when, when we invest in uh, grid infrastructure generation, it could be over 50 years or more. Uh, so we, we, we need a clear figure on how that will evolve. Uh, it's not clear the pathway and all, how the grid will evolve till now in 2050 is not all, all clear right now. We can give an example. Um, there is a lot of discussion on uh, how transmission system operator and distribution system operator will evolve. What will be the role? Who will have the control of uh, uh, to say, okay, let's, let's stop the EV charging. Will it be the TSO, DSO? All that has technical implication that will change the pathway on how the grid will modernize. Uh, clearly, bon, all that must be done in maintaining reliability and resiliency, but also at minimal cost. We could uh, install battery everywhere in every single house, and probably that there won't be any problem anymore, but the cost will certainly be too big. There's still a lot of uncertainty also about the energy mix. What will be the final answer uh, is still not very well known. There's a lot of scenario, competing scenario, competing lobby. Um, and right now, there's not really any modeling happening in Canada that include the oil sector, the electricity sector, the industry, all together in the same modeling. Most of it is happening uh, in silo, I would say. And we need also to uh, accommodate our actual grid with the electrification ambition. Uh, that is certainly a big challenge too. So I spoke a few times about system flexibility, power system, it's a buzzword that is more and more uh, used everywhere. Basically, power system flexibility is the ability of a power system to rely with reliability and cost effectively manage all the variability and uncertainty and at, across all the different time scale. The variability and uncertainty in a grid is coming from different places, like plan and non-plan equipment outage, uh, extreme event, and user demand. Yes, it's a source of viability. In the past, uh, we were just trying to match the generation to demand. Eventually, we may also look at uh, changing the end user demand. Uh, the mid to long term growth, uh, the pace of electrification, uh, distributed energy resources, prosumer, they will be a source of flexibility. If everybody is charging their vehicle at five when they're coming back from work, uh, we, we need to develop the grid according to that. They can be a solution or a problem. And clearly, about the variable renewable generation. 
So what's the potential uh, benefit to increase the flexibility? Um, first, it will facilitate the adoption of renewable energy. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if we can harness all the flexibility available, we will be, we will be capable of uh, putting more renewable. They will contribute also to greater reliability and resilience. Can we use uh, EV with advanced inverter function to support the frequency of the grid? Technically, it's feasible. Uh, it's still complicated. Will we see a vehicle doing frequency regulation uh, soon? I don't know about that, but it's technically feasible. And it will enable new electrification options. Uh, if we want to look at the economic the intent here is not to make things more complicated. The intent here is to allow for more efficient operation of a grid asset, uh, microgrid, reconfigurable microgrid, things like that that will change the way we're operating the grid. It will provide new opportunity also for prosumer and uh, consumer engagement. If you, if you pay for uh, people to offer services, uh, to, ha to install more battery that will support the grid, uh, consumer will be aware of that and they will use that. And clearly, it, it, it can defer capital investment. Uh, the example of non-wire alternative instead of uh, upgrade on, in the system is a good example of that. So uh, if you want to talk about where, where are we in Canada in smart grid, uh, we produce uh, many reports, uh, not yearly, by yearly generally, about um, key smart grid metrics in Canada. So uh, the Smart Grid in Canada report is available. The latest ver public version is the 2021. 20, um, overall, we're trying to capture how Smart Grid is evolving in that report. It's available, the link is there. Uh, I think the slide will be shared, so if you want to take a look at it. Um, one thing to say, we're looking at different aspects of Smart Grid, including EV chargers, uh, amount of solar PV distributed versus centralized. Uh, if you look at the number there, I think it's written 2.9 gigawatt AC in terms of um, uh, capacity installed in uh, PV in Canada, mostly in Ontario. Uh, but things change. In the last uh, two years, uh, we're now over 4 gigawatt. Uh, I would say that there's some pretty big project that happened in, in Alberta, and uh, it, it increased quite significantly. So in that, pro in that report, you'll find also uh, what we call the the smart grid priorities. We work with a lot of different uh, group toward that, uh, to, toward producing the report. And one thing we ask is, what's your top smart grid priority? And we ask the provinces about that. So in this case, uh, decarbonization target, I spoke about it. Uh, if you bring that with the operation of the grid, we, for us, it creates a, a lot of uh, priorities in smart grid. First, very clear, variable, renewable energy, but also energy storage. I think uh, no big surprise here. Um, Inverter-based resources, will we have grid forming, inverter, grid following inverter, all how, how that will come together, that, that is uh, clearly uh, a priority that uh, is generating a lot of question. How the hydrogen, what will be the role of hydrogen? Uh, the electrification, not only transport, also industrial processes, uh, eating. How can we use all the flexibility? I think I covered that point uh, pretty well now. Uh, infrastructure investment, clearly there's a lot of money needed to, to, to do all this. Uh, what will be the role of microgrids, connected microgrids, but also how can we resolve the problems in remote microgrids, because clearly they, they, they are facing uh, similar problems and sometimes even worse uh, because it's far and um, uh, the accessibility to get there, the equipment and all that. And cybersecurity, I think it's a no-brainer that uh, that won't go away. So if we want to talk about... Uh, Two minutes? Okay, so uh, now I, I can wrap up uh, quickly. Uh, I'm enthusiastic, so sometimes I have too much time. <laughs> so uh, here uh, I have some example of main topic and area of focus. So if you look at the uh, priority in the um, previous slide, uh, you have a lot of um, example here. I will let you uh, take a look at it after. Um, so. 
last slide, what, what do we see as modernized distribution grid? Uh, this is an example of a project that we have in uh, Varennes uh, with Hydro-Québec. Uh, the intent is to do an interactive grid. It's not easy, uh, but we're talking of thousands of monitoring points. We're talking of uh, machine learning, AI, that will learn what is happening, that will adapt to uh, what is happening. We're talking of uh, exploiting all your water eaters, all the eating, changing path, uh, changing set points and all that, all that ideally all automatic uh, to support the grid and maybe some reconfiguration. So we're changing the paradigm of uh, optimizing with, uh, I would say the, it's the optimization that is changing is border. So we're basically changing the border of Sometimes we will be in a microgrid, sometimes we will provide service to the main grid. Uh, all that need to be tested, implement, uh, develop. Uh, in this case, we're doing work, some of it in simulation, some of it in, um, with real load, real case, how, using hardware in the loop. Uh, the intent is to de-risk uh, the use of things like AI in the, in the grid to, to provide all these solutions uh, that are needed. So hopefully uh, that was an introduction to uh, the topic. Uh, I hope uh, everybody will have good discussion today and will, that, that will lead to new ideas and solutions. Thank you. Hello. Welcome. Uh, my name is Rebecca Seri. I'm an assistant professor in the civil engineering department here at the University of Waterloo and I'll be co-moderating uh, this panel on renewable energy technologies uh, with my colleague, uh, Professor Dipanjan Basu. Okay. It is my pleasure to first introduce the uh, executive director of one of the um, centers here at the university sponsoring this event, uh, the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy, uh, Professor Claudio Canizares. Uh, Professor Canizares is a university professor and Hydro One Endowed Chair in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department here at the University of Waterloo, where he's held various academic and administrative positions since 1993. He's the recipient of the 2017 IEEE Power and Energy Society Outstanding Power Edu Engineering Educator Award, the 2016 IEEE Canada Electric Power Medal, and multiple uh, IEEE Power and Energy Society Technical Council and Committee Awards and Recognitions, holding leadership positions in several IEEE PES committees, working groups, and task forces. In 2021 and 2022, he received the Award for Excellence in Graduate Supervision from the University of Waterloo. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ken Azaris. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Okay, so can we have the slides? Okay, so my talk is going to drill somewhat on the, on the, on, on the uh, comments and, and uh, figures that uh, Alex presented, and it's going to, and, uh, and particularly from the perspective of Ontario. So I, I have more slides than I have time to talk to, so I'll just uh, skip some of them, but I wanted to leave them uh, as part of my presentation for future reference when you have some time to go through them. Uh, now, the, the, my talk is going to focus on first base, First, giving you the motivation for this energy transition. Uh, the, overview, the an overview of Canadian electrical grids, that, that's when you'll see the significant difference between the different provinces and the challenges that Canada is facing in terms of an energy transition and a zero future. Uh, an Ontario overview uh, that will be brief. Uh, I'll just skip through most of it, but I'll, I'll focus on certain issues that, that are important and relevant for our discussion. Uh, then, then we'll discuss briefly EVs in Canada and what is the future of it. Uh, the the Canada, Canada's net zero 2050 discussion that or, or, or regulations coming up uh, uh, or the policy coming up uh, as well as the hydrogen strategy because that's going to be uh, in which NRCAN is very much involved in, uh, which is going to be basically a, a, an important part of this transition. And then some conclusions and particularly a personal call for getting involved in the net zero transition because it's not going to be only the government or, or agencies or, or industry doing it, but ourselves personally. So uh, the, the, basically the, the energy transition is being moved by, or it's being motivated by the issue of climate change, right? And, and climate change is having a major impact in all of our, 
in all of our activities, and, and, and particularly the power grid, the elect energy systems, and very good examples of it. Uh, what happened in, in, the, in the Maritimes not, not too long ago with Fiona, uh, et cetera. Uh, and examples in the states are, are dramatic, what happened in Texas in 2021. Uh, the, uh, now, the, the, the main transition of what, how this is, as Alex already mentioned, the way this is going to happen is with the electrification of everything. So what I mean is that uh, the, the all en energy systems, including heating, transportation, uh, 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 and, uh, and, uh, and uh, industry is going to happen through electrification. So the backbone of electrification, as Alex already mentioned, and I'm going to be repetitive on this, uh, is going to be a clean electrical grid. Okay? Now, this will require basically, as already mentioned, the replacement of fossil fuels with basically clean, uh, clean uh, energy sources, okay? uh, particularly renewable energy sources. We're talking about mostly wind and solar. Uh, but however, to, for this to happen, we need energy storage. So that's part of the solution, right? And energy storage is not only in the form of uh, electrical energy storage, but also thermal energy storage. That, I think that's going to measure, uh, is going to play a major role within the context of flexibility. Uh, now, uh, uh, as already mentioned, we are talking about at least doubling the, uh, the, ge the electricity generation, right? which uh, and, and, uh, and Alex went even further than that, maybe three times the, the energy production that we, or electricity production that we have, we have right now. Just to give you an example, a uh, 400 kilometer electric vehicle, most, more or less the peak load is 10 kilowatts, which is doubling the peak load of your house. So if you're gonna have an electric vehicle uh, basically in your, in your house, which I have opinions about that because we don't all need a, a level two a charger in our, in our houses, we're basically doubling, the, doubling the, 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 the demand in a house, in a particular house, just with one electric vehicle. So this is a major challenge, and how we're going to accomplish this is, a, is, part of the, is part of the discussion and the solutions as well. And also, all the issues of distributed energy sources. Now, we're talking about all these concepts. It's a, a new buzzword, moving away from smart grid towards grid edge technologies, which is what is happening at the, at the level of low voltage, medium voltage levels, how all these distributed energy resources are going to be integrated in all of this, because that's part of the solution. So uh, there's some major aspects, and, and Alex mentioned many of them, to, for this to take place, for this to happen. Now, what is the start of the electrical grid in, in Canada? Now, let me go briefly through that. When we talk about uh, the electrical grid, the clean, cleaning the electrical grid by 2030, uh, we're talking about different problems depending on where you are. British Columbia is already practically there. Uh, most of it is, is hydro, uh, uh, hydropower. Then we have the major challenge of Alberta, which is a significant uh, 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 electrical system in, in, in Canada, uh, in which most of the 90% of it is fossil fuels, okay? uh, uh, basically coal and gas and petroleum. Uh, so that's a major challenge. Although, as, as already mentioned by Alex, and uh, sorry to keep referring to your talk, but it's very much related, uh, uh, the ch this is already this transition is already happening. This, uh, uh, as, as men uh, Alex mentioned, well, about one gigawatt of uh, 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 wind and solar is being integrated into the system. So, uh, however, for this to happen by 2030, I believe that carbon capture and sequestration is going to have to play a role. And in fact, uh, Albert is very much at the forefront of these of these discussions. Uh, and then we talk, we have Saskatchewan, which is similar to Ontario, to, uh, to Alberta, it's a, a smaller system, but again, 90 plus percent of the energy is coming from fossil fuels. So that's another major challenge, but it's gonna be very similar to, and it's happening something similar to what's happening in Alberta. Then we have Manitoba, which is practically 100% hydro, so it's a very clean system. We have the uh, case of Quebec, which also is mostly hydro, very clean system already. Uh, very little gas, uh, a bit of nuclear, and then we have the Maritimes, which are quite different. Uh, the, in some areas of the Maritimes, uh, 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 particularly we have the challenge of, of being uh, the need for uh, petroleum base, which is, we're talking about PI, we're talking about New Brunswick. And then we have Ontario, which is the, the more significant uh, electrical system in, in Canada, after, uh, uh, close to, uh, similar to Quebec in the sense of size. Uh, maybe a bit bigger, and um, with the, uh, the largest province in, 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 in Canada in terms of in terms of industry and, and, and uh, people. So in in, in Ontario, uh, uh, already we're pretty close to a clean system. Um, most of it is nuclear, in fact, uh, and that's uh, something that we need to keep in mind as we move forward in this transition. I don't think that the, the 
Canada, or Ontario is not looking at an option of replacing nuclear with something else. Uh, but, uh, and in that context, we have hydro, which is about 25%. And as you can see here, gas, even though in terms of capacity is significant, it's about 25%, in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, contribution to, to the energy side, it's only 2%, okay? because it's basically peak loading. Uh, now, we also have another challenge in Ontario, in, in Canada, which is remote communities. That's another, even though the contributions to emissions is relatively small overall, it's very significant locally, especially in, in the Arctic zones in the northern communities, which, in which even a small uh, local impact of green, green, uh, uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions, GHG, GHG it, uh, it has a very significant impact, for example, in melting ice in, 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 in Arctic. So that's another challenge. But there are significant wind and solar resources available for these communities. They need to be integrated. Move away from diesel, because diesel, as you can see here, well, this is uh, well, about 180 or 140 communities are basically based on diesel. And we're talking about a very significant emissions, very significant cost, especially for the governments, the federal and provincial governments, and, and the challenge that that requires. And it's, it's, there's a transition, there's a major uh, uh, initiative uh, led by NRCAN to basically transition these communities into green energy. Then we have the Ontario grid, which I'm just showing you very briefly, the location of, of energy. Most of it is nuclear in the case of Ontario, as you can see, and it's divided in the Bruce, Darlington, and Pickering. Pickering is being basically uh, closed. Darlington is being transitioned into, into a different type of technology. Uh, now, when you look at the capacity, again, it's different from the energy, but what I wanted to highlight here is that, uh, oops, more of it, most of it is, most of it is new, uh, uh, nuclear and hydro. Gas is significant, but in terms of energy, it's relatively small. And this is very interesting. Solar, most of the solar, solar plays a role in Ontario, uh, but at the distribution level. So it's already at the, 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 it's part of the DARE's solution to this problem. Uh, and then we have uh, what Canada, or Ontario in particular, has become an export. Uh, instead of having an importing energy, we're exporting energy significantly. And you can see that, that this is associated to uh, all what happened in, in Ontario is associated to how the, how the uh, energy system evolved in Canada, in, in Ontario, from a, a, a vertical integrated uh, system to a, basically a hybrid type of market, which is what is described here, and the role of the different agencies, which I'm not going to focus on. Uh, now, uh, and the distribution system as well, which is mostly concentrated in a few parts of, uh, of Ontario, but most of it, or the regional area is, uh, or the ur uh, not, or, or rural area is covered by hydro one. Now, uh, now the, the market, the, the way the market opened created certain interesting issues. One of them was the issue that we move on to uh, in trying to introduce flexibility in the market, which is through this time of use, uh, 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 time of use uh, 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 tariffs. And it's interesting to see the evolution of the cost. And this is one of the challenges that Ontario has, which is we are one of the most expensive uh, 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 electrical uh, systems in in, in North America. However, if you look at these prices, we pay about an average 15 cents per kilowatt hour, which is much more than what they pay in, in Quebec or Manitoba, talking about five, seven, twice as much as what they pay. But compared to, to Germany, as, as our, our, our visitors from Germany know, is, is just a fraction. They're, I guess recently they were paying 70 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's quite significant. But instead, it's a challenge for us. And, and that's in the context of how the electricity prices are divided. We used to have these peak electricity prices, the energy prices. We all actually have negative prices now. That's when we have been becoming uh, exporters of electricity. And the main reason for this is not the energy price, but the capacity price. And a capacity market was created to try to address these issues. So uh, now, the future of the grid. So what, are, what is it that we're, we're talking about? So the, the planning of the grid, uh, there was a plan in 2017 for this energy transition, which basically was a 20-year plan with focus around renewables, how to introduce renewables into the system, okay? how to integrate the uh, demand response, uh, energy uh, demand response. However, this was basically the, uh, 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 phased out, if you will, uh, with, the, with the change in government because uh, energy, energy uh, transition or energy 
the energy system is very much political in Ontario, many, many places, but in particular in Ontario, when you change the government, the, the policies change. And now there's a plan under development, actually there's gonna be a, a, a kickoff meeting in which this is gonna be introduced very soon. People are, well, the government is interested in our comments, Ontario government. And one of the interesting differences, most of it is similar to the 2017 plans. However, because of the political issues, renewables are being downplayed. It's hard to argue, hard to explain that, but it's a political issue in which renewables are basically taking a, 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 a backseat to the stage. So there's no direct mention of renewables. However, that's, that's going to have to be part of the solution. Now, I was part of this Energy Transformation Network of Ontario, which basically discussed how theirs are going to be integrated into the system. And we recommended the government, the ISO and the, and the Ministry of Energy in Ontario, that this integration of theirs is going to have, have to happen through distribution, uh, distribution companies, LDCs, as opposed to uh, uh, just uh, the ISO controlling the whole thing. So that's one of the recommendations. And then we have EVs. Now, if you look at the, the evolution of EVs in, in, in Canada, it's interesting because it it's depends on the in incentives that each province has. BC, uh, Quebec is ahead of Ontario because Ontario basically cancelled the, 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 the incentives. Uh, so the penetration of electric vehicles is relatively small in Ontario compared to other provinces which are basically supporting this transition. Okay? Now, uh, what is, what is going to happen with this transition? The charging impact. That's one of the major uh, problems that we have to face in the context of of the, uh, of the energy transition. Where is this charging going to come from? And I think that part of the solution is flexibility. So in other words, if you want to have a, a charger in your, in your house, uh, you're going to have to have certain, or, or give certain control to the local companies. And, and the other thing that I'm, I'm promoting, which is something I discovered having an electric vehicle, is that you do not need level two in every, ha in every home. Most of us which, which have, uh, drive an electric vehicle, I, I commute 140 kilometers total a, a, a day, so I don't really need more than a level one, exceptionally level two. And that can be basically worked out in a different way than adding, uh, adding or increasing the panel size on my home. So that's going to be part of the discussion. Not only, not only, uh, uh, not only uh, just adding electric vehicles, but how we charge them. And that's an, a major challenge. Obviously, level three is something that's going to happen through gas stations, and that's a major uh, load in the system and has to be addressed. Uh, now, uh, one of the important issues, as I mentioned, is incentives. Now, the federal government gave me $5,000 when I got my electric vehicle. It used to be $3,000 more from Ontario, uh, and that's what is happening in Quebec and, and, and BC, and that's motivating people to do this transition. Eventually, by 2030, basically, we're going to have to, well, elect, uh, uh, the intention is to uh, uh, stop the production of uh, gas, uh, gas engines, okay? So that's go every, everybody's going to have to deal with the issue of having an electric vehicle, how to charge it. Now, if you look at the evolution of, of uh, the emissions, uh, uh, what is the challenge? When you see this, you see, okay, well, are we decreasing the emissions? No. Actually, it's pretty flat, which at least we haven't increased, let me put it that way. So this is the challenge that we need to address, right? And this is by 2030. So how this is going to happen, uh, 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 or by 2050, how are we going to become net zero? That's a major question and challenge. And part of it is the 2030 emission uh, reduction plan, which is uh, introduced or has been introduced by, by the government. And basically, all these recent policies, because I don't ha have a lot of time to go through them, but I wanted to highlight a few, a few items here. Uh, one is the EVs, okay, the, the incentives to, oops, the incentives to, uh, to basically uh, transform the system to an EV-based EV uh, 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 transportation system. Uh, the, 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 the greener buildings, buildings part of the solution. Uh, in, uh, uh, industry uh, to adopt new technologies. Uh, a power grid, also mentioned by very detailed, yeah, mentioned by, mentioned by Alex. And the, the community also have a major plan. And we're going to be hearing about communities involved in all of these. Uh, uh, have a, a, a role to play farming and also the issue of, uh, which I already mentioned carbon capture and sequestration is going to be have to be part of the solution is because the, otherwise this transition is not going to happen and now the net zero challenge which is basically how we're going to accomplish or this is what has been discussed um, uh, 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 the accelerator plan which is a lot of money and probably you heard the, the, the uh, federal government 
a, a budget a, a couple of weeks ago in which there's a lot of investment in the power grid, which is something that has happened also in, in, the, in, the, in the states. Now, part of the solution is hydrogen. Hydrogen is gonna, gonna play a role of this, especially in, in the industries that are basically uh, uh, require this, this energy source. And, 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 and Canada is particularly well suited for this because we have a lot of expertise. We have done a lot of, 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 of interesting work or uh, pioneering work in Canada, and I think we're gonna have to harness that, that work. And these are the challenges and recommendations. This is a, a report in which, what, what is it that needs to be accomplished? And hydrogen for uh, heavy transportation is gonna be part of the solution of, of the transition to a clean, a clean system. Uh, now, my, to conclude my, my, my presentation, I guess uh, uh, the challenge is how by 2030 the grid is gonna become and I already you heard Alex is going to be a major challenge, particularly in that Alberta, New Brunswick, uh, Nova Scotia. How this is going to happen is Saskatchewan as well. Uh, would the grid reach a net zero uh, expected demand? Uh, 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 with expected demand, well, that's a question mark. We hope so. Flexibility is going to have to uh, be a plan of it. There's a major investment done in the states, and there was a recent announcement for the federal government investing in the power grid. So uh, if you're in the power grid, uh, money is going to be raining on you. So it's a good business to be in right now. And how fast will the transition to EV will take place? Well, that's also a question mark. Uh, now, one thing that I want to, to close my remarks is how this is going to happen. It's not only, it's not only, and this I want to stress, it's not only waiting for the for the con or, or waiting for the government to act, but we need to act ourselves. So my call to action, to action is get an EV. I already did. Install a solar panel, I already, I'm in the process of doing that. Replace gas furnaces with heat pumps, I'm in the process of doing that. And it, it will not be cheap, we will not have to invest, the government is providing funding, but we ourselves have to, to also make a commitment, okay, uh, that, that is investing in the future. So it's, it's really, a, we might stop sort of dilly-dallying and it's time to start walking the walk and talking the talk. So, in, in personally speaking as well, thank you. Okay, um, just to clarify, we are having Q&A after all the uh, presentations, okay? So hold those thoughts. Uh, our next uh, speaker is Pratap Varudu, uh, Ravudu, sorry, let me take that again. Uh, Senior Director um, of Microgrid Solutions and Strategic Partnerships from Schneider Electric. Uh, uh, Pratap is a proven business leader who combines technical expertise with business knowledge to build a resilient, affordable, low carbon energy future, we all want that. Pratap's focus areas include developing and leading microgrid solutions for various customers, including distributed energy resources. Um, he's created new strategic partnerships for microgrids and energy as a service offers. He has more than 39 years of experience in multiple leadership roles, including in power systems engineering, marketing services, renewable energy products, business development, large project and large project management. Um, he's collaborated with sales teams to establish and grow a portfolio of clean energy solutions through pre-sales, account management, and upselling activities. Prior to microgrid, his microgrid solutions role, Pratap was a senior manager of IoT solutions and partnerships where he led an engineering team in establishing smart grid solutions. He's led and managed the development of Schneider Electric Smart Grid Lab and is leading the development of Smart Campus Integrated Testing Hub at the Toronto Metropolitan University. Uh, microgrid projects execution is in project in various buildings in Canada. Please join me in welcoming uh, Pratap Ravudu. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's really uh, Pleasure to be, you know, talking about renewable energy, renewable energy assets. And uh, my name is Pratap Revaru. And today I want to share with you how renewable energy assets and technology breaks are enabling the electrification. And also that will transform the infrastructure which we are talking about. Some people call it as grid of the future. Some people call it as building of the future and transportation of the future. So it is the pathway 
to decarbonize our communities, our cities, to protect the planet. So for me, I will, with a limited time, I will talk about energy transformation, Canada 2030 emission plan, microgrid ready or microgrid intro, and microgrid value prop, and the market, and what are the solution stacks we have, and also I'll talk about you know, what we can do in future. So we know what is causing climate change. We know that reducing greenhouse gas emissions is the best way to slow it. And we know we have to wide the range of systems to curb these emissions. In other words, it is not a case of starting from scratch and inventing the decarbonization wheel. Instead, it is about accelerating the present approaches and technologies. Today, there is one sort of, you know, not one solution which fixes all the problems. The need is to have mix of all the solutions and including the ones whose potential is still widely underutilized or under sort of no appreciated. We have this Canada 2030 emission reduction plan. And if you see that, we have four sectors, namely building, heavy industry, transport, and electricity. And these four sectors almost contributing around 56% in 2019 emission levels. So let us look at the challenge of the three sectors. Almost 128 megatons reduction has to happen in less than seven years. So which means electricity around 47 megatons, buildings around 38 megatons, and transport is around 43 megatons to be reduced from 2019 levels by 2030, which is almost less than seven years. So we have an opportunity now because there is number of you no know, investment tax credits have been announced. So one of the opportunity in 2023 is tax credits, which is around 15% re refundable tax uh, investment tax credit and also 30% on manufacturing tax credit. So this is the great news for clean tech transformation. Of course, we need to have more details as previously mentioned. So what is more important right now is actually, you know, what are the trends? So if you see the trends, globally, we are all talking about net zero, by 2050, so which means we need to think of net zero CO2 emissions globally in the early sort of no 2050 is required to be stay under 1.5 C. And the second one is electricity demand. I think everyone is talking about electricity demand, which is going to grow projected almost 80% about today's levels. And the next one, which is in Canada, we are talking about net zero electricity, which has to be fossil free by 2035. And then with that, we have two, three sort of implications. One is actually decarbonize. We also talked about you know, how much investment is required. So worldwide, the need is actually almost triple what we are actually investing today. And then energy cost, if you see the energy cost, every globally as well as in Canada, we are actually you know, having a bit of you no know, change in the price of the electricity, which is growing some places twice, some places three times, some places even four times. And then we have an immediate requirement, which is actually you know, decentralized and decarbonized. So that's where we see actually, you know, almost like 2.5 times microgrids are going to grow. 
which is going to be within 10 years. So if you see here, the new value chain is going to come and that's where we see more and more prosumers are going to be evolved. So the new value chain where energy consumers are, will become prosumers. Prosumers will be very active participants of the value chain by producing their own energy, by choosing when to use it and also when to store it and also when to sell it back to the grid. So this new energy landscape is coming faster than what we thought. And this is where actually microgrid plays very important role. And this energy landscape is going to enable us to decarbonize and also decentralize. So if you see actually our relationship with the electrical energy is changing, both on the industrial side, on the personal side, residential side. As Claudio mentioned, everyone has to take no, some sort of you know, active participation, what we can contribute to reducing emissions. So we are looking to electricity as a cleaner, more efficient, and also more resilient way, the way in which we want to use. So it is really encouraging, and also I'm optimistic, of transformation as we see the purchase of renewable energy assets, you can call it as PV, wind, energy storage, electric vehicles, heat pumps, and also other electrical process changes, which is happening in, in the industry. So similar to how the internet has revolutionized how we live, we need to prepare for same revolution, how we can manage the electrical energy over the next 20 years. Everything is going to be connected, everything is going to be electric, and every customer need to be empowering this optimization and how we can actually you know, maximize the use of the electrical energy. Now technologies are available. In fact, IEA says that more or less around 70% of the technology is available today to make it happen to this decarbonization and digitization. So the change will be around the investment needed for these new technologies and also the regulation approvals necessary to see that, that we come actually see that you know, the reality of the change. So I will talk about briefly about the microgrid itself. So microgrid is actually you know, in three modes of operation we can operate. One is called grid tied, the other one is islandable, and the other one is off grid. We talked about the remote communities, remote microgrids. That's where the technology is already available we need to actually accelerate the implementation of execution. So just to know the, the definition of microgrid is an integrated energy and power management system with interconnected loads as well as distributed energy resources operating in parallel with the grid or islanded. So microgrid provides decentralized, digitized, and decarbonized alternatives to expensive and polluting fuels. So that's where actually we decarbonize. So if you see, there are three areas we focus when we talk about the microgrids. One is the energy cost optimization. The second one is the resiliency. The third one is the decarbonization. So they are giving actually real integrated outcomes. One is actually consume energy when it is green, reliable at low cost, and also it will give revenues for energy from the energy markets, and it will protect against extreme weather, 
and also grid instability and also avoid cost downtime. And it will avoid also grid capacity restrictions. So if when you think of the decarbonization, it will reduce carbon footprint. It will also enable smooth integration of mobility. So when you think of use cases, there are a number of use cases. You can think of economic performance. You can think of grid ancillary services. You can think of non-wire alternatives. You can also think of self-consumption and backup power and renewable integration. When you think of all these things, almost all use cases, either it will be related to economic performance or resiliency or sustainability. So then next question is actually where are the microgrids? Microgrids are actually everywhere. You can see that you know, in buildings, you can see in large sites, you can also see infrastructure. So then next one is actually more on the how we can actually implement this. If you see here, there is a way you can actually think of sizing the microgrid, you can think of the electrical distribution, you can think of the power management system, you can think of energy management system. So this is where we can go from start, how we can actually design, how we can actually think of you know, integrating with the electrical distribution, then how you manage when the grid is not there, and also you can think of you know, every minute optimization. So this is the way we, we follow how we can, you know, in fact, you know, execute a microgrid. We plan, we design, we finance. There is a one sort of a, you know, new business models are coming, which is called energy as a service, and then we can build, and then we can operate and maintain. So this is what most of the microgrids will see, how much we are actually getting from the utility, how much we are getting from the renewable energy sources and how we are actually charging and discharging the batteries and how we manage the load. And then most of the microgrids also measure uh, CO2 emissions, which means actually how we can actually save the emissions by using more and more renewable energy. And then we are also thinking about you know, how we can actually you know more and more grid reinjection which means actually, you know, back to the grid. So this is the full sector, full stack of the solutions. You can see that, you know, we start with the distributed energy resources. So you can call it as PV, you can call it as uh, energy storage. You can also have the uh, uh, BSS, the, uh, the distributed, sorry, energy storage. And also we can have the CHP. And we, have, we need to have electrical distribution because we need to integrate with the, all the uh, distributed energy resources. And then we need to do power management system. And then we have to have the energy management system. And then to actually, you know, if you have more and more microgrids, we can actually, you know, think of how to sort of, you know, enterprise level management when you have multiple microgrids. So there are a number of things which we are actually working on because we want to make microgrid very simple execution, very simple integration. We are want to make it you know, complex to simple. Uh, so that's why we are introducing new type of solutions. One is called microgrid flex, which is basically, you know, you can think of you know, microgrid in a box which means you, know, you can configure, you can actually manage to connect your distributed energy resources. We are also thinking about you know, how we can help on the engineering studies, and we are also bringing what we call EV management solutions, and we are also bringing energy storage. So this is just about uh, our uh, Schneider. So this is where I think you know, we are bringing new type of solutions so that you know, we can make 
microgrid managed to simply integrate very easily and also making simple and also connect to the number of distributed energy resources. We have been living in an age of fire. Since harnessing its power, it has fueled our evolution, but it came at a cost. It's time to decarbonize. It's time to evolve to a new electric world. It's time for a change of mentality. Let's look at electricity through a digital lens and let them bring out the best in each other. When electric meets digital, it gives us new ways of thinking about it, new ways of distributing it, new ways of saving it. Energy becomes visible, connected, smarter, and more controlled. It becomes Electricity 4.0. Electricity 4.0 works for you and with you. It delivers more and wastes less. It helps companies and individuals operate more efficiently, more successfully. It helps our planet become more resilient. A new, all-electric, all-digital world. The future is simply electricity for zero. Zero waste, zero emissions, zero carbon. Electricity 4.0. Thank you. All right, it's my pleasure now to introduce our next panelist, uh, Mr. Brad Cross, the president of Cross Heating and Air Conditioning Limited, who started this business in 1987 while in high school. Uh, Brad installed his first air source heat pump in 1990 and continued to seek knowledge and experience. He obtained his heat loss gain and air system design in 1994, as well as a certificate of qualification as refrigeration and air conditioning mechanic 313A, G2 gas filter and OBT2 oil burner mechanic licenses. He became accredited to design and install geothermal systems. Through the years, he has designed and installed many residential systems and trained others in all aspects of heating and cooling homes. He assisted Enercan with the air source heat pump sizing and selection guide and tool by providing input from a contractor's perspective, that on the ground experience. He sits as a member of Conestoga College's program advisory committee for HRAC, continues to lead a successful and progressive HVAC company today. Please join me in welcoming Brad. That's the advanced slide. Okay, figure I'm all mic'd up, so uh, looks like I got some uh, selfie skills to work on in my LinkedIn page. Um, so I am, uh, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, we've talked about a big picture in uh, the big picture and what we are is I'm a little bit of a micro, in, in the micro world. Uh, I deal with uh, heat pumps and primarily, oops. we've got a little technical difficulty. Uh, I deal primarily in uh, heat pumps in the residential retrofit market, which means what I do is I'm, well, not myself per se, but generally my team works hand in hand with homeowners and with manufacturers in developing solutions uh, for homeowners and their heating. Still work. Did you do this to me? <laughs> Here we go. I think we're I think we're good. So what this is is more of a contractor's journey. So this is us uh, feet on the ground. We're talking with the homeowners, the end users. Uh, of course, myself, uh, and I had that fine introduction. We'll save some time. Uh, primarily, equipment options in air source heat pump world. What we can offer to to homeowners is uh, centrally ducted air source heat pumps, which mean we have a duct system that circulates through your home to service the heat and cool throughout your entire home. Uh, a lot of people now are still using gas furnaces, oil furnaces, propane furnaces. Some are using electric furnaces, distributed that throughout your home. With the air source heat pump world, we can supply uh, 
we can do a heat pump system with all electric, and we can also do a heat pump system with dual fuel using natural gas, propane, or oil. Uh, we also install ductless mini split single zone air source heat pumps uh, to do maybe one small area or one particular, particular zone. We also do multi zone air source heat pumps, which we do a whole home or multi, uh, multi, multiple areas of a home. In the centrally ducted air source heat pump, on the, eh, on the right side, that is typically all electric. Uh, the top right corner of that picture happens to be electric resistance heat, and the outdoor unit, which is in the bottom right, that happens to be the air source heat pump. So uh, with, with a system like that in the bigger box unit, that's what takes the place of your furnace. So what we can do is we can have electric resistance heat in that box and the air source heat pump on the outside and they can work in conjunction with each other. So as the temperature drops, you have to appreciate air source heat pump has a harder time extra extracting heat from the air as the temperature drops. Uh, we've certainly got great technology now and it works, works down, we have units that are working down to minus 30 Celsius, um, providing about 80% of their heat output. But it can work in conjunction, so as it's not meeting the load of the home, the electric resistance heat will help support the heat load of the home. On the left hand, we have on the left is like a gas furnace or propane furnace. There's also oil furnace you can have, separate controller and an outside air source heat pump as well. Uh, difference in these systems is the heat pump and the carbon, carbon based fuel appliance that's heating your home can't work together. Technically, uh, just the way that, just the way that technically they're set up in refrigeration system. So that's a centrally ducted air source heat pump. So what we usually do is set it to a balance point where the air source heat pump will provide your heat load down to a particular, particular temperature. And after that, it flips over and the air source heat pump stops working and your gas furnace or, electric, or gas furnace or propane or oil furnace takes over from there. Uh, single zone air source heat pumps, uh, they have, typically have an outdoor unit and an indoor head, and that happens to be a high wall head. You'll see them up higher on your walls, uh, sort of on the right hand side. You can maybe see it on the right, maybe ahead there with the out outdoor unit, and it needs interconnecting tubing and electrical and communication going between the two. Now, this is multi source air source heat pumps. On the right hand side is a, what we've heard to as a floor unit and that's an indoor unit as well. And on the left is a ceiling cassette, a four-way ceiling cassette, single wall ceiling cassettes, as well as some actual duct, uh, medium static or low static ducted systems we can put in certain zones and supply heat to particular areas. Uh, that single, single unit, the single unit can actually be paired, doesn't have to be paired with a head like that. It can be paired with any one of these heads. Right now, we've, uh, after, for a little bit now, we've had the Canada Greener Homes Grant. And with the Canada Greener Homes Grant, we have grants up to $5,000 for air source heat pumps, cold climate air source heat pumps. Now, if you're in Enbridge territory, you can get up to 6,500. These are, this is all information our consultants need to know because of course you appreciate we're working with homeowners and that's part of the conversation they wanna have is what, uh, what the end cost will be to them in the initial investment. And you'll also get up to $600 in uh, contribution towards total cost for pre and post energy evaluation. There are other things, uh, other things that are, you're eligible for too. Uh, there's loans and stuff like that. And that's uh, best speaking to energy evaluator. So typically we have interactions with homeowners. So with a homeowner, generally we're gonna get a call. They may not know anything about a grant. They may not know anything about a heat pump. But what a homeowner is, gonna, is looking for is they're just looking to either replace a piece of equipment. And of course, we're primarily in the retrofit market. So we're working with century homes and uh, maybe 20 year old homes. We're not actually a lot in the new home construction. So we have to look at what their home is and work on how we can adapt the new technology and, and air source heat pumps in order to function in their home to provide them the comfort and uh, quality of install and longevity of equipment and reduce their energy bills. Uh, so typically we'd advertise, we get calls, and then we, we um, schedule consultants to go out and visit with, uh, with the homeowners. While we're in the homes, we're looking at home construction, we're looking for insulation values, we're looking for windows, we're looking for uh, occupants that are in the home, what typical activities are in the home. 
sometimes which way the home faces. Uh, we're also looking at your existing equipment. What, what do you have now that we can adapt to utilize to provide you with that heat with air source? We also have to look at things that are very important to us right now, our electrical limitations. Now, we service uh, an area from Waterloo, uh, Cambridge, all the way to King Carden and all areas in between. Uh, we do run into a lot of, lot of homes still, century homes and, and uh, rural homes that don't even have a 100 amp service. We have some with fuse panels still. We have with a 60 amp service. We have some with just a 100 amp service, maybe on breaker. And we sometimes have them on the left. You'll see that is a breaker panel that is absolutely full. And that needs to be upgraded by an electrician in order to provide space for us to be able to electrify the home with an air source heat pump. Other thing that homeowners are really concerned about is the aesthetics of their home. What is it going to look like? Uh, what's it going to look like? Uh, we have homes that have finished basements and there's certain things that we can't do without a, uh, large renovations. From there, on the left happens to be a screenshot. Uh, we do the CSA to F280 12 uh, heat loss heat gain calculations in the home uh, for measuring the windows and looking which way it faces, the size, the insulation values. Uh, and what that's going to do is that's going to give us what the heating requirements are of the home. Because typically the equipment that's been in homes has been oversized, whether it's, whether it's been uh, a gas furnace or oil furnace. Typically it's been oversized, but we want to determine if they've done any renovations, just exactly what we're going to need to heat and cool that home. Interesting part in the software that we use is that uh, they have bin city data. So with air source heat pumps, as the temperature drops, of course the capacity diminishes, but we need to know well, if you're gonna do a dual fuel, when, when is that going to, what's the capacity of an air source heat pump at a particular temperature, and when's that gonna balance point, when's it gonna cut over, and you're gonna shut the heat pump off and start using your gas furnace. On the right, it's a little hard to read, but that's bin city data for Waterloo region and in uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So. A lot of times, uh, some of that heat's only running about maybe eight hours, nine hours in a complete year, and that's not all at one, one time, it's just sporadically throughout the winter. This is the, uh, as mentioned a little bit, with uh, certainly, um, probably with Alex's, part of Alex's team, they worked on the air source heat pump sizing selection guide, and that's a worksheet that a lot of contractors don't know about, and, uh, but what they should do is they should pay attention because it has a lot of great useful information in it on how to size air source heat pumps. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions in the contracting world of how to size an air source heat pump for your residential home. In the center, that is a, sort of an Excel-based uh, software that was developed by uh, Enercan. And uh, that actually puts a lot, we can um, research, get a lot of data from particular equipment and we research what the home requires and we can input that data and it's gonna give us some great, great information in the end. That isn't always done uh, during a home co consult, uh, but it's certainly something that's available. This here is part of that guide. The interesting part of that guide, if you look at, look at the blue line, the line comes from the top down to the center, that's your heating load line. So as the temperature, of course, as the temperature increases, you're gonna need less heat, less heat or less energy to, keep your home warm. Uh, and on the right hand side, there's a bar that goes from uh, sort of straight up and that's your design cooling load. Because we're, we're both doing heating and cooling, we need to have consideration of both when we're installing equipment at home or selecting equipment for your home. If you look at the red, uh, the red, that is a three ton variable capacity heat pump. And you'll see, um, I don't think I can, oh, here we are. So right in here is what we refer to as a balance point. So that's a balance point for that particular heat pump. So you can see what temperature that that will provide all the heating for uh, down to that temperature. Below this, you're either gonna have res electric resistance heat assisting it, or you're gonna shut off uh, the heat pump and you're gonna have uh, gas on a du uh, dual fuel or hybrid system. Um, so that's a variable capacity. You can see how that actually operates. The second one on the orange, or the kind of the orange the yellow, uh, that's a three ton, um, three ton, two stage heat pump. And on the lower, that is a single stage, two and a half ton heat pump. Uh, you might question, why is it two and a half? Why are these three? Well, the nice part about three, 
these here are variable capacity and two stage is they will actually operate at a lower capacity uh, when demanded. Whereas a sing single, uh, single stage, um, it's one heat output, one cooling output all the time, on and off. So what we try to do is figure it has to, after we provide this, we can look at what it, um, in the cooling load to make sure we keep the comfort. We can, re of course, reduce the sensible heat, but we can get rid of the latent heat properly so people are comfortable, equipment's not short cycling and uh, causing failures or actually causing it to cost them more money or burn, utilize more energy to cool their home. In that uh, tool, the Excel tool, uh, with this is one of the very many sheets, uh, but this is actually kind of a summary at the end of that tool. It's just sort of a screenshot of it. Uh, this is, these here are three different uh, systems. And we put it in depending on what all the characteristics of the system and the characteristics are home. This here is we have to tell it, well, what province are you, are you in? What's your region? And with this, where this here is telling us how much carbon is required or, or how much carbon dioxide emissions are there uh, for this particular heating system in a, in, a, in a year, heating season. So as you can see, different systems might, uh, might produce a little more, uh, little more carbon. And even though these are all electric, uh, one thing to note with this is this is actually for uh, the electrical grid supply from 2015 statistics. That's what, that's what they had available when they made it. So it'll actually be different now. This in the center is the heating cost. This is what homeowners are very interested in. Uh, we do separate calculations for that, but in this software, it'll tell you what your heating costs, because we put in what the costs are per kilowatt hour, what your costs are per, meg, uh, per cubic meter for natural gas, or liter of oil, or liter of propane. Um, and the one on the right is basically, it's just the total energy required to, in a heating season to heat your home. So the one on the right, it's been cut off, but, um, that there, it's interesting, just for maybe people who are kind of nerdy about it, but it's just interesting to see how much heat they can actually extract from the outside air uh, that supplements your home heating. From there, we have to determine, first of all, how the stuff fits, what other upgrades are required, but we'll try and give, give consumers uh, a number of different options, from a value option all the way up to the ultimate option for that's much quieter, more efficient, and uh, and the longevity might be a little bit longer in a in a system like this with longer warranties. Um, we also so we give we need to give the consumer choice, but we also uh, give them um, a choice of maybe just an air source heat pump, and with an air, just an air source heat pump, that there it's it may not be eligible for grant, but it can move people forward. So. Uh, of course, we have to order the equipment then, and professional inst installations, which is very important. You can order these things off of Amazon. I wouldn't advise installing yourself. We have seen numerous ones that have uh, generally leaked refrigerant into the atmosphere. We're trying to, we're trying to stop that, but uh, when people install themselves, we could have anywhere from four to 12 pounds of refrigerant leak out of any particular system at any given time if it's not done correctly. And of course, we have to do a customer follow-up ensure that they understand how the equipment's operating and if they have any questions, answer them for them. There's uh, great installs and there's installs that, you know, just uh, maybe have a little trouble. Um, some of the installs, they might short circuit. Some installs look great, but when we look at them, we notice where the issues can lie. Uh, so training for the trade, every trade magazine we've been getting has something about air source heat pumps in the last two years. All the dealer meetings that I've went to throughout Canada throughout the U.S. have all had something about air source heat pumps and they have some very interesting information. And uh, one thing about pitfalls in the industry is collaboration with the industry. We uh, maybe have a bit of a disconnect sometimes. We need to have every, everybody on the team and every player on the team needs to kind of have a part in it. And when we have some people that are actually looking at, uh, looking at their, own, uh, their own statistics, their own numbers, and not collaborating with the other, we don't necessarily have buy-in or we don't have commitment to the end result. And of course, we're a sales-driven uh, industry. And of course, there's labor shortages, and uh, there's also a misconception and a lack of knowledge because we do have a lot of contractors that I hear every day that say, air source heat pumps don't work in our climate, it's too cold. So, and 
it's not the only solution, but it is an additional solution that we can use with both geothermal, air to water, or any other type of heating system. Appreciate it. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Milfred Hammerbacker. He's the founder and CEO of S2E Technologies. Milfred has 30 plus years of experience in sustainable energy and development. He has been lucky enough to manage businesses in five countries. As co-founder and CEO of S2E Technologies Inc., uh, his uh, team built solar factories, over 800 megawatts of solar projects, and are currently building sustainable communities in London, Ontario, and Mexico. Uh, they have recently partnered with Ainsworth to create sustainable energy platforms across North America. So, Milfred, thank you. Good morning, thank you. A simpler bio would have been that he's an old man and he's made a lot of mistakes and have a lot of lessons learned that he's probably going to write some books about someday. So. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of uh, projects in uh, London, Ontario that we're doing. And uh, I'm going to give you a warning up front. I kind of live in a schizophrenic bipolar world. I'm super excited about where we are with technologies today. And I'm super depressed about other things. And you're going to get a little bit of flavor of the, both in this presentation. But the good thing here is I got a lot of cool pictures to show you, OK? So a little perspective of uh, where we've come from. So definitely, I'm a technology guy. Our company started out purely in solar. Um, done a lot of those kind of uh, pictures there, built factories. Um, and then 10 years ago, for some reason, it wasn't enough. And we decided, oh, let's look at real estate development. So um, that was an interesting change that we've done. And we've created a division in our company called 7Gen. We borrowed from the Iroquois Nation. Um, the Iroquois Nation has a very interesting perspective of everything you do today, you should have the seventh generation in the future in mind. And so if that is your stakeholder, or your children is your stakeholder, it changes your perspective on what you're doing today. So the first project I'll talk about is called West 5. Um, we were actually a consultant. Uh, um, we're the technology partner for the developer Sifton Properties in London. And it is uh, a 70 acre uh, um, site. And when it's completed, there'll be 2,000 living units, about 500,000 square feet of commercial retail space. And uh, the goal is for this entire community to be net zero. And today it's about 25% complete. Here comes the pictures. But first, kind of the origin of that project, and, and it's really cool to be here at the University of Waterloo because there's a lot of connections uh, with this. Um, we actually approached uh, Sifton about 10 years ago now with an idea of let us do a feasibility study. If we can take your common status quo development and do something special and more sustainable with that. And uh, they said, OK. And what we did is we worked with an insert network. Um, it's called Smart Net Zero Energy Buildings Network. Um, and the, the, the runner or the, the, uh, the leader of that group was a professor, Andreas Anthionitis at Concordia, who has roots here in Waterloo. We worked with 11 universities and brought on 90 postdocs, co-op students, um, and uh, from all those universities to do this feasibility study. And that is the master plan concept that the students came up with. And I can say today that most of that master plan is being used in the development today. So it's pretty cool. Students out there shows the impact that you can have even while you're in school um, in, in our future. Um, probably one of the funnest times in my career working with that many smart motivated, passionate people. The thing I'm excited about is the technology is here today to do these things. Obvious, 
you can see the pictures. We're able to build communities that have a much lower impact on the environment. And that's the exciting thing. So we're gonna try this one more time. <laughs> So there's uh, 160 uh, um, townhomes on the property that are occupied, and those are net zero energy plus. The beauty of working on a community scale is um, you don't have to make every building net zero. These high rises, the taller uh, buildings are tough, and so if you have certain parts of your community that's generating more, it allows you to uh, cost effectively build other buildings that aren't quite net zero. Um, it gives you a lot of flexibility, and I think, you know, if you have the luxury of being able to look at a community scale than a building scale, it's definitely something of value. Um, this is a retirement uh, building. Half of it's complete and occupied, and the other half it will be uh, complete uh, this summer. Um, it's a near net zero, uh, um, and, and one of the, there's a couple reasons. Um, retirement village, there's a, a complete cafeteria kitchen energy hog. And you'll notice we don't have any uh, parking lots around this building, so there's no car canopy, solar canopies to generate. So we don't quite meet net zero with these buildings. This is another look at it. Um, one of the important things is, you know, I assume a lot of you guys are technology guys. Um, we could build a technology perfect uh, um, community, but if no one wants to live there, because it's ugly or confusing, then you haven't been successful. So you got to look at some of the other human aspects of, of the design. An office building, also net zero. Another look at it. So there's, this is, started 10 years ago, and just now I have real pictures. I don't have to show renders anymore. I have real things. This has actually been done. And it's been done in London, Ontario. That's an important thing. We like to say, if you can do this in London, Ontario, you can do it just about anywhere in the world. Now, that's not a diss on London. There's two things. London, the weather. Sunshine in the winter, mm, not so much. Hot and cold. But also, London is actually well known, I find this out, as being kind of the pilot place for like any US fast food chain that wants to come to Canada, London is the first place they go because Londoners are average Canadians. Interesting thing. So it's a, it was a great place to do these projects. Here's a, another thing about, about our, uh, our community here. It's a blessing and a curse. We got a lot of parking lots. Um, there's a lot of people going to be living there. And we covered those parking lots with solar canopies. That allows us to get to net zero. On the other side, I'd really like people to not be in cars, you know? We'd like to not have so many parking lots. So this is kind of a transition. It gives us an ability to be net zero now, but in the future, I'd like to see less parking lots in our world and figure out another way to generate the power. Um, this is an inside look. Uh, you'll notice um, this is uh, built uh, incredibly uh, strong, and that's uh, a regulation issue um, that uh, is one of the things I'm not very optimistic about. Uh, instead of a normal solar car canopy, there's a regulation in Ontario that you can't have a solar car canopy, canopy close to a residential uh, development. So we had to build this like a building, tripled the cost of it. Those are things we got to solve. So the other project, Eve Park. Um, this is a project, now we've transitioned from being a consultant technology advisor, we're the developer. Uh, it's it's uh, the money that used to be in my pocket and my team that's doing the entire project. When it's done, there'll be 84 units. Um, and uh, one of the cool things about this is we looked at transportation as a real driver for the design of this and it's under construction. So EVE actually stands for Electric Vehicle Enclave. So when we look at, we've seen a lot of slides, we had a pretty clean electrical grid here in Canada. And so buildings, yes, we need to make them more efficient. 
um, we, uh, to uh, reduce the impact on greenhouse gases. But I'm, I'm one of these guys that like to look at low-hanging fruit. You got this transportation sector that's just booming with greenhouse gas emissions. And how can we do that? So the first thing in designing a community, try to get people out of cars. And it's tough where this uh, is located. Um, we're actually negotiating, trying to negotiate with London Transit to put an electric bus stop here that'll be fed by our microgrid. We also have a neat bike trail system, so e-bikes are gonna be an important part of this. And then the final thing is, what's a community look like if all the vehicles are electric? And we added another touch to that is, what happens when these vehicles become autonomous? And so actually, we've been working with the Mectronics Lab here at Waterloo um, with uh, Professor uh, Amir uh, Kajnapur. Um, they've done some great, I don't know if anyone is from that group here, they've done some great work on the autonomous. We've got a little bit ways to go before we can really use that though. One of the other features is how do we get rid of parking lots? And so we uh, have a, an innovative uh, way to park cars in a tower. Um, we, we got the technology from a Korean company and all we did was add electric vehicle charging to that. And that's not as simple as you think because you don't want to start stop charging of electric vehicles. So as this carousel is moving around, you can't turn the power off, turn it on. So we had to figure out a way to keep power going to those chargers constantly. And we borrowed from the amusement park ride industry that have to do that all the time, right? The end result is um, create an experience for our residents that is more environmentally um, and, and better for human health. And so get rid of the parking lot, put in a park. And the other part of this is, again, technology company, but our architects, the folks that we worked with, is so important to look at many other aspects. And one of them is the social aspect. So um, if you live in a suburb of Waterloo, which I do, um, probably the biggest destroyer of neighborhood social interaction is the garage door opener. You can go drive into your garage, close it, and never have to see a neighbor, say hi to a neighbor, just gets rid of that kind of random interaction that you might have with a neighbor. In, in this case, they park in the tower and they're walking through this park to get to their door, chance meeting with neighbors, um, it, it provides a, try to bring some social interaction back to our society. The pandemic, I think all of you realize, we're kind of hungry for that. So, under construction, oh my, this has been a, a labor of love, um, but the two of the four buildings are under construction and we'll be occupying them uh, this summer. So, it's a very exciting time for us. We didn't stop with just uh, the technologies and the designs. We also wanted to look at the construction process. Uh, anyone that's in the construction industry, um, we came from outside and you just scratch your head. Really, they do it this way? If you built a car the way construction industry builds houses, oh my gosh, that car probably costs 10 times as much. And so there was a lot of things that we looked at in there. And what we ended up doing is using Matt panelization modular construction. So we crane in big chunks of this building. Each one of these uh, units is a pie shape, so it's kind of cookie cut and bring it in there. We definitely reduce a lot of waste by doing that. Uh, we definitely increase or, or shorten the construction time uh, a tremendous amount. Um, reducing costs, question mark, is, is uh, we're still, we, we, we did this in the pandemic time where our cost increased just a ridiculous amount in a very short period of time. So we don't know exactly where cost will fall going forward. So now we'll come back to the technology side. How do we design net zero? Um, we always start with a menu. There is no, you got to do it this way every time. You need to have a menu of options and then you pick the right options for the particular project, building, or community you're, you're working with. So, and we always start with the efficiency side first. 
And so we've got in all these buildings, we've got some of these, um, some of these are in all of the, the buildings. Design, orientation, shape of the, or the location of the building is critical. You can get up to 60% of your energy for free just by uh, looking at that particular thing. <laughs> Two minutes. Air tightness, insulation also very critical. Um, this is an entirely all electric community. So a lot of people say you can't do that. We're doing that. And it, their energy bill, total energy bill, will be lower than if they were in a traditional uh, code-built uh, home. We have facts. That's the other cool thing. Lots of data now. Air source heat pumps. All the units have air source peat, uh, heat pumps. And all the commercial units have VRF systems fed by heat pumps. And we've had no issues with those. There's a, you know, I'm glad to see Brad on this uh, dais. There's a lot of bad facts out there. I actually had the folks from Marin give a talk to our team a couple weeks ago to help us fight the bad information out there about heat pumps. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really important technology to achieve our goals. Daylighting, yes, windows. Uh, we have uh, all types of uh, windows. The design tries to reduce windows. Then we uh, look at triple pane. Um, we, we've got uh, electrochromic windows in, uh, in the first office building we made. Smart controls, um, hot water conservation. We've got a really innovative uh, shower head that actually atomizes the water and reduces water consumption by 60%. That's a pretty big reduction. And everyone that's used this thinks it's a better shower. It's kind of a cool technology. Um, in, in Eve Park, uh, we have went to a lot of effort to make the appliances as, as efficient as possible. We have heat pump clothes dryers in our uh, units, which uh, are a major, major energy savings versus a standard uh, uh, clothes dryer. And then, of course, energy is so important in all this. Uh, we got monitors, <laughs> lots of data, and we share that data with universities. Um, so, you know, a lot of people are hungry for real data. Um, they're tired of simulations. We have real data, and all you have to do is give us a call. We can share that. After that, then you integrate what renewables you need to make it net zero. In the London case, it's all solar, um, but it doesn't have to be all solar. It depends on where you're at. And now I need to wrap up. And we do that through a holistic approach through microgrid type designs. And we also have developed energy models. And, and uh, it was mentioned in my intro, we are proud that we've just formed this joint venture with Ainsworth, which is one of the large electrical contractors in Canada and US. They're owned by a public company, GDI, in Montreal. And we're uh, wanting to basically commercialize microgrids and use energy as a service, which is, I think, is the upfront cost of these technologies is a scary thing. It's a good investment for the right investor. And so that's the idea. Energy as a service, find the right investor to, fu to fund the capital. OK. So all that, we're doing it. So why is this community in London so unique? Why is it there isn't 10 of those in Kitchener, Waterloo, 50 of those in the GTA? It's economical, people love to live there. What's the problem? That's the problem. It's fears in our DNA. It's why we're still here as a species. You know, we're pretty careful, and it's worked really well for us. We like to avoid risk. Status quo, man, we love the status quo. The problem is humans not only love the status quo, they set up institutions, regulations, building codes to maintain that status quo. And then we even go as far as building silos. So we do a lot of cool stuff here, technology, but how many people in Waterloo are on the business side making sure that the business side of this will work? How many social people are here? How do we convince humans that change is not scary? You know, we're in, we're in our silos. And these is why I'm depressed. This is a really big problem, and I don't see the solutions coming. And if we don't 
figure out how to change this status quo attitude, we're in trouble because everyone presenting today has shown 20, 30 goals, 20, 50 goals. We got to move a lot faster than we're moving today. 10 years to get 25% of one community built. It's, it's got to change and we all got to fight the fight. So what can we do together? Thanks, Milfred. Our next speaker is Stan Marco, CEO of GeoSmart Energy. Uh, Stan is one of the co-founders of GeoSmart Energy. He is among the geothermal energy's most well-respected and highly sought-after knowledge experts and educators. In 2008, he was awarded the Canadian Geo Exchange Coalition's prestigious prize for national leadership. Over the past 35 years, he has held senior leadership positions in several leading geothermal companies and has developed expertise in all aspects of the industry, including installation, distribution, manufacturing, and training. His best practice approach has influenced hundreds of thousands of geothermal heat pump installations across Canada and the US and has raised the bar on installation practices across Canada. Stan. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here again. Um, you know, strangely enough, we were here about five years ago, and some of the things that, uh, or I mean, the first time we were here was about five years ago, and uh, we we introduced something at that time that uh, we'll talk about just a little bit later. Uh, it's uh, an amazing thing to uh, to. Um, um, so we're a local company, a family company actually, um, uh, privately owned uh, with a, a, a number of local staff and things like that. Um, uh, you know, I'm just shifting a little bit because of some of the presentations that I heard from the other fellows here. Um, so more than four decades, decades ago, I was a young man, uh, younger than today certainly, uh, working for Manitoba Hydro. Uh, building hydro generating stations and ultimately uh, operating them and uh, moving into system system operations and uh, electricity management things like that going on and, and so to hear all the things that have come before me here it's exciting to think about scary I'm getting goosebumps here so so as a distribution manager of electricity the, uh, the thought of windmills and solar and micro are you guys kidding? At least that was the approach uh, uh, back then. Uh, the utilities were owned by the provinces basically and nobody messes with that. And the fortunate thing is that we have probably the most stable electrical system perhaps, certainly in North America if not the world. Incredibly reliable, things like that. And somehow over the years we've managed to find space and collaboration with um, you know the idea of micro micro uh, sites and and other renewable energies that are contributing to the to the grid the provinces have been changing exchanging uh, electricity between partners for since the beginning of time and still do so today so never fear for 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 if you live in ontario there's lots of power to be had uh, available from manitoba or from our other friends in Quebec and beyond to the east, to the west. So we're all sharing the same grid for the most part, which gives us that reliability. So it's exciting for me to see the changes that are clearly coming, electric 4.0, things like that. Uh, it's, it's an amazing thing that we couldn't possibly have envisioned uh, back then. Um, we, um, during that period of time, uh, I eventually uh, moved back out of northern Manitoba where we were building generating stations and ended up in load dispatch for Manitoba Hydro. And at that point in time, I, I, I bought my first heat pump from a small company in Leamington, Ontario, which is uh, a small little company some of you may or may not know. It was called Water Furnace at that time. And uh, eventually that Canadian company went on uh, 
out of private hands into the, uh, uh, into the public domain and then ultimately back to a private. Today that company is owned by a, um, an organization out of Sweden. Um, in the meantime, here we are today and uh, what we have going on is uh, we're in the geothermal heat pump distribution business. Been at it for close to 40 years now. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have uh, some of the most efficient equipment in the world. And uh, about seven years ago, we started, uh, we started uh, um, looking to make some changes. So the equipment hadn't really changed too much uh, over the years when, when the first heat pump I bought probably had an efficiency of, uh, uh, when we think of something called COP or basically how much heat you get for a dollar coming in. So the COPs back then were maybe 2.8 uh, dollar in, you get 2.8 worth of energy out. Uh, it was a big deal when we got to a dollar in and three, three dollars out, improved efficiency, some new ideas, technology. That didn't change for quite a while and then all of a sudden there was a jump to 3.4, 3.5, 3.6. Um, some of the brochures and things maybe indicated a few things higher than that, but in real life, the, the, the industry kind of, in real life, the industry ended up in an area of efficiency in the 3.6 range, I guess, would be typical of anybody who has a heat pump today that, that they purchased in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so the last 10 or 15 years, not that much has changed um, until now. So five years ago, we were here at this conference and we introduced uh, a new product that we were co-developing with a company out of Europe, in fact, a company out of Spain. And uh, um, that was five years ago. I didn't get that much attention. It looked a little different than everybody else's. And uh, let me tell you, it was a battle to get it developed to the point that it was ready for the marketplace here in North America. And, and uh, today, uh, it's absolutely the most efficient piece of uh, uh, heat pump equipment in the world, no question whatsoever, um, which we're gonna talk a little bit about that today. Geothermal systems are, are uh, heat pumps, typically in a heating mode, if you have a geothermal system, whether it's commercially or residentially, it'll reduce your cooling costs by a minimum of 50% minimum of 50%. So you can imagine that if, if every heat pump, uh, in, uh, every, every facility in, in the area that has air conditioning simply changed to a geothermal system, we double the amount of available power that's available to uh, other, other industries as well as uh, the growth pattern we have in s southern Ontario, which is phenomenal. Um, our heat pumps can do both heating and cooling. Our problem is, or our, our advantage is, is we need to tie into the ground. Historically, we need to tie into the ground. That's our battery. And we, we can do that a number of different ways. So while our air source friends are trying to squeeze some energy out of, out of the air, as you know, the air temperature changes, the capacity of the machine changes, Yes, it runs, but the efficiencies deteriorate quite quickly uh, as the temperature changes. Again, I grew up in Winnipeg. Some of you might have been there before. So today, in, in some place like Winnipeg or Regina, Regina or Calgary or, or uh, certainly Dryden or Thunder Bay, we can see temperatures well below 30 degrees, minus 30 degrees C, or Fahrenheit for that matter. And uh, we're seeing COPs, coefficient of performances, uh, with the existing equipment that I just finished uh, explaining at the beginning, eh, about 3.6, right? It doesn't matter how cold it is, because we're taking the energy from the ground. And uh, we use similar, uh, similar programs that we created 30, over 30 years ago, bin data, things like that to verify what we could do in terms of sizing and stuff like that. Our corporate uh, strategy has always been to heat the whole building. So we don't need auxiliary heat. We don't, we, 
we make sure that our equipment, installed equipment, exceeds the capacity of the balance point of the particular building, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's um, a commercial building or a residential building. It's not unusual in our industry to sell a heater, an electric heater. In our industry, historically, that electric heater is there as an emergency backup, understanding not auxiliary, but emergency. Our good friends in the, in the air source business have, have uh, talked about cold climate, heat pumps, uh, 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 the only real cold climate heat pumps are geothermal heat pumps. So that they don't care how cold it is outside. All the equipment's inside, wear and tear on the equipment from the atmosphere, from the environment is, is not an issue. Uh, we put some high-density polyethylene uh, pipes into the ground. Uh, typical life expectancy these days of that loop, if it's done right, is probably 300 years plus. So it's almost infinite. That's where our battery is, is down there. And we're able to recharge that battery. The Earth does its, its part uh, 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 recharging it for us as well. We can do an open loop system, one, one as an example that similar to this where, and again, we're <coughs> representing this residentially, but this is absolutely possible on a large commercial basis and is being done right now here in Waterloo. Okay. And uh, so basically we can reach down into an uh, applicable ap a aquifer and uh, uh, pull, in this area we'd be pulling 50 degree water out of the ground, 50 degree, 10 degree C out of the ground and returning that same water into another well at probably, I'm going to say maybe 43 degrees thereabouts, so maybe 7 degrees uh, Celsius. So we might steal 3 degrees Celsius out, out of it on its way through. The water remains unharmed, untouched. Uh, and, and that's a system that's capable of being used if there's an aquifer that's usable somewhere underneath uh, this part of the country. In Winnipeg, that's quite common. In Ottawa, it's quite common. We have some very large aquifers here. We have uh, most of the water in this region, uh, drinkable water comes out of an aquifer that's relatively shallow, but we have some, some significant aquifers that are much deeper and uh, certainly nearby this campus that, that this kind of a system is in use in uh, an 11 building structure on uh, Columbia, I think it is. Um, <clears throat> this gives you an idea of some of the range of equipment that we have. Um, our reach is uh, not just, not so much local, we're a supplier, so we're uh, the largest geothermal supplier in Canada for sure. Uh, we supply contractors and developers and innovators uh, in every province in Canada and territory, as well as into the United States, and in some cases, uh, a few of the Caribbean countries, and even a little bit overseas. Um, we've been at it for 40 years. Geothermal is what we do. Things are changing a little bit, so we have to change also. And part of that change is the piece of equipment that we showed here five years ago. This equipment is, uh, as was explained by some of the other people earlier, is on and off equipment. Some of it's two-stage equipment. It ranges between um, 6,000 BTUs of output and uh, uh, 50 tons. So there, there's a whole range of equipment. The efficiencies of this equipment is generally, you know, in the three point something, somewhere between 3.4, uh, I mean 3.3, approaching 4. And then there's this. So this is the product that we really want to talk about right now. Here's a typical installation. The installation on the left would be something that we've been doing for a number of years. This, this installation is doing forced air as well as some in-floor by the smaller component on the side. The new way of doing it is on the right-hand side, and that's what we call a net zero, uh, or net zero brand of equipment, capable of doing just about everything you can imagine. And 
that note, I'm going to call one of my associates. The uh, unusual thing is uh, uh, we've partnered with a company in, in Spain uh, to develop a new product. That's the product we showed here five years ago. Now it's all certified and Energy Star and absolutely the most efficient equipment in the world and uh, with all kinds of capabilities. And for that purpose, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Alberto Ferdas, who represents our factory in Spain and the collaboration between us. Alberto is a graduate of the University of Vigo, who have done uh, and his uh, companions have done a lot of the research and development to make this happen. Alberto, if you could come up, please. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, first of all, five minutes because of him, no? <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry uh, for my English. Uh, I hope I don't invent uh, too many words and you uh, and I make me understand, okay? So if I, have a, if I don't have uh, plenty of time, okay, I will briefly explain about uh, our technology, okay? This, uh, okay, it has no sense, I speak again or tell you again about how important uh, heat pumps are for uh, reaching this goal of net zero uh, for thermal energy, for pr producing thermal energy in a very efficient uh, or in the most efficient way. Uh, so increasing the efficiency and also being greener, sustainable. I can tell you that, uh, um, for example, the situation in Europe is that uh, new buildings, new industries, uh, whatever, because you need thermal energy almost everywhere, um, they don't think of uh, another thing that not installing a heat pump. Um, they don't think already about installing gas boilers or uh, fuel boilers or this kind of equipment. No? In fact, uh, now in Europe, and I uh, think that also because of I, uh, uh, what I have heard before, also here in North America, the target is to replace, I guess, that millions of uh, gas boilers for, for in the next uh, years. So you can imagine that uh, there is going to be a lot of uh, a lot of job. No, so uh, I think that here is uh, you are doing the same, and I think it's it's a way. No, so it was a, a great improvement because uh, it is very important that uh, even if the heat pump is very efficient to increase the efficiency of the heat pump. No? It is very important for the end user because it's going to pay uh, a less quantity of money at the end of the month, but it's also very important for the country uh, because you don't need so many power plants. So the terms of being or the fact of being more and more efficient is really, really important. No? Uh, in our case, we were pioneers in uh, uh, inverter technology in uh, water source heat pumps. Inverter technology is really, really, or it was a great advantage because basically it means that the compressors uh, can adapt its power and can provide the thermal uh, power that you need at every moment. No? Uh, the opposite would be the on-off compressors or these compressors that can uh, only, that have only maybe two or three speeds. No? In our case, we can vary the power from 50% continuously to 100%. So if you need, uh, I'm sorry for the units, uh, because I, in my mind I have European units. Uh, so if you need three, three kilowatts, for example, the heat pump is going to provide you three kilowatts. If you need 10 kilowatts, the heat pump is going to provide you 10 kilowatts. So that's very important at the end for the end user, again, because he's going to pay exactly for what he needs, and also for the country, because as I said before, power supply is two minutes. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> okay, anyway, heat pump. Okay, very important because they can produce, of course, domestic hot water, heating, cooling, the most efficient way. We are, talki we are talking about, I don't, I don't have time, but we are talking about efficiencies at the moment up to 5, 4.8, uh, even 6, so very thick efficiencies, uh, so uh, many things. Okay, I am not going to explain why we get this high efficiency because I have no time but I will be pleased to explain you technically how we can reach this 
no? basically decreasing uh, the temperatures on the load side and uh, increasing the temperatures in the source side, thanks, among many other things, uh, uh, to the big modulation our heat, heat pumps have. Okay, uh, more things. Uh, okay, even we have the possibility to uh, to attend several demands at the same time. This is really, really important. Uh, doing like this or working like this, you can work with efficiencies up to eight, up to nine, up to 12, because as you can see, in comparison with a, with a traditional technology, we can, in that example, we can produce cooling and domestic hot water at the same time, or we can produce cooling and heat a pool at the same time. Basically, we are producing the domestic hot water or we are heating the pool for free. We are doing so with the energy that we are taking from our house or our industry or our whatever uh, in the cooling process, okay? So we have two benefits with the same consumption of the compressor. So things like this can already be done, no? Uh, in fact, uh, we don't take this, uh, the versatility of this, no? We don't talk about geothermal heat pumps or about uh, aerothermal heat pumps. We talk about open source heat pumps. Our heat pumps, uh, water source, you can connect to boreholes and then you have a geothermal installation. You can connect to a dry cooler and you have an, aerother an aerothermal installation. And you can make a combination and you have a, uh, you have a hybrid source installation, taking, taking the, ben the best from the air and from the ground. When the temperatures outside are good, I use the dry cooler. And when they are not so good, I can go with the boreholes. And for finishing, Okay, something very, very, very important. That is the combination between the heat pumps and the PV panels to make that hybridization much more powerful, okay? Uh, this is uh, the future, already the present. What we do is when you have surpluses, when the PV panels are producing more electricity than you need, instead of uh, selling to, uh, for a bad price to the electrical company, what the heat pump makes is to automatically consume that surpluses, okay, so you take advantage of them, and automatically change the settings, all the settings. It increases the temperature uh, for domestic hot water, pool heating, or uh, heating, basically, and decreases the temperature uh, uh, when we are talking about cooling. So you have much more energy storage for free that you are going to use later, so the heat pump is going to last more time uh, for starting again. So at the end, you will uh, reach or you will be much closer to the net zero uh, concept, no? Uh, managing uh, not only the heat pump, but also the combination between the heat pump and the PV panels. This is really interesting. We can change the temperature, as you can see, of the pool, the temperature of a buffer tank, for example, temperature of the, uh, uh, for heating and for cooling, and the temperature of the domestic hot water tank. Even you don't need to install the buffer tank for, for uh, taking advantage of this, te this technology for heating or cooling. You can even uh, change the temperature of the house. This means if I have an exceed of electricity, then I change and instead of 21 degrees, I have 21.5 or 22 degrees and I use my house as a big, big buffer tank. No? So this is really great for increasing or decreasing my energy bill and for becoming uh, net zero. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> okay, uh, very fast, if you, uh, we would be more than pleased to, to go more in detail explaining all these new technologies and I can tell you that uh, heat pumps are really, really important and key for reaching this net zero uh, target or net zero future. Okay, uh, <laughs> thank yeah, you. Just, uh, That's all. Thank you. Just at the, can you play that video? For example, like, like this, it, it is a university in Spain, okay, and they had boilers, uh, gas boilers. Uh, I don't remember how much money they spent every year, but a, a lot of money, and they replaced the boilers for, uh, in this case, a cascade of uh, six uh, heat pumps that modulate uh, from 25 to 100 kilowatt each heat pump. So the total modulation is from 25 to 500 kilowatt. 
So uh, they are working uh, with a seasonal performance factor at the moment up to 3.84. So they are saving thousands and thousands of dollars every of euros there every year. No, in fact, in this case, they also have a hybrid source system. They installed uh, uh, drillings, okay, vertical boreholes, but also to complement and to even to make the installation cheaper, they combine it with big dry coolers and the system. If the air is more efficient, it uses the, the, the air. If the ground is more efficient, it uses the ground. Or if the combination between both systems, air and ground, is the most efficient, then the heat pumps use both the boreholes and the dry coolers. So it's something that it's integrated in the heat pumps and, uh, and it is working well, very well. Uh, if you are interested in changing your, your system, uh, <laughs> you can think about it. About this. <laughs> we will make a special plan. <laughs> we'll talk, we'll talk. Thank you again, eh? <laughs> Hello and welcome back, everybody, um, after this nice lunch. And um, my name is Olaf Weber. I'm a professor at uh, School of Environment, Enterprise and Development here at Waterloo. And I'm the moderator of this uh, panel about net zero communities. And so we have uh, uh, five panel. Uh, panelists here, um, four of them at the table. I will introdu introduce them shortly when, th when they transition to, to the stage here. So I will start with uh, Tova Davidson. Uh, she is the Executive uh, Director of Sustainable Waterloo Region, um, an organization that works with businesses to, uh, to address climate change and other sustainability aspects uh, in the region. And uh, she will kind of present an introduction about, uh, about net zero business. And I'm um, looking forward to yeah, your presentation. Hi, everyone. I know that being the um, panel right after lunch can be tricky. So thank you for sticking around. And hopefully, I will keep you awake over the next 15 minutes while I give you some background. Um, so I'm going to give you a really high level understanding of what do we mean as net zero business. And uh, I first want to start with like, who is Sustainable Waterloo Region? What is this organization that I represent? So SWR is a social enterprise nonprofit and we work at the levels of organizational sustainability and community level sustainability. And that work is always to consider climate change mitigation with a kind of baby toe into adaptation, but primarily mitigation. The areas we work in are um, energy conservation, and that includes energy waste and water, so natural gas, electricity, fuel, all that kind of thing. We also work in um, mobility, so fleets, electrification, active and mobile transportation, employee commuting practices. And then finally, we work in green buildings, and I'm gonna touch on each of these as we go through. Um, and we are um, more, not the experts in the room, we are the connector of the community and a vision setter. So often when we need really deep expertise, we actually go out to engineers and all that sort of thing to talk to them about what do they need. Go to researchers to say what are the places that we need to move further. Go to experts in energy. Instead, the work that we do is to understand where we need to go, what are the issues that we're facing, and then to start to bring people together to make the kind of change we need to make. Okay? Yes? Good, I got one thumbs up. Awesome, thank you. All right, I wanna start with some very basic understanding. Some of you will know all this stuff already and that's okay, but I wanna make sure we're all starting from a similar place and an understanding of how organizations, businesses think about this. So one of the first things I have to talk to them about is, well, like what is carbon, what is carbon accounting and how does this work? So there are three scopes of carbon when you're doing carbon accounting. Is this something, who does carbon accounting or has ever thought about carbon accounting? Okay, well, I'm really glad I'm doing this because I'm like, okay, there are three scopes. This all came from the Kyoto Protocol, and this is the internationally accepted way of how we account for the carbon emissions in an organization or in a community. So scope one is anything that you actually burn yourself. Think natural gas, gasoline, fuel oil, propane, wood, that kind of thing. That's all scope one, and that means it's fully owned by you. You control what fuel you're using, you control how much you're using, and that fuel has an emission factor, which I'll talk about in a second. So that's scope one, fully yours. Scope two is something that's burned on your behalf, but you choose fully how much you use. Normally, that's electricity. 
So think about it, Ontario Power Generation generates our electricity, but we control how much we use. Okay, scope two, and in all accounting frameworks, scope one and scope two are required. If anyone says that they're doing net zero or setting targets or science-based targets or any of that kind of stuff and they're not including at very least scope one and scope two, you need to call them out on that because that's totally wrong. Okay, those are the two. Scope three then moves even further away from you, but it's all of your like value chain or supply chain, even your inputs, outputs, all the other pieces of your operations. And those are the emissions generated someone else, somewhere else. But remember that those are someone else's scope one emissions. I've got an example to make it easier. For example, if you have an employee and you send them on a flight, it's the scope one emission of the airline because they fly the plane, choose how well it's maintained, what is the route, all that kind of stuff. But it's your scope three mission because you bought the ticket. Does that make sense to everyone? Great, I know you all know because you do carbon accounting. Does that make sense to everyone? Great, okay, so this is an important thing to remember when we're talking about what does net zero mean. The second thing is emission factors. And what this tells you is how much greenhouse gas, CO2E, carbon equivalent, comes from the amount of energy you're using. So I used a gigajoule of energy in this table. And what it shows you is that if you had a gigajoule of energy in Ontario from electricity, it's a tenth of the greenhouse gas impact of the same gigajoule of energy from natural gas or gasoline or a fossil fuel. So when people are talking about fuel switching and all that kind of stuff, energy efficiency, and everyone's like, oh, we need to solve greenhouse gases, let's reduce our electricity. There are many reasons why that matters, but it doesn't have a direct impact on greenhouse gases as much as if you reduced your natural gas, gasoline, fuel oil, et cetera. Does that all make sense? If you were in another district, if you were in Alberta, this graph would look very different because they still use coal to generate electricity. But the Ontario government in 2014, 13, took coal offline. So we don't have any coal in our generation, a little bit of natural gas, which is what creates this. The rest is nuclear, hydro, as well as some renewables. That's the bulk of where it comes from, okay? So this is gonna be important when you think about what does net zero mean. Good? Make sense? Awesome. Okay. Now, what does net zero mean? So we hear all the time organizations saying, oh, we've made a net zero commitment, or community saying we're a net zero community. What does that mean? On the very, very basics, what it means is that for every ton of carbon that they produce, they offset that carbon. Does anyone know what an offset is? Oh, okay, an offset, really glad, I'm glad I did this part. An offset is a way that you pay somebody to do something to deal with the carbon you've emitted. It could be planting trees, which takes a long time to pull that out of the air. It could be investing in renewable systems, bullfrog power, anyone know bullfrog power? That's an offset, that's the idea. So you are offsetting the carbon that you have already generated to put it back into the grid clean energy. Okay, so when someone says we are committed to being carbon neutral, it doesn't actually mean they're reducing their impact on the environment. It means they're paying someone else to make up for what they're doing. Does that make sense? Fantastic. The most important thing that you need to do though is think about the steps towards getting to net zero. It's not just measure we are a thousand tons and we're gonna buy offsets for a thousand tons. To me, that is very greenwashy and bad. Like, don't do that, that's bad. Instead, there's this pathway that I, I stole this graphic. I think it's fantastic, but I stole it. The idea here is that you start with understanding what your footprint is, as well as your climate risk exposure. This is a big deal in the organizational world, this exposure. And the requirement to report on climate risk exposure is something you deal with all the time, right, Olaf? Yeah. Um, so you understand what your footprint is now. The next step, and I think a very important one, is to actually make sure that your corporate level um, strategy and your executive sponsorship understands and buys in to this mission to reduce it. If that doesn't happen, all the other stuff is very, very difficult to make happen. So you have to make this integrated into your organization. Now, we don't have a number on this one, but see that lady walking down the stairs? I like her, she's my favorite, because she is coming down the stairs, reducing the emissions that they produce in the first place. 
This is really important, and they don't actually indicate this specifically in this graphic, but if I could put a number on them, like one, 3A and then 3B is the three that's there. The next step is understanding where your emissions come from and then reducing them. That's the most important thing. Energy efficiency is the key. We, as an environmental NGO, everyone thinks we're gonna come in and tell them to put up solar panels and convert their fleet to EVs. In fact, we're gonna come in and say, you should insulate your building and swap out your windows. You should change your processes to use less energy. That's where the magic happens and that's the foundation of everything. And then only then you get to number three, change to green energy, solar panels, all of that kind of thing. And number four is one that is near and dear to SWR's heart. Join a sustainability fo focused organization. You could put that at the beginning because we could help through this process. So why would businesses want to do this? There are typically five reasons. And um, Mr. Matthew Day, who you're going to hear from, used to work with us at SWR. And when an organization would say, we want to do this because it's the right thing to do, he forced them to dig further. Because usually there's some kind of business benefit that you're going to reap. And if you don't, then you're probably not going to keep these changes in the long run. So the five are reduced operating costs. Less energy means less operating costs, means less impact on the environment. That's easy, right? Everyone gets that one? Good. Number two is risk management, and this one is becoming increasingly more important. Risk management is both your actual climate exposed risk, but also reputational risk, regulatory risk, all of the risks that are facing you as an organization. So this is a really important one, and if you're trying to convince an organization to change, it's a big one, big lever to pull. The third is green branding, and if we go back here, oh, there, this footprinting and measurement should be woven through the whole process so that you're avoiding green washing and actually doing proper green branding. If you're actually reducing your impact and can calculate and show publicly how you're moving towards net zero by reduction of energy and therefore reduction of greenhouse gases, that's where the real magic happens. The fourth, and this is a big problem in Waterloo Region and I think across Canada right now, is employee retention and attraction. Um, it is very hard to re recruit people. There's something like 300,000 empty jobs in Ontario alone in the tech sector. It's insane. But people want to work places that are aligned with their values. And so this can be a central piece of how an organization is attracting and retaining great talent. And the last one, and I love this one, it's so cool, is increased innovation. And the reason that sustainability builds innovation in an organization is that you cannot do things status quo anymore. So if you're gonna change your energy systems, you actually end up looking at everything in an innovative mindset because you need to change how you do literally everything. Who do you recruit? How do you plan your travel? What are your policies? All of those things. So organizations actually become more innovative because they've committed to sustainability. Any questions on any of these? I know we're supposed to get to questions later, but any clarification? Great. I wanna give you three quick case studies of organizations that have gone to net zero. So the first is Veriform, and they are the poster child. Paul and Rona Rack are like the superstars of organizational sustainability. They are a steel fabricator located here in Cambridge. Um, about 15 years ago now, he committed to taking his business to net zero. And remember, steel fabricator. He actually accomplished it in, I believe, nine years. I'll show you, here's his graph. Um, he went from 262 tons to 60 tons in organic reductions. So this is, he actually changed his processes, his building, et cetera, to reduce the amount of tons he actually emits. And then he offsets that remaining 60. So this is where offsets can come into place. He needs high heat manufacturing, and therefore he can offset those 60, which he can't get rid of, but everything else he has managed to reduce. The beauty of this is that he actually did it while doubling his business, not laying off a single person, and he saved a million dollars doing it. Because he's more efficient, he's using less energy. It's a good business decision. And I have a really, my favorite story of his is he has a loading bay door and he couldn't get the people in the loading bay door who worked the loading bays to close the door. Everyone knows what I mean by a loading bay door, like those giant garage doors in a manufacturing plant. Everyone know what I mean? Good, he couldn't get his team to close the doors. And he tried giving them the data, sharing how much time, how much um, energy was being wasted, et cetera. Couldn't get them to close the doors. Eventually, he called an electrician and had them put a kill switch to the HVAC system on the door. So when the door is open, 
the heating turns off and they get cold and then they close the door. So it wasn't this high tech thing. He just made it so that it was uncomfortable for them and they shut the door. They open the door, they load everything in, they close the door, right? This is the kind of stuff we're looking for. Energy savings, not necessarily solar panels and air curtains. Two, oh, he told me five a second, a minute ago. Okay, I'll be fast. AET Group is another local company that's gone to net zero in their building and they took an 1880s farmhouse and retrofitted it to be full net zero. What they've managed to do as a consulting company is to embed sustainability really deeply into all of the work that they do um, in their own operations as well as with their customers. And if you haven't heard of them, you should go look. They've got a video on their website and what they did in their existing building. But what they've started to do is they looked at everything, all of their operations, and then made the changes and then installed the solar panels, just like we talked about. So this company has changed their own operations as well as a consulting company. So two very different examples. And finally, the Evolve One building. Has anyone heard of the Evolve One building? Yay! So the Evolve One building was actually envisioned by Sustainable Waterloo Region. It came out of our strat plan, and then we did the work to figure out what was the business case. Then we went out and asked who wanted to build this with us. And that's how we formed the partnership with the Cora Group and the RNT Park, et cetera. It is certified as Canada's very first net positive energy net zero carbon, multi-tenant office building. It's 110,000 square feet, and here's the data. This is the magic of the Evolve One building. Lots of buildings will say, oh, we're a sustainable building, but they don't publish the data. So over the four years that we've been reporting, it's been open for five, first year was commissioning. Over the four years we've been reporting the energy use in this building, it uses an average of 800 kilowatt hours, 800,000 kilowatt hours a year but it, use, it generates between 106 and 123% of the energy that it needs. So this building is actually net positive energy, but it was done using very um, accessible and known um, processes and systems. Instead of doing something that's really bleeding edge and the development industry would never replicate and wouldn't do again. The other last thing I'll say, and then I'm on my last slide, is that, um, this was done without any government funding because the cost to build this building was only between five and eight more, eight, five and eight percent more than building lead silver. And if you think about it, it generates all of the energy that it uses. So what does that mean? Any thoughts? There's no utility costs. The owner doesn't pay for heat and hydro. It costs him nothing to operate. So it costs him five or eight percent more but it, it actually it doesn't cost anything to run it. So one of the big things we talk about is life cycle costing and life cycle assessments for greenhouse gases. Okay, good. I think I went over, I'm sorry, and thank you so much for your time. Okay, so uh, the next speaker is uh, Mary Jane Patterson. Um, she is the ex executive director of uh, Reap Green Solution, um, uh, an organization that very much is very much connected to Seed as well. Bob Parker was a, is one of the main uh, uh, persons there as well. She will talk about uh, retrofitting homes to to net zero and the experience that uh, uh, Reap Green Solution has with that. With that. Push that button. The green one is the uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Olaf. Um, I now know that I'm going to be speaking to you about scope one and scope two emissions. So thank you, Tova. I learned from your presentation. So I'm going to say a uh, little bit about our experience at REAP in working with homeowners and that goal of net zero or just improving the energy efficiency of their home, what we're seeing, what we're learning, and how we're working to overcome the barriers to that. And I'll start with a little bit about REAP. Reap Green Solutions was created here at the University of Waterloo in the Faculty of Environment 25, 24 years ago. And uh, the professors who created Reap are still here. Well, mostly. Paul Parker just stepped down, Ian Rollins, Dan Scott, and the fourth founder was Don Eaton from the Alora Environment Center who provided the certified energy advisors to get the program going. Now we focus on climate change mitigation and adaptation. So we have really grown from our roots. The very beginning was home energy evaluations and the idea was 
academic research matched with practical action in the community. And I think we've grown in a lot of different ways to embody that goal. Um, we also co-lead the Climate Action Plan for Waterloo Region. And I just want to give a shout out to my colleague Tova Davidson in Sustainable Waterloo Region that we co-lead that plan with. Oh, it tells me my notes. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I want to say something about our mission because I remember when we created this together and it still has so much meaning to us. It's about acting now, it's about future generations. We believe by acting today we can leave our children a community that's more sustainable, resilient, vibrant and caring. So that is all about looking ahead in the work that we do. And I want to give you a sense of the experience we bring. I'm going to focus on the climate mitigation side and the energy evaluation and retrofit work that we do. Um, so in the 24 years that we've been doing this, we've been into 17,000 homes in Waterloo Region and surrounding area. 10,000 of those homeowners implemented some or all of our recommendations and came back to us for a follow-up evaluation to verify the results and probably to access an incentive also. And Collectively, they're reducing 28,000 tons every year of greenhouse gas emissions through their actions. And I want to say a little about the economic benefits because there are many. They spent about $56 million in local labor and materials to implement those retrofits. So that's great economic stimulus. That's energy dollars staying in our community. They received $19 million to implement those changes in incentives. So that helped them cover that capital cost. And about $7 million is saved every year as a result of their actions. A little bit of a reality check. We have been in a lot of homes, but let's look at what's called for in Transform WR and our calls to action. By 2050, we want homes and businesses to be off of fossil fuels and for heating and space and water. By 2030, in seven short years, our interim goal is 20% of the buildings in Waterloo Region are using low carbon um, or electric heat. So this is a big challenge. When you look at the number of homes, that's over 30,000 homes in seven years. This is something that keeps me awake at night. <laughs> So I want to talk about what the barriers are and what are the motivations for people that we see when people come to us at REAP. Uh, and some of them really correlate to what you were talking about, Toba. Incentives are a big motivator, and I'll say a little more about that. More and more now we're hearing how urgent climate change action is for people who come to us. They're acting because of the climate, and that is different from what we used to see. We really had to make an energy savings case before. People are motivated by what their family, friends, and neighbors are doing, and that gives us all power. So let's just remember that as we go about our daily lives, we have an influence on the people around us. And we are influenced by them. And sometimes it's just something going on in the house. The room over the garage is too cold, that kind of thing. The barriers, once they get started, the barriers that they encounter are the upfront capital cost, understanding what to do, knowledge, energy literacy. We're really seeing that now about heat pumps, a lot of questions and confusion around that. Um, and I'm going to lump the three last bullets together because they're all kind of uh, similar. Just having the capacity, the time, the ability, the knowledge to go through the complex kinds of things you might have to if you're negotiating with contractors, comparing quotes, trying to figure out which one comes first, getting them to work together, all of that. It's doing funny things here. All right. So a couple years ago, the federal government introduced the Greener Homes Program, which provides incentives for home energy upgrades. I'm going to say a little more about it, but I wanted to use it as a way to exemplify some of those challenges and um, motivations. So here are the 328 completed retrofits that have come out of that program so far through REAP. And I'll just recognize we're a subset of many renovations going on in the, in the community. And I put the upgrades that they chose to do in descending order just to give us a sense of what's going on. And I just want to look at that and say, what does this tell us? Well, first of all, the first three things on the list are clearly more accessible to people than the next ones. 
or more important or mo more motivating. Windows continue to be a way in the door for people. Heat pumps, first time in 24 years that we have seen one third of the retrofits put a heat pump in. And that's because this incentive program is the first one to provide incentives for heat pumps. We're seeing the government switch from an energy focus to a carbon focus here, or at least encompass carbon in its focus. And then wall insulation, pretty low, pretty low down, but almost a third were exterior insulation. We're seeing more of this now. People are finding a way. Too hard to do the inside. You got to move out or move all the stuff away from the wall, but now when they replace the siding, they're adding it to the outside. And this gives you an example of the difference we see when there are incentives like this. So uh, we just took two sample years. In 2019, there, was, there were incentives from Enbridge, but only for their customers. Leaves out the entire city of Kitchener, which is served by a locally owned natural gas utility, and people who heat with electricity, fuel oil, um, propane, wood. So you can see the difference in the number of evaluations and retrofits, and the difference is how many people it applied to and that they added incentives for heat pumps, which really broke it open for a lot of people looking to get off of fossil fuel. And now I just want to say a little bit about how we try to overcome those barriers that we observe. And I won't go into all these things, but I'll point out that we've been doing some neat work at REAP, I think, and I really want to give a shout out to the Residential Sector Committee that's part of Climate Action WR, because they've been doing excellent work on energy literacy, and pr particularly heat pump literacy. And we have a lot of these resources on our website, under blogs and under the resources capt caption of Home Energy 101. So contractors, different reflections from homeowners, that kind of thing. We also have a great resource called the Reap House for Sustainable Living that is a lead platinum retrofit of a century old home. You'll hear a lot of green homes in different cities. Most of them are new builds. It's pretty unusual to be able to retrofit one, but it's nothing new. It's all existing technology that we applied in that house. And we have open houses from time to time. I think my next slide is about one coming up. Yes, this Saturday for Earth Day. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Um, six homes are being opened, including the Reap House, to show people uh, near net zero retrofits. Um, some of them are already fully subscribed, but there's a couple that still had openings. So if you're interested, you can reach that through Instagram. Another stellar activity by the Residential Sector Committee at Climate Action WR. I want to say a little bit about some other ways we're trying to get around these barriers for homeowners. And one of them is to provide loans, to try to address that upfront capital cost, alternative ways of financing a home energy retrofit. Uh, in the last couple of years, we brought all the partners in this slide together with working meetings monthly over the course of a year to say, what would an alternative loan program look like for Waterloo Region? Should it be paid back through the property tax, which is what some cities are doing? It's quite a neat innovation through uh, utility payments, through a third party like a credit union. Cities across Canada are looking for ways that they can help to motivate homeowners to take these actions. And what we came up with was uh, repayment through electric utility bills. And that's partly thanks to the innovation, innovative spirit of our local electric utilities. So the next step will be the region of Waterloo applying for funding from the federal government to implement this program. And I just want to say a bit more about it. As you can see, it includes a financing kind of approach, but it's also going to be about the community engagement that helps draw people to this and how we can support people through that process. And, and one of them is the idea of an energy coach or a retrofit kind of coordinator to help people through the complexity of that process. Around it all, you see equity and low income, and that was very important for us. It's an important part of Transform. Everything we do to reduce emissions should also help to increase equity in our community. So we have a separate report for that that we've been sharing with municipalities across Canada about building equity into their loan programs. Um, and that's something we learned a lot from. A loan is a privilege that not everybody can afford. And there will be people who, despite how accessible we make this program, who may not be able to participate. 
And so we asked ourselves, what are we doing about those homes? And we realized we have a lot to learn. And so we started looking into the issue of energy poverty. And if you want a quick kind of study on that, go to energypoverty.ca. That is not us, that's a separate organization, but it's a very cool map of Canada by postal code that shows the percentage of people experiencing energy poverty in any postal code. What do we mean by energy poverty? Well, one definition would be anyone who pays more than twice what the average Canadian pays for their energy bills as a percentage of take home. And some people in Waterloo Region pay five times what the average Canadian pays as a percentage of their income. So that's a burden. That's a real burden on those households. We're just continuing to look into this and ask ourselves, how can an innovative community like ours tackle this challenge? So we're working on increasing energy literacy, loans and equity in loan programs, and raising awareness of energy poverty, something that I really haven't touched on much is policies at all levels of government, but they are very important. And one that I'll mention is that we need a national low income energy efficiency program in Canada and have been advocating for that with Efficiency Canada, which is leading the charge on that um, campaign. As Tova mentioned, the Ontario grid, another thing at the provincial level that we wanna pay attention to. And at the municipal level, this application from the region of Waterloo to the federal government is a way that a municipality is working to empower its residents to take action. That brings me back to where we need to think, and that is thinking ahead. And when I think about policies and government, I think about acting to the next election instead of acting way farther ahead. And so voting, getting involved in campaigns, and really urging our politicians to think much farther than the next election is a really important part of that. Thank you. How'd I do? It's okay. Amelia, I bequeath this to you. Thanks a lot. So next will be uh, Dr. Amelia Clark. She's a professor uh, and associate dean uh, research at the yeah, School of Environment, Enterprise and Development here. And she's leading a, a, a huge project on, uh, on, on how municipalities can get to net zero in, in the future. And I think you will talk about that. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ola. Great. So thanks to the two speakers before me who gave real examples of uh, action in this local community and what's, what's happening. I'm going to tell you more about research and more on the Canadian scale. So it's, it's different than what we've heard so far, but still very much in line with the sustainable communities, net zero communities uh, theme. So in particular, I'll start just briefly by talking about climate action in Canadian cities, put the context in what's happening federally. And then I'll get into telling you about this research project, which is a five-year research project to, to try and help local governments to achieve their net zero tr transitions. So let me go back one. Before I put this slide up, can I go back? Yes. How many people know, if I just say SDGs, how many people know what that is? Okay, more than half of you. Great. And if I say net zero by 2050, everyone in the room? Yes, almost. Great. Um, so this sustainable development goals, I start here because as we're talking about energy, as we're talking about climate, you can't think about them in isolation. They're very much linked to every single other sustainable development goal. So they're linked to the social sustainability goals, they're linked to the economic sustainability goals, and the other environmental ones as well. Now when we take the global goals and translate that to local, there actually is more than just the SDG that's on cities. You could actually take every single one of them and translate them to have a local element to them. So whether that's water or poverty or energy, et cetera. So every single one of them has a relevance to sustainable communities. Now I am gonna speak particularly about climate change and energy though. I'm not gonna take time to tell you about the importance of climate change. 
Um, we already heard earlier this morning around uh, net zero for 2050 and the commitments needed to keep us at 1.5 degree. But one thing that I want to emphasize, which is really my philosophy on this, is for every little bit that we can help mitigate, it will be less worse. So it's important to do whatever we can. And uh, Claudia, I'm, I'm with you on Walk the Talk. Personally, I've put in an air source heat pump in my own home and uh, one of my, car my cars outside. So it's really uh, about that, but it's, it's what we can each do, what our municipalities can do, what our federal government can do, et cetera. But every bit we do do makes a difference. And here's an image from the, the recent synthesis report from the IPCC. And it just makes that point of, you know, if, if we are to warm to 1.5 degrees, here's the implications for heating, for what's going to happen with precipitation, et cetera. What would happen at two degrees, what would happen at three degrees, and what would happen at four? So every bit that we can help mitigate that will help make it less worse. Now, in terms of Canada, we already heard this morning around Canada's commitment to net zero emissions by 2050. We also heard about the emissions reduction plan and the commitment to 40% below 2005 levels by 2030. Bringing that to the city scale, globally it's expected that about 60% of people will live in urban areas by 2030. Here in Canada, already 84% live in communities of 10,000 plus. So we're quite an urban population in Canada. And about 71 to 76% of greenhouse gas emissions originate from urban areas. But we also know that local governments can directly or indirectly influence about half of those emissions. So what happens at the local scale, what happens at the city scale, actually makes a big difference. In Canada, there's a lot of commitment happening by our local governments. Over 600 have declared a climate emergency, and increasingly municipalities are pledging to, uh, to reach a net zero goal by 2050. Um, and on top of that, they're responding by creating plans, like we heard from the last speakers around what's happening here in the Waterloo region. So creating community-wide plans, creating corporate plans to help address greenhouse gas emissions. This figure here is uh, showing municipalities across the country who've joined the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and ICLE Canada's PCP program, Partners for Climate Protection. So you see over time, the number of municipalities joining has gone up and up to now more than 500. Now where are the emissions coming from in cities? Well, the largest sources of emissions are from buildings and from transportation. By far, these are the two largest, if, when we look at the inventories of, of community-wide emissions, it's buildings and transportation. To a lesser extent, um, the emissions from our landfill, like the methane emissions, and then if we get into scope two, thank you Tova for introducing scope two, but sometimes scope one, sometimes scope two, but electricity comes into that. And now we're also starting to think about reductions. So what are the nature-based solutions to help sequester some of that? Uh, and so that allows for a bit more net zero. You can subtract some. You don't have to just look at what's going up into the atmosphere. If you compare that federally, and we actually saw this this morning too, but this is the one that came out last week. So the, the slides we saw this morning were the, the 2019 inventory. This is the, uh, the one that's just come out on 2021. And what this shows is where are our emissions um, federally. So across the country, our largest emissions are actually the oil and gas production. Not consumption, production. And compared to the slides we saw this morning, this one is actually going up in the last couple of years. Next, transportation. This one's actually going down. So this one, has, we're on the right trajectory, thanks in part to the pandemic, but also other things that have happened. Um, now, if you compare this to my local, transportation is here, waste 7%, buildings 13%, electricity 77%. And this is why what happens at the local scale feeds a lot of what happens at the national scale. So this is where my project comes in. This is a project called the Municipal Net Zero Action Research Partnership. It's a five-year action research partnership or project that uh, is co-led by my team here at the University of Waterloo, but also with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and ICLE Canada. It's funded in large part 
by the federal government through Environment and Climate Change Canada for $4 million, and then we have matching funds from other partners, both cash and in-kind, for another about $4.5 million, over five years. So we're aiming over the next five years with another 10 academic institutions, another 13 plus national organizations, and then um, another nine or so other national organizations, all part of this large partnership. We're aiming to support Canadian municipalities to monitor, measure, and achieve their greenhouse gas emission goals. We're aiming to help those municipalities with the reduction projects, policies, and programs to ensure they're aligned with the net zero trajectory. And we're doing this by studying and creating improved measurement, analysis, and monitoring systems for both municipal and community-wide GHG emissions. So I'm going to spend a bit of time on this slide, but what we've done is we've created five working groups, each of which are made up of academics, municipal partners, and national partners, and each of them which is running a different study. So the first, ah, there. first objective up here is the first working group. Um, this summer we're launching a national-wide survey to collect where are Canadian municipalities at now. So what are their current plans, what are their current targets, what are their current inventories, and what are their current actions? And with that, we're going to make an open access database that will be available through the Waterloo Climate Institute starting this fall so that we can benchmark what's, where, what's happening. We're planning to repeat that survey in year five of our study, so then we can see what's changed over time. But the plan of making the open access database is so that others can use it to benchmark or to do studies or to see maybe pull it up by sector, by province, by size of municipality, et cetera. The second working group is looking at improving the indicators being used to measure those, the greenhouse gas inventories at the local scale. So currently the PC Pre program has a software. Currently there are existing measures used by CDP cities, et cetera. But there's some newer thinking, including coming out of this university, on how can we be better measure nature-based solutions. Currently, most of those indicator sets don't have that in there at all. How can we better measure the transportation side? And so there's newer thinking of how can we use big data, what other indicators would better represent emissions at the local scale? Plus, we want to add some additional indicators around social equity and green economy. So when looked at side by side with GHG emissions, it enables better decision making. So that's going to lead to an up, a software update on the PCP tool which was then available for free to Canadian municipalities. Working group three, which is one of the ones I'm pretty excited about, is looking from a more of an accounting perspective. So it's getting into that carbon accounting, but not just on the inventories, but how we build it into budget decision making, how we're building it into the financial side and the disclosure side. So the disclosure to investors in municipalities. And so what we're doing here is, is working with some of the leading cities, particularly the big ones, Vancouver, Toronto, and Vancouver, but also some mid-sized ones that are getting into D TCFD disclosure and looking at how is that done. And from there, we're going to create guides to help other municipalities who want to start building in climate budgeting within their decision-making systems. The fourth one is thinking about collaborative governance and the community-wide emissions and how better to design the community-wide governance systems to help enable action community-wide. And then the last one is about mobilizing. So our last working group is, once we have our tools, we have our new software, then the plan is to pilot it with 250 Canadian municipalities in English and French and help mobilize these, this, um, and support them in their paths. So we've finished fiscal year one now. All the designs are happening, all the working groups are running. We're currently in the research stage, doing case studies, running the survey. So that's what's happening in the next year. Then in year three, we're making the guides, updating the software, and then year four and five are the pilots nationally. Year six is just wrap up. So in total, currently there are about 50 leaders across the country already engaged in the working groups. We'll be doing 50 case studies over the coming year, plus the surveys. 250 pilot cities in year four and five, ultimately aiming to train about 2,000 sustainability climate accounting practitioners within municipalities and engaging about 10,000 people nationally. 
So you can see we're trying to reach scale. We're trying to help tip the conversation in Canada and uh, support the champions who are already there, but maybe need more support and more skills and more tools to help them get there. So I'll end there. I got five minutes left. I can keep talking. <laughs> um, but we do have a website, and uh, I'm really happy to, to go into more detail on this. But it's a research project, and we're, but we've made it an applied research project. And because there are probably some academics in the room, I'll just go on a little bit more about how we co-designed this. So the University of Waterloo professors co-designed it with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, with ICLE Canada, to go, okay, where are the barriers? What, what intervention could we do to help take this further? And how could research help? And through that, yes, we're gonna make these tools, but then how can we pilot them and learn from people's experience and make the tools even better? So building in another layer of research at that. And I'll also add that we're really bringing um, an equity, diversity, and inclusion lens, both to the community-wide working group four, but also to our knowledge mobilization. How do we make sure that this is accessible and that we're thinking through social equity indicators alongside GHG emission ones so that better decision making can be made? So it's only because you gave me extra time of going on, but uh, really, um, this is coming out of the University of Waterloo as our lead and involving many other universities across the country. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Thanks a lot, Amelia. So uh, next is uh, Mohamed Haraji. Um, please come to, to the stage. And him, he's an associate professor and director of architectural engineering here at the uh, University of Waterloo and has contributed to international landmark projects that range from Chicago decarbonization plan to the world's tallest building in the world uh, that is uh, net positive. So I'm really <laughs> interested to hear about that. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, your presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay, very good. Thank you. So uh, I'm. Okay, I don't see it in front of me. That's fine. Okay, I'll take it from here. So I'm today here to talk to you about three main aspects. One, the introduction on the topic from a net zero community. Uh, perspective and here I have two case studies that I'd like to bring a 103 energy positive project that we did uh, about 10 years ago and uh, another case study which is the Chicago decarbonization plan that I was involved in as part of the uh, parametric model analysis and you know work for the city in that uh, period and uh, the third element is really looking at the research initiatives that I'm taking with my team in Waterloo to go over some of the building systems that could help uh, mitigate uh, carbon in buildings. Um, I'd like to start with uh, uh, a study that was established in the past uh, by Atkins uh, UK Aid Department and uh, uh, UCL University, where they studied 20, uh, in 20 countries, 129 cities, and they came across three main aspects that are considered difficult according to, uh, to, to cities' uh, processes. And these relate to energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, two climate risks, and three resources and ecosystems risks. And you know, my focus since I have read this study 10 years ago, that you know, how can I do, or what can I do to help you know, mitigate uh, work that could be negatively affecting our environment based on these three principles. And, uh, you know, in that report that they have done, they established five different typologies of uh, uh, cities that relate to either a city could be energy intensive or it could be climate hazard, it has climate hazards or it has regional systems uh, being at risk, or it could be the three of these, or they can also be, uh, there will be like some cities that have low uh, current risks. So for that, you know, my observation back then was, you know, if we have a place where we are doing or we're introducing a new development, there are two approaches to, uh, to think about it. So there is the standard development where we're looking at use and discard design. And then here we are bringing lots of uh, resources from outside and we're using minimal 
on-site resources from the city. And then, of course, we have a high contribution in terms of carbon into the atmosphere. And then, uh, uh, you know, the equity component is also one aspect that we would look at as to how we are involving current communities into the development. Whereas if we are looking at the high performance development, how this would turn into a, an absorb, reduce, generate, and reuse kind of uh, 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 development where we are using imported resources and on-site resources in a balanced form. So for that, I started to look at you know, some metrics back at that time. And one of the things, just go back. Okay, here we go. So one of the things that I noted back then was if you are commuting to work, how much you put carbon in the air. And according to the uh, city of Chicago, you know, on average, again, you're putting about 17,000 kilowatt hours per year for this uh, resource. And the fact that, you know, if you were to do a walk to the work, how much you would then contribute based on that average and that location that we studied. And we end up seeing about this much, which is 5,000 kilowatt hours, uh, and this is a big reduction. So for that, we have to consider these factors in our work. So the first thing I started to look as well at is, you know, how do we do carbon analysis in buildings? So there are like mainly five topics that you have to engage with. So some, uh, the first one is on scoping, so team engagement and assessment. Second, on the baseline, so looking at the embodied carbon aspects of the building structure and materials, plus the operational aspect, which is related to, uh, uh, you know, lighting, uh, HVAC systems, and any uh, plug loads that you use. And then look at how or what are the opportunities for reduction, so key performance indicators and targets that we have to achieve, something similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Clark was uh, referring to earlier, but at the building scale in this case. And then after that, we look at the, climate, the carbon action plan, which, you know, looking at the quick wins that we can implement as part of the analysis for the buildings. And finally, how do we keep track and monitor uh, the work? So, if we have a building, then you know, we look at two aspects for it. One is the embodied carbon, and two is the operational carbon. And in operation, we also look at what is the consumption and what is the production that we can put if we're integrating renewable energy in the building. So for that, you know, we do uh, always analysis based on a life cycle. And you know, for this, you will have to think of that in the context of your harnessing, your you're harnessing with the environment as opposed to being, you know, defying it as you uh, do the work. So going to the IPCC, which is everyone is talking about uh, in terms of the context here, for buildings, the way how I see it is we have a 1.5 degrees Celsius cap that we can't exceed, and there, there should be an inflection by 2050. 2050 target should, you know, let us start to go negative in terms of uh, the increase in temperature. And for that, if I look at the carbon, uh, let's say consumption, or not consumption, the, ca the carbon uh, uh, we're putting in the air, we have to burn 550 gigatons of carbon. And buildings represent about 230 giga gigatons of carbon until that time. So this is now my area. How can I, or what can I do in order to this become, you know, meeting that target? Uh, moving forward. Looking at a building life cycle, if we're taking 100 years as a life cycle, usually the ratio between embodied to operational goes into a 20% embodied and 80% operational. And after 14.5 years, operations start to pick up and it becomes more than uh, embodied. So in this building, what we did, we changed that because it was an energy positive building. It produces energy more than consumes on annual basis. So, and for this, we were able to see a shift in terms of that ratio, which is 62 to 38%. Now, that is the building, and it is uh, designed based on the fact that we have a trellis shading the building in a hot climate. Not necessarily relevant to here, but principles are very similar because we use passive strategies, whether it's in hot climates or cold climates, we should consider this as a first principle. But in this context, we're putting a shading device that is protecting the building from uh, rough sun, and at the same time, we're trying to uh, put some uh, systems that could make a difference in terms of operation. So then in this case, there are three tiers we look into. The first tier is 
the basic design, so how he can maximize heat retention in terms of cold climate or minimize, or, or I should say, you know, avoid heat in, in, in hot climates, and then looking at facade orientation and massing and, uh, and, and uh, planning for, for the building uh, based on the surface area to volume ratio. The second tier is to look at passive systems as a first principle before going into the element of active systems related to lighting and HVAC. So for this, in that particular project, we have to start to think of a buffer under the trellis that could even, you know, go far with how much we can reduce uh, cooling loads in that hot climate. And at the same time, we looked at integrating um, uh, uh, what we call wind cones, where it can allow wind to move vertically through stack effect ventilation to allow to cool the building. So we had 11 wind cones as part of the iconic design for this project. This is the section. It is a comprehensive section that shows uh, how uh, multiple elements are put together as part of the environment we are creating there. And at the same time, it has this element of beauty to the project. I don't have all the renders here, but you know, it was uh, one of the uh, very interesting projects design that we had. Uh, my role was, of course, you know, as part of the sustainability management is to look at the CFD computation flow dynamics analysis in the project, looking at the structural analysis, daylighting analysis, thermal analysis, acoustics, and many other elements, especially count, uh, carbon accounting, to see how we can reduce the carbon footprint in terms of operational and materials use. So, that is the uh, summary of the project uh, as an outcome. So we have multiple uh, strategies to get us to the positive energy, and it was 3% above. This is a huge building. It's 1.1, 1.6 million square foot building. So in metric, it's about 110,000 uh, meters square. So it's a huge, huge building. Um, and one of the learning outcomes that I would like, like to share here, for example, uh, as, as a pick, picking lesson from, uh, from this, is the trellis, for instance, you always have, have seen applications based on a particular tilt in a particular latitude and or location. And, you know, in this case, we are looking at how we can maximize the use of panels on the roof, but at the same time, eliminate the shading that could come from that uh, uh, if, if we have to create uh, uh, different tilts. So then what we end up doing is increase in tilt causes increased sh row shading between, the, between the, uh, the panels. So this is reducing the output. Also decreasing in the tilt allows more P PV or you know, solar panels uh, surface so we can have more PV panels. But this allows, while it allows for increase in output, it has lower efficiency because the tilt is lower. So at the end of the day, we end up doing something very unique and probably I haven't seen up till then any application like this to allow for maximizing uh, the shading or sorry, the renewable energy generation from these panels. And that is basically looking at two tilts in one location to maximize the PV application in that. That's just one quick uh, note. Of course, you go through the life cycle of the building. You have to think of the operation, of the maintenance, in terms of uh, how is this displaying in carbon, but also there's a huge capital cost and then there is like a replacement at the end of the life when we think uh, uh, of, of any building, not just that. One aspect I initiated at that time for this particular building is how do we benchmark this against you know, key performance indicators related to projects out there. So I started uh, a case study uh, list that has different projects with different or you know, similar uh, scale and looking at the, uh, let's say, energy use intensity and energy savings in each of them and, you know, listing in my database what are the strategies that they have used. So in order for you to do well, you have to look at what others have done, obviously, and try to, you know, go beyond what has been established already or learn from it at least. So some, some literature there is important. Because it's an energy positive building, after 14 years of its operation, it will come to carbon neutrality and that was a big win for, for this project. Now, one of the aspects about the project is to look at materials application and you know, looking at the research uh, behind that to specify some materials. So there are two learning outcomes. One is how do we increase the recycled content and recyclability of the materials we're specifying, that's important. Look at the life cycle analysis of the project uh, materials and as well look at the low carbon supply chain. So, these are the elements we have 
for, uh, for, for that project, and this also translates into the total number of carbon that we have from fit out, from building envelope and site enabling uh, and structure. Moving forward, I'll probably like skip this part because there is some uh, redundancy to take to, the, to take you to the next, uh, uh, let's say, case study, which is the Chicago decarbonization plan. In this plan, we looked at uh, the context, and that is basically in the heart of Chicago, so it's the central loop, uh, and there is like some crop material here, but I can explain it to you. So what you see here is 1% of the buildings is new, 9% of, the, uh, of these buildings uh, or the old buildings are contributing 9% uh, uh, of the carbon loads. So this means it's a huge footprint for minimal number of projects. And then we have to meet climate action plan with 80% uh, reduction. And majority of the buildings go to before 1975. So how do we you know, work with this challenge? We did it through studying multiple elements related to waste, mobility, buildings, energy, uh, and urban integration uh, as part of the urban matrix analysis in the city. Uh, the reduction went from 15.1 million metric tons to 3.12 million metric tons, which is 80% reduction goal. In order to do this, we had, as I said, to go through many topics and do research about them, but one of the aspects we did as well is creating a parametric model to allow us to project what would be the performance of buildings if we retrofit them or if we create different programs in them. So instead of having all offices, it was about 90% of the building's offices, if we can reduce this percentage to, to lower uh, percentage and allow for more residential to allow for better integration in terms of uh, uh, residential and mixed use. So. These are some of the outcomes related to energy, related to waste, uh, water, uh, mobility, and urban metrics and buildings. And this is the parametric model that we, what, that we developed to predict the performance in this context. One example here that I can share with you is when you look at the city and we look at the building envelopes in particular as one item they represent about 20% of the carbon load, and this can go from 15% to 25, to 35, or to, sorry, to 30%, depending on how bad the envelope is. And, you know, we, what we did is we looked at the energy code of the city and what was bad applied and what is better than the code, and we started to preach for these projects to become, uh, or to these materials or applications to become part of these specifications. Um, and then we identified 83 buildings in the city, in this particular location, to talk to, the, uh, uh, to their owners or uh, people involved in decision making about them so we can start to retrofit and work with the city with that. One element I can also talk about, and probably I will end uh, with, with a couple of slides after this, is the urban matrix analysis that we did for this uh, uh, project. And as I said, this is by looking at the office to be set, you know, 80% 80, 80 close to 80%, and then how we can increase the residential component to allow for less commute to the city, and therefore less emissions. So we looked at integrating schools, because there are no schools in the area. By having one school, so this will increase the residential component in 10%, and that has saved some uh, carbon. And then we looked at 25%, Again, diversifying and retrofitting buildings and changing their functions. Then we looked at the 40% scale and then the 50% uh, balance. And this was choose to be like the one that would, would be most effective and reduce the carbon emissions by about 27% uh, in terms of the carbon load. In terms of research, I will probably leave it at this uh, slide, although I have some details, but because of the time. Uh, I do work in my lab on uh, topics related to energy systems, building science, urban modeling, and sustainable materials. And this is more or less the fields that I contributed to so far in research. So from the decarbonization, which is under urban performance, to renewable energy, to parametric design, materials, envelope, and data visualization, and air. Uh, one of the projects that we recently, uh, I recently received uh, is uh, on um, uh, on how we can audit buildings through uh, air uh, flying objects such as drones. And that is uh, one method to reduce 
the risk of reaching certain areas that are unreachable in terms of analysis and at the same time being able to uh, uh, do a better job in terms of, of the analysis. So we looked at how we integrate hyperspectral imaging and image processing in general as part of the drones analysis and as well looking at multiple ways of uh, 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 reducing the time it takes to do auditing in general in building envelopes for thermal heat transfer and for other aspects related to uh, uh, thermal resistance. So thank you very much. So um, last but not least, we have Matthew Day, and he's the uh, uh, Community Energy Program Manager of Waterloo Region Com Community Energy, and uh, he will let us know how we, the region can um, transition to a low-carbon region. Yeah, thanks a lot. We'll talk, uh, take a lot of what we learned about the energy transition today. We'll bring it back uh, to Waterloo Region. Um, I'm glad that I'm following uh, this morning session, which talked a lot about the energy transition with uh, technologies. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the energy transition as it pertains to... Oh, now I get why people are having such a tough time with this. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Um, uh, energy transition as it pertains to uh, how cities are built, uh, energy transition and the economy at large. Uh, and then a little bit of how it changes our, uh, our society. Uh, first of all, um, ooh, um, does anybody know who Frederick Soddy is? Because if we do and we know all of his work, I'm kind of done here. Um, he's brilliant, not only because he won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, but because he left Oxford and then came to study and teach in Canada. Only smart people do that, I think, right? Although, and then he went back to Oxford and then he won the Nobel Prize, whatever. But his point is that the flow of energy should be the primary concern of economics. And absolutely it should. And I love this quote, um, but nobody knows who he is. Um, but this is an even better quote. Does anybody know who Vaclav Smil is? Oh, I was hoping I might get somebody. Um, the University of Waterloo brought him uh, to speak uh, in Waterloo Region about five years ago. Um, He's one of my favorites, and I thank Bill Gates for that. This is also Bill Gates' favorite author. I hadn't heard of him until B Bill Gates' book club. Now I read all of his books, and he's, he's outstanding. But uh, this quote summarizes it even better than Frederick Soddy. To talk about energy and the economy is a tautology. Tautology is like a fancy uh, university word that means sort of synonyms. So every economic activity is fundamentally nothing but a conversion of one energy source to another. And monies are just a convenient proxy uh, to valuing energy flows. So the other guy, Frederick Soddy, he argued against the gold standard uh, well before the gold standard was actually eliminated. Uh, and Vaclav Smil is saying something very similar. If we really wanted a good exchange of value properly, we would just exchange jewels all the time. But there's no such thing as an easy, clean way to exchange energy. That's why we have, uh, that's why we have dollars. Okay. Um, so those are um, engineering people talking about economics. This is a slide about economics, talking about energy. Uh, in 1993, a really influential economist, William Nordhaus, wanted to judge inflation over all of the history of humanity. And he looked at a variety of different ways to measure this inflation, um, transportation and cost of food and whatever. Eventually, he settled on a unit of light. So if you took a regular light bulb, and had that uh, just for one hour, how many uh, hours would you need to work to get one hour of light bulb, right? So if you worked 60 hours a week, how, much, how many hours of light bulb would you get, essentially? Uh, 20,000 BC, when our only source of light was, was fire, I would take 60 hours of just labor to get a half an hour of light bulb light. And then it stayed like that for a very long time. There were other sources of light. There was oil. Um, but that was just as expensive as fire light was. A big, big deal happened around 1750. We began to discover oil, uh, especially whale oil. Um, and we started getting two hours of light after 60, 60 labor hours. Um, and then we learned what candles were. Uh, and then gas lighting, and then you can see the progress from there. 
this article was published in 1993, that's why it stops with the CFL light bulb, but if you had LED, it goes up to, you know, just an infinite <laughs> number nearly. So uh, it's really cheap to get light now. It used to not be the case. Uh, huge social implications, which we'll touch on very briefly, very momentarily. But this is just a practical way to look at the energy transition. Another way to think of it is we've gone through several energy transitions. We're now going through another one. This one's more based on clean energy, taking the environment into, into consideration. And um, that's what we'll spend the rest of our time talking about. Okay, so um, this is what the energy transition has looked like in Waterloo over the last 200 years. It used to be the case that all of our energy systems were local, so we would move to where the energy is. Uh, this is an example, this is the, uh, the herb grist mill, about a kilometer from here. Farmers would grow, take their wheat, they would march to what's now essentially uh, uptown Waterloo. They would wait, they would use local energy, it would create value, in this case into flour, and then they would march it back. So you, you go to this central area where the energy is, it creates value. It's wonderful. About 50 years after that, we learned how to take energy to where we needed to go. So we learned how to move energy through the rails, through coal, and that allowed our community and the rest of the world to industrialize. So here's some industrial, industrial plants. And this began the process of, of urbanization. Then we learned, well, instead of bringing the energy to where we want to go and then making large changes, we can bring energy to exactly where we need to go. So we have the energy grid, the electricity grid and the natural gas grid. We got that in Waterloo Region in about uh, 1912, 1914 or so. Uh, Kitchener was one of the first municipalities to get uh, electricity from, from Niagara Falls, so that was a big deal. Um, and then we learned about petrol. And then we started um, you know, getting into cars and driving around, it led to suburbanization. And that led to, in many ways, the exact climate challenge that we have right now that we're trying to resolve. So now we're learning how to electrify or decarbonize our, our transportations. So that's it in a nutshell uh, for Waterloo Region. But how has that affected our society? So if we take these same energy transitions, we would look at how we have applied that technology and how it has changed our world, or in this case, changed our city. Uh, it might look like something like this. So once oil uh, became a little bit more affordable, um, we could light our streets with it. This led to the reduction in crime. This led to nightlife, actually. Before then, we didn't have anywhere to go or any reason to, to go out at night. Uh, it also led to a lot of safety. Uh, before street lighting, um, taxis were the people who would come with you and they would have you know, big like, weapons on their shoulder to make sure you get from one spot to another spot. But now all of a sudden with light, you can see who is, who's around the corner. It's not quite as scary. Once we started using uh, coal more effectively, then we could get our temperatures up to 2,500 degrees, more than enough to melt steel. And that really changed the architecture in our city. We got to build nice, beautiful bridges like this. We could build as high as we wanted to. Now, we didn't because nobody wanted to walk up 50 stories, but we had, we had that technology to. But that, again, led to more densification of our cities that allowed us to, to urbanize. And then petroleum came around, and then that led to the uh, suburbanization. But then electricity came back. By the way, uh, we've had cars in our community much longer than we've had uh, electricity. But electricity changed a lot of stuff for a lot of reasons. So now we could take uh, the, these technologies, the steel, and then we could build tall buildings in a convenient way. We had electricity, so we could pump water up to the top. We had um, elevators, and that led to the, the tall buildings that, that we have now, and the skyscrapers. Um, but also, as we saw two slides earlier, that it allowed for cheap light, um, and then education and equality, uh, so the, the social change of, of the energy transitions have been, uh, been very significant. Right? As we've mentioned a few times, uh, we're now more aware of the environmental impacts, and in this case specifically climate change impacts of our energy. So our new energy transition will be about local, clean, and, and equitable energy sources. So far so good? All right. Um, 
Another easy way to think about energy transitions is to look at the NHL. Um, so this follows all of the uh, energy transitions that I just mentioned, in this case, uh, um, through the Canadian economy. So we started with, with coal, which we'll, we'll, we'll represent that through, you know, Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, whale oil, that was a big deal. Also, by the way, I think whale oil might be the first uh, area where the environment and energy really started butting heads. Um, we stopped, uh, we started hunting whales because they were everywhere, essentially. We didn't need fancy technologies to get them. Eventually, we started depopulating oil. Then we needed to create new technologies to get that oil again. We had uh, combustible, what are, what are those called when you kill whales, you know? Harpoons. Thank you. Um, uh, Gunpowder and harpoons. But then, you know, there, there are no whales anymore. And then Herbin Melville wrote a book about this, Moby Dick. You, you needed whales and you, you went crazy because of it. There wasn't any more, so then we stopped hunting whales for oil. The population is back. We still need to monitor them. Anyway, maybe the first major intersection between environmental challenges and energy. Um, of course, the Edmonton Oilers with this weird logo. And I, you have to wonder whether if the Edmonton Oilers were forming a team right now, whether they would make oil look so much like water and tailing ponds. I don't know. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the lightning we began to look at electricity. And then the future might very well be with, uh, in, in the stars with, with solar energy. Okay, that's the energy transition. Um, what are we doing about it locally? Uh, 2018, uh, all of the councils in Waterloo Region uh, passed what we call the Community Energy Investment Strategy. This is a partnership with the three cities, the region of Waterloo, and then five, now four utilities. And the idea is that we should steer the energy transition together, make sure we're working together. Um, Milford was talking about uh, breaking silos. This is us trying to break silos as a community. Uh, so right now we spend $2.1 billion a year on energy in our community. In and of itself, that's fine. If that's what energy costs, that's what it costs. Energy and the economy is the same thing, no problem. But there's two major problems with, with this number. Number one is that 87% of the money that we spend on energy leaves our community. So that's a huge economic loss. And then number two, 47% of that energy is actually just pollution. It's urban heat island effect. It's powering cars that are 2,000 tons to move you know, 100 kilograms of people. Uh, it's just, 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 a, just really wasteful. So we're trying to fix that. Um, so we took this energy strategy um, as with all strategies, truthfully, you, you develop them, they get past council, they fund them. Five minutes, oh God, I gotta, I'm gonna bust a move. Um, and then we broke it right down. And then we broke it down, now we're trying, to, we're trying to build it up again. So term one was looking at what are the collaborative opportunities, let's set some visions. Term two, what we just started, uh, now we're gonna look at developing a proper heating strategy. Right now, I would say Waterloo Region is middle of the pack in Ontario when it comes to the energy transition, but I think we can be leaders once we implement a few very key policies. So what are those policies? Um, uh, it needs to be around heat, we need to decarbonize heat. To do that, we broke out our heat into, um, well, so we broke out our energy into um, different grades. So electricity isn't going anywhere soon, we love electricity, we wish we had more of it, we don't, it's a reality, that's fine. But in terms of natural gas, if we separate, separate high-grade natural gas, so natural gas burns at 2,000 degrees, you need about 1,500 degrees to melt steel. Um, for the foreseeable future, we will need natural gas to fund our industry, to build stuff. But the rest of the natural gas, you know, 39% of our total energy, we're burning 2,000 degrees so we can get cool, uh, heating temperatures of 20 degrees. That is not the best use of uh, the highest best use of this energy source. So if you take this low-grade heat, which could be decarbonized in a variety of ways, and you bench that with uh, the greenhouse gas emissions that our friends at Climate Action WR put together, low-grade heat accounts for roughly 20% of our GHG emissions, which I think is, well, if you look at it in, in another way, that's the second largest 
uh, source of energy-based GHG emissions. Transportation is, is number one. We are putting a lot of resources into decarbonizing transportation, as we absolutely should be. It is our biggest source of GHGs. Uh, Low-grade thermal heat is the next largest. So that's what we're trying to tackle. Now, we want to do this in, uh, in three pillars. Uh, we believe the energy transition is going to move forward with these three fundamental elements. Right now, you can think of them as separately, but if we're going to get any results, we need to think of them as all coming together. So from a WR community energy perspective, we're looking at these three pillars, markets, policy, and infrastructure, and over the next four years, we have priority items in each of these pillars. So from a market point of view, we need to build some net zero communities. Now, Waterloo Region is not gonna develop uh, net zero communities ourselves. But what we can do is look at integrated policies and energy sources and geothermal that Stan was talking about earlier. And we can ideally create conditions that will attract somebody like S2E to our community and say, hey, this community is taking this personally. The utilities are involved. The region is involved. The city is involved. We have these energy sources. We're looking at building our infrastructure. Hey, this might be a good place to invest in a net zero community. Number two, we have to up our policy game. Uh, in particular, we're focused on green development standards right now. Uh, that might be obvious. I don't have time to talk about it anymore anyway. And third is we need to start looking at low-grade heat infrastructure. This could be things like district energy. Uh, it could be heat sharing. Uh, it could be a few other things. But we need to look at this low-grade heat across our entire community, across all of our objectives, including equity, um, including affordability, uh, um, and, and make sure that they all play nice together. So that's my time. Thank you very much. So the next panel is going to fo focus on specifically, which we have, been talk we have been talking about all through the day, about uh, sustainable transportation, clean transportation issues, including electric vehicles, uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 e-planes. So we, we have uh, four, uh, four panelists which are here present. One, uh, Paul Parker is going to be uh, delivering his uh, presentation from Australia, correct? Uh, uh, online, virtual, because part of the, well, the event is also virtual, so we have quite a few people, uh, well, a few people uh, online as well. So let me, let me start with the introduction of the first panelist. Uh, we have Clarn uh, Woods, Woodsma, hopefully I didn't, uh, but butcher your name, is currently director of the University of Waterloo School of Planning. He has broad research and teaching experience in transportation policy and planning issues. He has previously published on subjects including climate change policy and freight impacts, land valuation in transport, urban freight planning, freight emissions forecasting, distribution center location analysis, and freight sprawl, an expert in transportation issues. Clarence has served as an on a number of industry and government advisory committees over the past 20 years, and is currently serving at the ACUPP executive. He has degrees uh, from McMaster, PhD, and Wilfrid Laurie, MA, and Laurentian uh, uh, Honors Bachelor of Arts. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, and my apologies for that bio, because <laughs> my current boss, who is the director of the School of Planning, would object to the fact that I was still identified as director of the School of Planning, which I am not. So, anyway. Um, if I could have my presentation. Oh, the, the green pair? That's, no, it's still on me. Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. I'm blaming them. All right. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today, and uh, I'm going to act as a role in this session in particular because, you know, I didn't have anything specifically net zero to talk about in terms of my own research. I'm kind of setting the stage, so I want to give you some things to think about when we're thinking about sustainable transportation. So the reference to people, obviously, moving people, moving products, and then the question is promise or peril. So where have we been, where are we going in terms of our efforts to achieve net zero as it relates to sustainable transportation. Um, just to make sure that, you know, I do have some context for this. I've been in this work since the 90s. 
Uh, so I go back to the original Kyoto efforts to reduce emissions, done some work on climate adaptation, et cetera. Um, so I have a, that's the lens that I'm bringing to my presentation today. So again, a little bit about the foundations when we think about transportation. Step back for a second and just to kind of ground us all in some real basics. Take a look at how we're doing with GHG emissions and my colleague mentioned that transportation was going down. Um, I'll have a comment on that as well about uh, how we're doing with GHG and transport. What are the net zero commitments which you've heard multiple times today so I'll fly through that. And then look at some of the potential and policy that we're currently exploring as it relates to net zero, both in terms of moving people and moving goods. So a few things just as a reminder when we're thinking about sustainable transportation. It's about the activities that people choose to undertake. We tend to focus so much on the trip and the trip that someone's taking, but they're first making that choice to undertake an activity, whether it's to shop, to visit, socialize, et cetera. And people and businesses consume goods, which again, lead to the movement of freight. So, you know, people will say to me, because I study the trucking industry, like, oh, there's too many trucks on the road. Like, you know, why can't we do something about the trucks on the road? It's like, it's directly related to economic activity. And when we think about the decisions that people make in response to those activities and flows, the locations that we choose to, um, you know, whether it's where we choose to visit, but when businesses choose where to locate as well, and the resulting is this complex set of flows that you see depicted here, which is marine vessel traffic, just to give us a sense about the complexity that we're dealing with. Transport capacity cannot be stored. Again, when we think about that movement, an empty movement, of course, is one of the most inefficient things. So trucks on the road, and the average in the US is around 20% uh, empty miles. During the pandemic, that increased to 30% empty miles in some cases, again, because of challenges with supply chains. So this is something that, again, we should keep in mind when we're thinking about sustainable transportation. Uh, government intervention in transportation is extensive, right? And I would argue that it's probably more extensive than it is in many other sectors. And it's not only in terms of things like regulations around safety and environment, but it's also economic regulation, as in who can enter into the industry, exiting the industry, where you can actually operate in terms of various modes of transportation. Um, so if you, you know, the picture on, on your left, for example, the OG uh, Robert Barons of the railway industry in the 1890s, so the modern equivalent, again, monopolist perhaps, but the picture on the other side is showing us that the provincial government provides the highway infrastructure but also owns and operates the rail go service as well right next to it. So there's lots of complexity in the challenges around the provision of transportation services through government intervention. When we think about sustainability and transport, again, it's not just about our main topic today in terms of net zero and greenhouse gas emissions, but the sustainability is much broader in terms of safety, public health, is a big one that, again, is associated with the emissions from transportation. So we have to keep that in mind as well. And again, we've seen these already today, the sustainable development goals related to sustainable transportation. Just a couple of other things to ground us thinking about our cities and communities and sustainable transportation. This is a, a seminal graph, if you will, that appeared in a book by Kenworthy and Newman about sustainable transportation in the 80s. And I can see my colleague squinting at it, so I apologize for the, the quality of it. Uh, basically, what's depicted here is urban density on the x-axis, and the y-axis is gasoline liters consumed per capita, right? So basically, out here, you have Hong Kong. At the other end, you have Houston. And like a good Canadian, we're kind of in the middle, not offending anyone. Sort of Toronto is about here, roughly, right? Um, but what this did was sort of trigger contribute to our recognition that urban density is one of the key things in terms of trying to reduce the amount of trip making in terms of distance of trip making activity. So density is generally accepted to be a good thing. And not only dense, but compact, right? So the whole idea that our cities are more efficient, 
use energy more efficiently when they are compact and closer together. So yes, being dense, but also being proximal is even better. Um, and this leads to paradigms in planning and in cities that emerged in the 70s, so these aren't new, they've been around for ages now. Increased density, the diversity of uses in an area so that you don't have specialized districts require even more travel, right? So we want things to be dense, diverse, um, and in terms of design, we want to support active transportation, transit, the auto alternative. So these are so sort of accepted wisdom, if you will, within planning paradigms. And Waterloo Region has one of the best examples of what this looks like in the long term, right? So the ION Central Transit Corridor started in, as a vision in the 70s and 80s. And it's really interesting, like the language around it was not that it was a sustainable transportation project, but it was a growth and land development related project. It was about the land use, right? So it's all about intensifying development in a corridor well supported by high quality transit services. Minimizing, you know, you don't need a car if you live in the central transit corridor. I mean, that's, that's kind of the vision, right? The idea behind it. Um, so we see smart growth. Uh, when we think about the movement of goods, just as a, a contextual thing, it's just been growth. So we're thinking global economy, movement of goods, the graph behind me borrowed from my colleague's textbook. But what I want you to, to look at is the 20 times, oop, er, is the only person to do this today? Help. Red goes back. There we go. Whew, I can do it. Um, here's the increase in population from the 70s to, to today, 1.7 times. GDP, exports, container throughput in 20-foot equivalent units. So when you see container ships and containers, intermodal traffic, 20 times growth since the baseline of 1970. That's globalization. That's stuff moving around the planet. That's freight, right? Uh, so we've seen tons of growth in that. How have we been doing in terms of emissions? Do I have a timer? Is that on the corner of the screen? Oh. <laughs> well, this will be fun. Um, <laughs> so I'm looking at this. All right. Uh, in the global context, you know, where does transportation fit in? Uh, big picture, around 22%, depending on, again, where you're drawing your figures from. And when you look at the breakdown on the transport sector, this is global. So Canada is different. Why? Because we're a bigger country. We have much more on the rail side, less on the aviation side, less on the marine side, okay? But basically, you get the picture about the breakdown in transport in terms of autos, tr heavy trucks, et cetera. Um, here's Canada the breakdown over the last couple of decades, and my colleague is absolutely right in that we've had this lovely reduction in 2020 and 21, right, which sort of um, reinforces my point about activity and activity choices that people make. So yeah, suddenly we're not commuting as much, we're not making as many discretionary trips, and yes, GHG emissions reduced in 2020 and 21. We'll see how they rebound. The road sector, 85% of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And over that time frame, all the other sectors seem to be doing far better. Uh, transport, not so much over the last two or three decades. Again, why? Because, and I think one of my colleagues is gonna speak to this as well, the growth of the light duty vehicle SUV truck fleet replacing the auto fleet. So even though there were gains in emissions intensity, it was overtaken by the switch in vehicle fleet. And certainly the growth in heavy trucking over the last two decades has been significant, both related to e-commerce, just-in-time production, right? So again, you've got more stuff moving around in heavy trucks, and uh, hence you see that in the emissions. All right, the commitments we've gone through, I won't speak to these because we know what we've signed up for in terms of 2050 net zero. Um, a comment about the provinces, so again, federal government makes decisions, provinces implement, um, and this is just an example of the province of Ontario, you know, again, switch in provincial government, and I know that they have reintroduced the carbon tax in terms of heavy industry, but this was uh, previously, the provinces have um, basically switched, changing from one hand to the other. All right, just a few things about what are some of the options when it comes to, sorry, there we go. Um, 
how can we get towards net zero in terms of options for transportation and sustainable transportation? This is from the latest IPCC report, and it's all the big picture sectors. And if we drill down in transportation in particular, on the moving people side, again, fuel efficient light duty vehicles, electric light duty vehicles have significant impact in terms of reducing emissions. Shift to public transit, shift to bikes and e-bikes are also listed here as having potential. How much potential, right? The shift to e-bikes and shift to public transportation. Um, again, we have a electric vehicle mandate by 2035, but the shifts are really dependent on the connections with, again, less vehicles potentially on the road, um, <coughs> less driving, changing urban development patterns, right? So if we want to see those shifts occur in terms of greater public transit use, active transportation, it's not just about um, electric vehicles, but reduced activity of vehicles on the roads as well, okay? That's kind of the point I wanted to make. On heavy duty vehicles, there's lots of stricter emissions sorry, stricter emissions regulations coming into force. So the EPA has introduced the first new set in the last 20 years, which is going to come into effect in 2027 uh, for heavy goods emissions, okay? Um, and again, this is an example of what they look like, <laughs> and I apologize for that horrible diagram that I borrowed from somebody's article, but it was to make the point about the complexities of the regulations around things like emissions technology. And it's a combination both of trying to get at fuel efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions, but also cleaner in terms of things like particulate, right? So from a public health standpoint, uh, significant concerns around public health related to particulate emissions uh, from engines as well. Um, and there's a new green freight program that the government just recently uh, launched as well. On the business side, many uh, transportation companies have already made significant efforts to reduce one of their major cost components, right, which is fuel. So whether it's a, using driver training to get at efficiency, things like long combination vehicles have a lot of potential as well, as you can see by Canadian Tire's experience. Um, in terms of electrification, both on the last miles, so local delivery, bright drop, just down the road in Ingersoll, Ontario, um, has come onto the scene and a number of companies, DHL, have signed up to equip their last mile delivery feats with electric trucks, sorry, electric delivery vehicles. And then the middle mile, what we refer to would be like a distribution center serving stores in the greater Toronto area. So it's not long distance travel, but it's more middle mile. Um, and uh, Loblaws in Montreal is taking on, or it's taking orders of electric class eight vehicles, and they're putting them into practice, making deliveries in the Montreal area. So again, we're seeing the emergence of this in terms of at least first last, sorry, first and middle mile. Uh, the other modes also all have roadmaps towards net zero. So the airline industry, sorry, the air uh, segment, the rail, um, and the marine as well have all signed on to various forms of frameworks or accords related to achieving net zero targets. So the point about, you know, is this all promising? Yes. Um, you know, is there a question about potential peril? Well, when it comes to freight movements, the physics of it are challenging, right? So it's one of the most uh, dependent on fossil fuels in terms of movement. There's not as many options, so it's tough to decarbonize, as my colleague points out. Um, we have a long life of the assets involved, right? So if you're thinking of conversion or retrofitting or adopting new vehicles into your fleet, if it has a 30-year lifespan, it takes a considerable time for transitions to occur. Um, and there's lots of growth forecast, right? So we have not decoupled emissions from economic growth, in particular on the freight side. So I mean, as economies grow, more goods are moved, more emissions occur, right? So we've got this sort of direct connection. Again, nothing new to this audience. Um, on the moving people side, we have lots of the tools, we know these ideas. The reason I started with that basic was, I mean, we've known this stuff since the 70s and 80s as far as designing cities to be more sustainable around transportation. Um, what's going on provincially? Well, you know, decisions like 
eliminating a license plate renewal fee, which no one was really complaining about and was really just a minor component of the cost of our mobility. But again, it's one of those signals that's basically saying, well, you know, we don't have to worry about that in terms of how it affects people's behavior and choices. Um, the recent decision by the government, again, around how this community is developing and will develop into the future. So again, opening up more land for development on the periphery, which is a counter to the whole idea behind intensifying in the central transit corridor. So you're getting mixed signals from the province vis-a-vis -vis what's happening at the local level. Um, same could be said around transit. The pandemic has not been kind to public transit. Right? That's the bottom line. So right now, declining ridership means de declining revenues, which means reductions in service, which can perpetuate declines in service and declining ridership, right? So it's a really precipitous time for public transit in Canada. Um, there's battles around things like bike lanes. So yes, we recognize that active transportation is an important part of shifting in terms of our activity, uh, but they're challenging to implement. Um, so yes, electrification is a good thing in terms of our mobility, uh, but there's a lot more going on, thank you, um, that we should be considering. Uh, my colleague Brent Tadarian, who's the former head of planning for the city of Vancouver, um, tweeted out, electric cars are here to save the car industry, not the planet. A little bit critical, uh, you could argue. But his full message was that, again, you know, nothing wrong with electric vehicles and they have a very key role to play, but people are missing the point that it's about our mobility in general and our cities and the fact that we need to encourage alternatives to moving by car every time we need to make a trip kind of thing, right? So that was part of his argument. Um, certainly, lots going on in terms of the market dynamics and getting at people's choice behavior is always the key part, right? How do we shift people's behavior when it comes to their use of energy and their mobility. Um, and definitely we're going to require a significant amount of effort in terms of intergovernmental cooperation. And a lot of these challenges relate to federal, provincial, municipal working with business. Um, and I've given you a couple of examples that are maybe not the best of that kind of intergovernmental cooperation. Okay. So I look forward to uh, hearing my colleagues on the panel and thank you for your time. Sorry. Our next panelist is Royden Fraser. Uh, he's uh, the teaching chair and professor in the Department of Meca Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering. He's also a uh, researcher in the Green Intelligent Transportation Systems, Systems Group at the University of Waterloo. His research interests focus on energy conversion systems, has expertise in turbulent turbul combust turbul combustion and non-intrusive non combustion diagnosis as applied to internal combustion engines. In alternative fuel, he's also an expert in alternative fuel, uh, fuel vehicle development. He has participated in, in many initiatives in Guadalupe in this, in this particular field. Uh, he, he places a particular emphasis on natural gas, ethanol, and hydrogen fuel cells, uh, fuels, and, and hybrid vehicles. The floor is your, uh, yours, Roy. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you very much. Um, that's a bit of a dated uh, resume. Uh, that's about uh, 15 years old. We're onto electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles, but I will uh, cover that uh, now. So I'm going to take a look at the personal vehicle, the vehicle itself for transportation, and uh, what will it take to be sustainable, and just cover a few of the areas there. In terms of my background, I have uh, for uh, now it's 26 years, that's 25 years last year. Uh, been, we've been designing, building, testing um, alternative fuel vehicles, starting with um, propane, then ethanol, then a fuel cell, um, hybrid electric vehicles, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and now Pure Electric with a Cadillac today. And we're pretty proud to be the first uh, university in the world that built a roadworthy um, fuel cell vehicle. And we're always about five to 15 years ahead of where the industry is and the work we're doing. So that's just my background. Now, this is an activity, you don't have to stand up, uh, but imagine you had a thought experiment, you're standing up. I want you to sit down if you answer yes to any of the following. You drive an SUV, a van, or a truck. 
sit down. You regularly exceed the speed limit by 10 kilometers per hour, sit down. You own two or more cars in your family, sit down. You warm up the car by idling before driving in the wintertime. This is for the Canadians in the crowd, sit down. You use the drive through sit down. I would have sat down, by the way, so this is, okay? The point I'm going to make here is that we love our energy, okay? Environmental impacts are completely secondary to us loving our energy. If you answered yes to any of those questions, I would ask, okay? So there's our starting point. Uh, and just to give you an idea of how much energy we use, just so you feel, what are you using? The average can use about 13.5 kilowatts. That's continuous energy. That's like having four lawnmowers per person in your backyard running 24 hours a day. The average can entire lawnmower. Or if how many four has 16 of them, and you're running out there every 45 minutes filling them. Right? That's how much energy you use on average if you look at the Canadian consumption. So that's the background. So we love our access to energy. Then, why the interest in sustainable transportation? Okay. Well, these are the common reasons you'll find across the web and in the literature. They want to throw numbers at you. 19% share of the world energy demand is in the transportation sector. 37% of the carbon emissions are from the transportation sector. It's the largest um, uh, sector most reliant on fossil fuels. Two times the number of vehicles are expected in the next 20 years, approximately, in the world. All right? And it's 50% of our pollution emissions. So these numbers are what you find is given as reasons. Does that motivate you? No. I'm going to argue I went back to the first thing. You're not motivated. That you still, you know, go through the drive through I will say, however, we've had messaging about carbon emissions, right? And so what's the underlying concern or what's the source of the concern that's driving us towards sustainable transportation? The issues that surround transportation are global warming, climate change, and that's the one you hear a lot about, smog, and that's your emissions or pollution, congestion. If you uh, take a look at uh, GM's um, current vision statement. It's zero emissions, zero congestion. Um, zero congestion is part of that uh, vision statement there. All right? And then foreign dependency. Well, where does that come in? Well, that comes in when you have um, oil. You think of back to the energy crisis. If you're not that old, you won't think about that one. Okay? But I'm going to argue the underlying source is purely the messaging that's really driven us on global warming climate change, the carbon dioxide emissions. That's what's really driving us. You would not see this huge drive for sustainable transportation to the extent that it is. I'm not saying you wouldn't see it, but to the extent. And what we've recognized is that it's influenced by environmental, social, and economic acceptance. So we're not just looking at the CO2 anymore. We've expanded this concept to have these additional considerations, which are extremely important for it actually to become real. All right? And I'm going to skip over that definition. I'll go to this one. Uh, sustainable uh, transportation definition, the most common one, this is the flavor of the most common. There's many of them out there in many different forms. But sustainable transport refers to a broad subject of transport that's sustainable in, in a sense of social, environmental, and economic impacts. Because it's come to the realization you cannot just deal with the CO2 emissions to make this work. And then, of course, being the engineer here, those are the three pillars, being the engineer, we have to take a look that sustainability includes the sources of energy, the technology involved, and the infrastructure um, involved. So a little bit about the car history and just where we're at, because this is all part of a flowing history that actually uh, makes sense. We start off with uh, cars being luxury items, and then mass production with the Multi Ford, and along came the war effort, so we moved all our production onto the war effort, and then cars came back, and they came back with a flash in the 50s and 60s, and they're all about power and size and style. Uh, you could recognize a car two blocks away, the year and model of a car back in the, in the 60s. I remember doing that, having a friend that could do that. Uh, that's my age to coming in there, too. The, then fuel economy came in with the energy crisis through the 70s and 80s, and emissions um, also came along, the environmental side and the catalytic converters. Alternative fuels in the 90s, that's where we were doing methanol, propane, um, was coming in, right? 
and that's where we, I started working on these things. Light weighting became very important in the 2000s manufacturing. That's what gave us energy efficiency improvements. Electrification and hybrids, 2010s. By the way, we built our first hybrid in 1992 on campus here. So long before it even show, starts showing up in the industry. Like I said, when you do the research side of things, you see things before they come. And now we're on to pure electrics. That's what people are looking at now. And that, it's all following this electrification. So, well, I didn't say pre pre-1920s, do you know what the first car was? An electric car. So back in New York City, and then there's electric taxi fleet and that. Now, what's going to be the 2030s? Hydrogen. We're going to need something more than just electricity. And a hydrogen car is, if it's a fuel cell, will be electrical. All right. So now, what are the strategies for sustainable vehicle transportation? Well, efficiency is tossed out there. Right? And we do that by lighter vehicles, regenerative braking, everyone knows about when they come to electric cars. Connected automated vehicles, this is where you start knowing about the environment you're in and whether you, you know, slow down early and f save fuel, not heavy brake before a light comes on, you know what's going on around you, connect it. Uh, and then we have new technologies that come along with that. Uh, the different battery types that we have as part of that new technology, how fast can they charge, right? How light, what's their energy density, their power density. Again, the uh, connected uh, automated vehicles, vehicle to everything. V2X means vehicle to everything. Again, that's communicating with the outside world. Um, something you may not be aware of is that for this to work, we need large-scale energy sources, uh, energy storage. I'll talk more about that later. But I'll talk about the one aspect of that, which is V2G, that's vehicle to grid. That is a form of energy storage that may be large-scale, but probably not. Then you have new fuels. Electricity is the one that we're hot on today. I'm just going to say hot on today. I've seen the, the trends change as we go. And electricity will stay. Okay? But we have hydrogen, sustainable alternative fuels are going to be needed in some situations because the battery is just not going to work in certain situations. Here's the warnings. You've got to be aware of Jevons' paradox with efficiency. I'll talk more about that in a moment. You have to be aware of the window of viability. These are technical subjects. Um, when it comes to new technologies. You have to be aware of what I call monocropping. I should call it technology monocropping, but I didn't have the space. What that means. These have serious potential complications to what we think is the right thing to do. How do you make that policy? So let's take a look at the automobile itself. Here. Here's the graph from 1980 to around uh, 2018 of the miles per gallon that was received by new vehicles. So, and it's a good graph. The miles per gallon continually increased. It didn't increase a lot between uh, 1980 and, uh, I'll put this up here, between 1980 and 19, 2004. It didn't increase a lot, but it was increasing. So miles per gallon was always increasing. We're doing the job there. All right. If I take a look at the real world fuel economy, so this is not the cars that are being sold off the lot, but what we see in the real world, it actually drops between 1988 and 2004. So we're actually doing worse per vehicle, right? And so why did the fuel economy drop? Well, the engine efficiency increased. Well, this is, goes back to what was mentioned, more trucks were sold. That's one example of one of the reasons. Also has to do with driving distance, so, which has to do with cities increasing. There's a lot of the other factors, but that's a big one there. So there's reasons for it, and you can go into the literature and find out. But that's interesting. Ah, well, this looks great. Since 2004, things are getting really good in the real world fuel economy, right? They're going straight up. That's excellent, right? Well, let's take a little closer look at that part of the graph. So on the top graph first, I take a look at the U.S. Um, fuel consumption. It's flat up to around um, 1988, and then it increases. And it has a little blip after the 2000 economic uh, uh, crisis, but otherwise it's increasing there. But what you have here is the fuel economy actually increased dramatically, and all we managed to do was stay the same. That means if you thought efficiency was going to improve things for CO2 emissions, nada. That's not doing it for you. And then let's take a look at the back end. Well, at least this looks okay. It's going up now again, right? And the U.S. fuel economy is going up with the, US, with the consumption, right? 
That looks pretty good. Well, is that really good? No. Because our fuel economy is getting better, but the we're consuming more. It just doesn't seem right, right? And, and again, I'm not going to go into the specific reasons of all this, but this is what's called Jevons' paradox. There's lots of examples of it, not just with the automobiles. It's where efficiency is not sufficient to reduce emissions or have that impact. Okay, so that's that first one I was telling you about. If you think efficiency is a solution, it's just a tool. It's not a solution. So just to say again, the efficiency paradox or Jevons paradox, technology increases efficiency, the rate of consumption, the impact does not improve. It can stay the same or get worse, right? The window of viability, I'm just gonna talk about quickly. A system cannot survive if too efficient or too inefficient. This is sort of like survival of the fittest. If you're, if you're old technology, right? If you've got a, an old floppy disk, it doesn't survive today, um, right? But it cannot survive if you're too efficient. And this is what people don't realize. The window of viability comes from the eco ecological literature. It also, you can see it in engineering. It comes from management. When a system is, and think management here. If your system is too efficient, what happens? And someone gets sick. You can't get all the work done and the system fails. You've got to have some buffer in there. All right? So something to be aware of. Now, let's look at the plan of vehicle electrification. This is the monocropping side of things. Everybody, not everybody here, but there's promises of net neutrality, this net zero, and promises of electrification. Either FEBs, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, or pure battery vehicles would be part of their fleets. Well, this is monocropping. Because what happens if you have an ice storm and there's no electricity to be had? How are you going to have the vehicles go out, the emergency vehicles go out? How are you going to get it around and transport? With gasoline, you can have storage. You have huge distributed storage. You don't have huge distributed storage with electricity other than the battery in your car, which you'll run out of once you've driven a certain distance. And you can't, okay? So that's an issue. Now, let's take a look at um, how great electric vehicles are. And I'm going to say this is a little bit of... Um, Teslas are, are really good cars, but I'm going to take a look at the, what's, how we actually do the evaluation and quantify things. So the Tesla looks great here. It gets 119 miles per gallon equivalent. I should put a little E on the bottom of there because it's on an energy basis. It's the amount of energy in versus the miles driven. Uh, and it's much higher than any of the, other, the, the fleet ranges for all the other companies, right? But you start to, should start to get suspicious when you see the CO2 emissions are also rated as zero. Because that's telling you an assumption about the electricity source. Right? That's number one. If I actually take a look at the Prius, for example, if that electricity source happened to come from a gas plant or an oil plant, or, right? Um, so fossil fuel based, and I was used the Prius as the equivalent, I would take the Prius and realize I have to do the conversion for the energy, right? So in this case, I assumed a 35% efficient engine. That's probably a little high estimate, so I get high numbers here. But the Prius as a vehicle is a darn efficient vehicle. It gets me this equivalent, again, the energy in, energy out, equivalent of 45 miles per gallon if I only looked at the work potential and the electricity. So you go back to the Tesla and you should say, where's the electricity coming from? If it's coming from wind and solar, great. If it's not, not so great, okay, necessarily. Okay, so the key point here is not whether one car is better than another, that's not my point. It's the electricity changes the story, right? Okay, I'm gonna skip over uh, this to this slide and just say electricity changes the story. It changes the safety, it changes how we calculate the econ uh, fuel economy, it changes the importance of drive cycles, city with um, drive cycles and uh, highway drive cycles. It's the importance of the weather becomes, right? Cold weather, you gotta have heaters. Air conditioning absorbs, takes a lot of power. It changes the story on environmental impacts, comfort features, dynamics, um, grid dynamics, the electricity grid and the economics. All right, I'm gonna have three quick closing comments here, or thoughts. First one is sustainable transportation must include renewable sources, otherwise it's not sustainable, and this cannot be achieved without large-scale energy storage. 
I don't have the time to go into the details on that, so I'll just go to the second thought. Beware of the hidden consequences if you're going to commit yourself to something like this. If electricity is generated comes from a coal, if electricity comes from coal, your vehicle is actually worse for CO2 emissions. And here's one you may not realize in Ontario. If you plug in during the day in Ontario, you're effectively driving an inefficient natural gas car because our peaking energy in Ontario is met by natural gas power plants. So don't think you're driving a clean vehicle in the day, unless the wind's blowing well. So I'm talking about the day the wind's not doing that peaking for us. And then last thought, and I'll end this presentation, do not expect sustainable transportation desires and reality to match without substantial mind shift in society. And I'm going to show two graphs here. I'm going to end on the next slide. This is a graph you've seen. It was in Clarence's presentation. It's showing you how we've never met our goals. Kyoto, Rio, Copenhagen, Paris, what we need to achieve. But I want to do the next slide and show you where we're really aiming for. That's what we've been talking about when we say net zero. The slopes even get worse and harder after Paris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, panelist is uh, Mark Collin. Uh, he has been an EV owner and advocate since 2014, early adopter. He founded a group of regional owners that became the Waterloo Region Electric Vehicle Association, REVA, in 2015, and continues to educate the public on the benefits of electric vehicles ownership through regional talks, events, and other outreach programs like this one. And part of the vehicles, I guess, part of your association. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me. Uh, glad to see everyone here and, and uh, speak uh, and talk uh, renewable energy and uh, sustainability. Going to uh, talk a little bit about EVs. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm part of the Riva Group, uh, which is an owner uh, group of uh, owners that that operate here in the Waterloo Region. Um, I founded the group uh, back in 2013, no, 2015, after I purchased an electric vehicle, uh, read a lot of online forums about them before I bought one, and then figured I should meet some people that actually own them and uh, see see what they have to say. So we put a group together because one didn't exist and we've been operating since then, so. The green? Oh, okay, the play button, got it. So you can follow us here if uh, you want to uh, reach out to us. We've got our contact through email, our Twitter account. We're also available on Facebook if you want to see us. Wanted to talk a little bit about where we are in Canada today when it comes to EVs. Uh, at this point in 2023, there are over 50 EV models available to the public uh, for sale. Now, for sale and actually receiving it are something different. Uh, we do have an issue with uh, supply chain maintenance of EVs. There is more demand than they can provide. Uh, that has been ramping up over time and we continue to see that that will be the case. The different vehicles available uh, in EVs today uh, include, of course, compacts, sedans, crossovers, performance cars, SUV pickups, vans, and uh, even some heavy-duty trucks. And we see that this list is growing rapidly. More and more cars are coming in. More and more manufacturers are putting an EV component into place, and they're adding to these categories. So we see that over time that uh, just more selection, more choice is coming to the market and that's also bringing more volume, and it's kind of feeding the fire. More and more people are interested, brings them to sales centers, more cars are bought, so it's just a continuing circle as far as we can see. This uh, little chart uh, in, uh, in red actually shows you uh, some of the registrations in Canada of EV vehicles. You can see a little blip there in quarter two of 2022 uh, but the trend has been going up. 
we've been getting closer to a uh, double digit percentage in Canada. Uh, we've always lagged behind the U.S. by a little bit. The U.S. is already into double digit percentages when it comes to registrations. But um, here in Canada, we've got some incentives in play uh, where you can get a tax incentive if you purchase a vehicle. Some provinces offer it, the federal government offers one as well. So there's a 5,000 federal, and then if you live in the province of British Columbia or Quebec, they offer a fairly large provincial incentive that can be added to that incentive overall. You've got some smaller provinces, New Brunswick and, and such, that add maybe $1,000 to that as well. So here in Ontario, we used to have a very large uh, secondary uh, incentive, but that disappeared uh, when the Ford government came into place. And that, of course, has affected Ontario's spot in the number of EVs that are on the road. We used to be number one just a few years ago, uh, but with our incentive dropping down, uh, that certainly affected the number of people that were buying EVs in Ontario. And today we can see that British Columbia leads uh, Canada with about 15%, Quebec in second place with 11, and we're hovering around six. Uh, but we see that we're going to get over into that double percentage point uh, in Ontario eventually, just uh, at this point uh, we're down a little bit. The future of EVs in Ontario and Canada looks bright. Uh, we're, we're seeing that there are cheaper models coming to the market. Right now, when you buy an EV, you may be looking at, well, that's quite expensive. You do have to look at the total price of an EV. You're not just, you spend a little bit more up front, but over time with the savings of maintenance and fuel, uh, because electricity is much cheaper than gas to fuel these vehicles, you do reap some of that back and eventually break even and eventually save if you keep the EV for a number of years. We see that as those mass market VVs come into place, there will be price parity uh, with, uh, elect um, with gasoline cars, ICEs, internal combustion engine vehicles. And when that starts to even out, it's going to be a lot e easier for a person to make a judgment call on a sales lot for a car looking at a gasoline version or an EV version and seeing that they're almost the same price but the EV is a lot cheaper to fuel and maintain. It's going to be an easy decision for a consumer. And we're going to see more, again, more models are coming in every day um, and they're being added into every segment of the, uh, the automotive industry. We also see that, of course, there's everything's becoming electric. <laughs> Everything that's transportation-wise, cycles, bicycles, scooters. We saw a, a scooter company just start up here in Waterloo Region just a, a few days ago, where they're now renting e-scooters uh, to public. Don't know if it's going to be successful, but they've got a number of different options. Everything is becoming electric. All transportation seems to be getting on board. When you have an EV, <coughs> you're charging. <coughs> you have to charge in order for that vehicle to move. What I wanted to point out here is that most EVs come with a charging cord themselves when you purchase them. There is also an option of a level one or level two, and that's the speed of how fast that vehicle can charge. 98% um, of EV use the, the charging can be done basically in your own home, driveway, garage. The only time that you're outside of that is if you're going on longer trips outside of the region or further. Most, most EVs now are getting somewhere between four or five, 550 kilometers of range. So with that in mind, most of your charging is just done overnight, typically in your garage, in your driveway. And that, of course, allows someone to always wake up with a full tank of electrons to get onto the road. And typically, you're not using up all that much. So I just wanted to impress for those. Well, let me ask. I'm curious. Put up your hand if you currently own an EV. So we got about maybe 15%, 20%. Another, another curiosity I have, since I've got an audience that are captive, no one's going anywhere. If those people that owned an EV had to do it again, would you buy an EV? Put up your hand. And that's exactly what we see through our association. 
Once a person buys an EV, it's really tough to go back. We probably have 98% of the people that purchase these cars continue with them for their second and third purchase. These are, they're infectious. They're fun to drive. It's, it's, a, great, it's a great thing to have. Third part of charging, uh, I'm sorry, next part of charging, of course, is on the road charging, where you're on a lar long trip, you're going out of the region, you're going to Winnipeg, you're, you're heading a long distance. You're going to have to stop and charge after that four, 450 kilometers to fill up your car to go that extra leg. That's where level three or DC fast charging comes into play. A lot of different operators have DC networks out there that you can plug into, pay with a credit card or with their dongle or their, their app uh, through your phone and you can continue your journey. Most of these L3, L3s will provide somewhere in the area of 80% of your charge and anywhere between 20 minutes to 50 minutes and that depends on your battery and the type of vehicle that you have. A couple of different charging ability or charging nozzles. We've got the Chatamo, which is quickly dying out. Uh, it's still out there in some vehicles, but really it's, it's being reduced. CCS is really standard at this point. And then of course we have the Tesla supercharger network. This is where we see EVs in the future having most of their problems, is that we've got a number of different networks out there controlled by a number of different organizations that, that control and maintain them in different ways. So when you're traveling on these long trips, you may come to a station that you believe, based on the app of that particular network, is up and operational and is fine. You may arrive there, it's not working, or it's not working up to spec, or there's an issue with it, or it's been broken. All these things exist. And I have to exclude Tesla from this problem. Their network is pretty robust. Uh, and does not uh, experience these type of programs, but the, but the problems. But these other groups tend to have a uh, issue with this at this point. We see them getting better. We see more and more of them are being added and we're starting to see them starting to connect to each other so that you can use one app with multiple networks. So that's a positive thing that we see happening, but we want that uh, ability to make sure that these chargers are working all the time and are available and our apps are accurate. That is a big thing that, that we would like to see in the future. Just to get, give an idea for our particular region, this is a shot of uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph. And uh, you can see on here that we've got some green markers showing L2s that are commercially available to anyone to use. We've got the orange, uh, which indicates the DC fast chargers. And at this point, we've got about 160 plus of these chargers in our, in our region, including Guelph. Just uh, when we did this map initially, probably about, uh, I guess it was about eight years ago, uh, that map consisted of about 15 chargers. So it's certainly grown, it's become more robust, it's become more reliable. But uh, at this point, you kind of need the ability to charge or uh, when you're charging you got to have a plan A and a plan B and maybe a plan C uh, if you're not on a Tesla network. It's something that you have to keep in mind. Uh, future improvements we see uh, of course I mentioned about charging in your your house, your driveway, your garage. Some people live in multi-unit uh, housing and of course may not have access to a garage or a permanent spot so we're looking at improvements that need to happen for the future where there are units that can be shared that people can use and uh, access uh, through these places. We see more workplace charging. Actually, this is the Evolve One uh, building in Waterloo, uh, a picture of their uh, charging infrastructure with uh, solar across the parking lot, which is fabulous. If you've got a parking lot, why not fill it with solar, collect the energy, collect the, the revenue from it, and charge your employee cars. Like, it's, it's perfect. And again, things to look out for is in the charging structures is that maintenance monitoring is a huge thing. The companies have to understand what their, their group of charges are doing. They got to know when they break, they got to know when they're not available, and they have to update their lap, uh, apps so that people that are using it using the network know exactly what they, need, what they can expect when they arrive. 
Another interesting thing uh, that we see in the future for charging is the expansion of uh, travel plaza models. So when you're out on the road and you go to a, on the 401 and you're traveling by a, a, an on-route, for example, they're now incorporating charging at these places where you can get some food, hit a washroom, and then get yourself a charge. So uh, it's, it's something that, uh, that we see an improvement happening and we see that uh, it's, it's a great thing to be heading towards over time. And finally, uh, finding these charging, of course, there's, these networks all have apps, basically. So if you've got a smartphone, it's quick and easy to understand what's going on. You can pull up multiple apps, take a look at it. One, certainly, I would recommend is PlugShare, uh, which, which combines multiple networks, and you can see all that information in one source. And also, as the cars get better, the different motor companies get involved with this. They're updating their own apps inside the vehicles, which is best because when you're in the car and you need a charge, you don't want to necessarily look at your phone. You can just ask the car when the, where the closest charger is and what its reliability is. And those kind of in-car apps are coming to the cars now. Thanks very much. Okay, last but not least, we have uh, Paul Parker. Uh, I, um, we're reading the bios we obtained from the internet, so they might be dated. Unfortunately, we didn't get better information, so apologies for the presenters if they are not accurate. Uh, Professor uh, Paul Parker, uh, research focuses on building sustainable communities by creating win-win opportunities for the environment and economy. He's particularly concerned with the lo local economic development and strategies with low local economic strategies can achieve a sustainable future. Uh, sustainable energy systems are an, an essential starting point, so he looks first at conservation and improving energy efficiency. Then at renewable energy sources and smart grid networks as integral parts of community energy plan. Paul's research interests include sustainable energy. So Paul is online. Thank you very much, Claudia, for the invitation, thank and thank you, everyone. Uh, this is, of course, a great topic, uh, Net Zero, and I want to say a special thanks to Mark for going previously. Uh, we just saw here uh, lo locally in, in, in Australia the launch of a new electric plane at a motor show, of course. It was part of the electric motion section where there were like 20 displays, everything from e-bikes to e-scooters and, of course, many e-cars and the electric plane as well. Can you hear me okay? So I wanna talk about the net zero in aviation, uh, the electric revolution in the air. And of course, I want to remind us that it needs to be on the ground for the source of the electrons as well. What's the motivation for this? What's the big challenge? Well, you just look at that growth curve of what's happening in terms of emissions. So aviation industry is growing rapidly globally to a billion tons uh, of emissions annually. And the share is also gradually growing, but as other segments reduce their emissions, the relative share of aviation will continue to grow. What's the solution? Well, the Air Transport Action Group has prepared this uh, Waypoint report for their pathway to net zero by 2050. Uh, you can see that SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuels, uh, is the uh, big solution that they're looking at. But they are also uh, more expensive. They are also carbon, uh, depending on the pathway. The pathway of the fuel really determines the amount of savings that you get. Uh, so most of the pathways do have uh, ongoing uh, emissions as well. So I want to start with the top line where we're looking at the smallest planes, and this is where they're looking at electricity coming in first. And you'll see there's electric and hydrogen as well as sustainable aviation fuels. Um, what is this projected uh, to look like? 
so you see here the graph comparing the cost per available seat kilometer, um, most than the dashed fossil fuel line in the center. Most of the new technologies are above that line. But I want to start with electric aviation over on the lower left hand side, where it already promises a lower cost option. Another reason it's really important that we look at uh, the electric aviation option right now, if you look at the flight schools across Canada, this is the fleet of all of the planes that are registered at flight schools. And you see uh, the average plane was actually built before 1980. The largest group of planes were built in the 1970s, and this fleet needs to be replaced. You're looking at planes nearly 50 years old. Uh, they need to be replaced. And the question is, what technology is going to be chosen? First answer, of course, is conventional planes. They've got a proven track record, but they also have high emissions. So electric planes offer a low emission option, but the performance is uncertain. Everyone says, well, how far will the battery go? So we need to look at these things. That's what research is for. We want to identify the potential benefits, identify the barriers, and evaluate those pathways. So can we achieve net zero without the heavy reliance on offsets? Because offsets are what are often required at the moment in these net zero 2050 uh, pathways. One of the big players is, of course, Airbus. And so this is a, a chart of their activity with the, the electric aviation, uh, starting with their initial uh, single seater. Uh, and then if you see the range of different vehicles that they've experimented with. Uh, but I also like the idea that they've uh, supported and launched this electric plane air race. And so uh, this is a good encouragement to bringing on new technology and more efficient uh, options. Canada, of course, is active in developing this electric aviation space. You've probably all heard of the announcement by Harbor Air that they want to go electric. Uh, they had their first uh, electric flight in 2019. That was just a circuit, it took off and landed safely. Last year, 2022, they had their first A to B flight. That was from Vancouver to Victoria. It took 24 minutes. Uh, so it, it's a start. Uh, however, they're using these old uh, Beaver de Havilland aircraft. So it's still a, quite a heavy, uh, you know, 50 year old technology. So uh, th there can be more efficient planes brought into the mix as well. Uh, however, I, I, I liked their vision. Uh, I like to say that uh, BC is really the Norway of Canada in terms of the electric aviation ambitions, because Norway uh, wants to have all of their coastal uh, routes uh, electrified because they are short hops. And the same story, of course, in British Columbia, you get short hops uh, along the coast. Uh, so yes, Arbor Air is a perfect um, early adopter for the market. And just to say that Air Canada is also moving in that direction. Uh, they've chosen the ES-30 uh, from Hart Aerospace. And, and I actually like this as a, a hybrid configuration. So this is how can you get the longer range, the 400 kilometer range? Uh, and the answer is adding in the turbo. So you're running electric motors, but you actually have small generators uh, that are not using as much fuel as you would if you were having to have the big powerful jet engines. Uh, instead, you're using the electric motors, uh, but you have generators to provide the small amount, less amount that we need to continue the cruise. We, you need the big power to climb up to altitude, but it takes less power to continue going. And how do you get the longer distance without needing more and more batteries? Uh, small generators are one option. And finally, this is the uh, the big news story was, of course, 2020, uh, the first electric airplane received its type certification in Europe. And this is the Pipistrel Velas Electro, so it's just a small two-seater. Happened in 2020, so people circle 2020, say that's the year that it happened. But I'd like to point out that really this is a, a track record that starts back in 2007 when they launched their first electric glider. Uh, 2011, they won the Nassau Challenge to see who could have the most efficient plane. Uh, the challenge had been set to have 200 passenger miles uh, per gallon equivalent, and they doubled it. They achieved 400. So uh, a four-seat uh, plane that was uh, 
they can advance their experience with the technology. I won't go into all of the details, but here's the illustration. So why do we want to make this happen? How much would you like to fly in the electric plane? Well, the potential market is, of course, student pilots. Uh, so we asked them, and on a scale of zero to 10, how much would you like to fly? The answer was nine, nine out of 10. So very strong. That's uh, good to hear. Uh, but it was interesting because one group, uh, that is the managers, had an even stronger response. So why are the managers so interested in this technology? Well, that's a good question. When we look at the reasons, so the students wanted to cut emissions. Our students want to fly, but they don't want emissions. So that's their biggest motivator. On the manager side, it was actually to reduce costs. Uh, because they know it's expensive to keep repairing and replacing these engines to keep these old planes going. Uh, so reliability, fewer moving parts. Uh, the goal is to have reduced cost from operating the electric planes. And then the instructors said, yeah, yeah reducing cost is important, but it's the technology of the future. Uh, the managers also said, yeah, well, it's a quieter operation and it should be safer. So different motivators for different groups. Simple example then of this uh, Pipistrel Velas Electro. Uh, how much savings will it make? Well, it depends on who you're using, but uh, I do a back of the envelope calculation to say that it reduces, saves about 50 kilograms of CO2 per hour compared to a conventional plane. So if our student pilot, uh, if they're getting the PPL, then that would be say 40 out of their 45 hours of training were done electrically, that would save two tons of carbon. Well, that sounds pretty good. If you did 200 out of their 250 hours, that would save 10 tons, that would be great. But it's that manager decision that I'm really uh, looking at because if they change the plane that's gonna be in the fleet, uh, planes are flown a lot, especially at flight schools. And so every plane that they replace uh, represents you know, 50 tons per year, so over 20 tons, uh, you know, over 20 years, you're of course seeing a huge benefit. So this is the uh, example of the potential savings available today. So let's look at this example. Uh, this is the Pipistrel propulsion system. Well, you see two different battery systems. So that answers the first question. What if something happens to the battery? The answer is it can continue to fly on the second system. Obviously, it won't go as far, but you have the same amount of power. Uh, the same there's redundancy in the pumping system for the uh, coolant. So uh, safety features are already built into the plane's design. So uh, this, of course, is the the photo of the plane here at Waterloo. We want to say, will it work here? And this is exactly the question that our partner, the Waterloo Wellington Flight Center is asking. Uh, they operate 30,000 flights a year, so very active. Uh, one of the biggest and most active in Canada. Uh, Transport Canada wants to verify uh, the performance that it was certified under in Europe. So will it achieve the same in Canada? So we need to do the operational testing to see uh, is it certified? Uh, will we be able to get it uh, certified in Canada? That's what we're hoping for. And of course, we need to integrate a, a net zero operation. Guess what? You fly during the day, the sun's shining in the day. So there's a good uh, correlation between demand and generation with solar generation. So we also intend to include a solar hangar with the PV panels on the roofs. These are the projects that we have coming up, sort of comparing that demand and generation profile for the application. Uh, WISA has received funding from the federal government, the FedDev, the agency. These are a series of the projects that uh, many researchers here are looking at uh, on the electric plane, solar hangar, transforming the industry and risk assessment. Uh, so with thanks to uh, Claudio and Merida, Merida and Bob and Matt and many others, uh, we've got lots of activity planned over the next year. In addition to the FedDev funding, we've got CFI funding and SHRC funding and NSERC funding. Uh, so we hope to be able to answer that question, is this viable in our conditions? The motivation, of course, is to address this big curve that we saw. There are multiple pathways to do it. Well, let's test this electric plane. And it'll be interesting to see what the conclusion is. Uh, I like to note that in, in the US, one of the aviation media uh, 
outlets there evaluated the plane they said yeah 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 it's cool but it's not for the u.s market it doesn't have a long enough uh, range whereas you ask the dutch flight school and they say oh we do 80 percent of our training with it oh, very different answer same plane um what's the canadian answer going to be stay tuned it should be fun i of course want to give special thanks to all of our partners and funders uh and uh, of course, I'm happy to answer any questions and share the experience. Thank you very much. So uh, let me just wrap up uh, a few of the comments and conclusions and, and, and also make my cell pitch, although maybe but might be late for that. But uh, as, as Executive Director Wise, part of our, our mandate is to establish partnerships and, 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 and establish uh, projects and support projects in this area. So uh, let me just uh, wrap up one of the major uh, comments or conclusions of all of these. Uh, it's been that uh, uh, from the perspective of what is coming or what is happening, there are uh, net zero policy directions from the Canadian government, maybe not as much in Ontario, but probably BC and Quebec and other provinces have their own policies. But from the point of view of the Canadian government, these are net zero policy directions, are very clear directions, right? So we have seen that by 2030, we need to reduce our, uh, our, our emissions uh, with respect to the levels of 20, uh, 2005 by 40 to 40, 45 percent, and no emissions by 2050. So the issue is how we're going to accomplish this. Uh, there's a Canadian 2030 emission reduction plan in, in, in place at this point, which includes uh, incentives for, uh, for EVs, uh, uh, for charging infrastructure, purchasing rebates, and the mandate that by uh, 2030, the, all electric vehicles should be all vehicles should be electric. So that's a, that's one of the, as I was mentioning, a, a, a negative incentive, if you will. So past 2035, your only choice is going to be an electric vehicle. So that's 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 very clear, right? Uh, the green building, uh, green building support, uh, one billion uh, uh, for efficiency upgrades. Uh, the help from uh, to industry to to adopt new new technology in this in this area in our can is playing a major role. Uh, the the uh, an even greener power grid and there's a big investment here on on basically uh, clean energy projects, zero emissions by 2035, which is a major challenge as we discussed this morning, especially for certain provinces. And whether that can be accomplished or not is, in my opinion, still up for for debate. Uh, Oil and gas emission reductions, uh, farming uh, investments for support sustainable practices, community climate, climate actions that we have here discussed. We're talking about significant investment, $2.2 billion. And, the, uh, and nature, ca nature on, or from nature, carbon capture and sequestration, or carbon capture and storage, which is referring to developing of wetlands, ocean, peatlands, basically nature uh, uh, sources or, or means of storing and sequestering uh, uh, carbon. Uh, Carbon. Uh, now there's a net zero accelerator, fa accelerator, of, uh, accelerator, of, accelerator fan. Sorry about that. A billion dollars. So that's a significant investment. As you can see, we're talking about millions, millions, billions of dollars being put in these, uh, making, uh, uh, trying to accomplish this net zero 2050. There's the net zero challenge as well, which is uh, normalize the, the, the planning of businesses for net zero. Uh, guidance and leadership, so basically support to accomplish these net zero uh, uh, businesses and, 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 and energy systems. And there's an NRCAN's, NR part of this NRCAN's hydrogen strategy, which is basically the uh, position Canada as a world leader producer. By the way, Chile is doing exactly the same thing. So whenever you are around, uh, Germany is doing the same thing. Uh, so these uh, this strategies of uh, uh, making, making a uh, uh, we know this because we're collaborating with our colleagues in, 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 in Germany, in Chile, in which there's a major plans to make it, make those countries like Canada a half for hydrogen production, uh, hydrogen uh, uh, technologies. And certainly Canada has a, a major lead on this because we have had uh, great developments in, in, uh, or significant developments and technologies developed here in Canada in this area. And, and it's considered to be an enabler as, as Royden was mentioning, of a net zero future. Now, this is what happened with the March 28, uh, uh, or 2013 federal government budget. So just to give you a, 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 the, where, the, where the government is, 
this, uh, uh, situating itself in terms of supporting all of this. And these are most of the, most of the budget was about clean energy. So refundable investment tax credits for certain clean hydrogen equipment. Expand refundable investment tax credits for clean technologies equipment, okay? particularly in ge geothermal energy. So we're doing quite a bit of work here on Waterloo in this area, and that's part of the reason why the first panel will discuss these issues. Uh, the public consultation on ref refundable investment uh, tax credits for clean electricity systems, again. Uh, refundable investment tax credits for certain clean technologies, manufacturing and processing equipment, and finally, the expanded eligible, el, eligible, act, eligible activity, activities and extends, and extends the, or extending the phase out period of reduced tax rates for zero emission technology. So as you can see, Canada is making a major commitment on this uh, and, and the budget and the investments are reflecting that. So now to my, to my uh, sales speech. Part of a workshop objective is to establish these industry academic government collaborations. I think, as you could see, we have multiple participants here, not only from academia, from industry, from government, which we welcome, and I think it's an opportunity for collaboration. And particularly focus on adoption of, adoption of net zero technologies, use or energy efficient technologies, and development of sustainable communities and infrastructure, which was major focus of our, of our workshop. Now, in that, in that sense, uh, uh, the mandate of WISE established these, uh, these collaborations, helping these, uh, develop these collaborations uh, through, uh, through training, through R&D uh, uh, and commercialization, if possible, of technologies, and the pilot scale test facilities as well development. So that's some of the major uh, interests that we have, uh, I guess we're discussing with, we, 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 we mentioned, for example, the, the possible acquisition of a microgrid for, for, for Waterloo, that would be a major, a major a, a, a pilot type of this facility that could be used uh, throughout Canada, especially for research. And when we're looking at next steps, it's basically through a memorandum of, of, of understanding, or a memorandum of agreement, like one we have with NRCAN recently started and, and signed, uh, started with Wujatin, uh, which is not here, as a former ED, and it took a while, but we, we, are big, we have made it operational now, and we are enjoying that, or are working on that, on those collaborations. Uh, that would allow us to secure funding. Uh, and now, through partnerships, I guess we're looking at issues of uh, training, issues of uh, uh, resources, and also in, in, in IP issues, which uh, Waterloo in particular is particularly well, in particular is well situated for these type of, 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 of interactions and investments. Um, we usually work with NSERC and OCI, provincial and federal government, to basically increase the factor two or three, the investment in these type of projects. So with that, I thank you all of you, especially those of you who remain here until the, the very end. I appreciate it. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your contributions uh, uh, to this event. I made it possible. Uh, very interesting discussions. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Very interesting and in, in, insightful and, infor, uh, and great of information. Learned quite a bit uh, in, this, in this event. Now we have some uh, food for you, those of you who have remained here. So you might want to take some home. If there's plenty of food back there. <laughs> and, and also I wanted to invite you to our next workshop, the Ammonia Workshop. Uh, which is going to take place on May uh, 9th. Uh, there will be more announcements and more, and you'll receive more information about this event that uh, we look forward in, in, in uh, people participating, especially those who, who have participated in this workshop, which is an, a, a new technology, a new uh, dimension that hydrogen is taking, and, and we believe that is, is part of the, 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 the addressing these challenges of hydrogen, hydrogen adoption and, and technologies. Thank you very much again, and thank you, thank you for being here. And until a la prochaine, like we say in French. Thank you. Thank you.